Chapter One of Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Craddock Knoll, Volume Two, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. Chapter One. It was a Tuesday evening when Craddock Knoll and amy rosedew signed and sealed with the moon's approval their bond to one another on the following day dr hutton and wife were to dine at kettledrum hall and the distance being considerable and the road so shockingly bad even dangerous i am told to gentlemen who have dined with me sir said kettledrum in his proudest manner they had accepted his offer and that of mrs kettledrum which she herself came over to make that they should not think of returning until after breakfast on thursday in consequence of her husband's hints rosa felt the keenest interest in that mrs kettledrum leave her to me dear rufus you need not be afraid indeed trust me to get to the bottom of it and so she exerted her probing skill upon her to the uttermost more even than ladies usually do when they first meet one another of course there was no appearance of it nothing so ill-bred as that it was all the sweetest refinement and the kindest neighbourly interest they even became affectionate in the course of half an hour and mutual confidence proved how strangely their tastes were in unison nevertheless each said good-bye with a firm conviction that she had outwitted the other poor thing she was so stupid what a bungler to be sure and to think i could not see through her but the return match between these ladies which was to have come off at kettledrum hall where by the by there appeared a far greater performer than either of them this interesting display of skill was deferred for the present inasmuch as rosa was taken ill during the mysteries of her toilet it was nothing more serious however than the flying spasms as she always called them to which she had long been subject and which as she often told her husband induced her to marry a doctor rufus administered essence of peppermint and then a dose of magnesia but he would not hear of her coming with him and he wanted to stop at home with her and see that she sat by the fire she in turn would have her way and insisted that rue should go for he made himself such a very smart boy that she was really quite proud of him and they would all be so disappointed and he was taller than mr kettledrum she felt quite sure he was the bearing of that last argument i do not quite perceive but dare not say that she erred therein and to rue it was quite conclusive so ralph mohorn was sent for the pony carriage countermanded and rufus set forth upon polly whose oats were now restricted Kettledrum Hall stood forth on a rise and made the very most of itself Expansive and free and obtrusively honest it seemed to strike itself on the breast as its master did with both gables a Parochial assessment committee or a surveyor for the property tax would have stuck on something considerable if they had only seen the outside of it Look at the balustrade that went for it was too heavy to run all along the front of it over the basement windows no stucco either but stone genuine stone that bellied out like a row of roman amphorae or the calves of a first-rate footman after that to see the portico de sempedis metata which exipiebat urum not arcton in this climate no wonder although it was rotten inside and the whole of it mortgaged ten fathom deep that bailey kettledrum hit his breast and said our little home sir your great home you mean said rufus what a noble situation you can see all over the country they had come to meet him down the hill in the kindest country fashion mr and mrs kettledrum like jack and jill going for water not quite that replied kettledrum but we saw you with my binocular between two and three miles off and became so anxious about mrs hutton that i said to my wife put your bonnet on and she only said bailey put your hat on 
nothing more sir i assure you nothing more sir upon my honour rufus could not see exactly why there should have been anything more but he could not help thanking them for their kindness and saying to himself what nice people quite an agricultural life i see in spite of that grand mansion now said mr kettledrum when polly had been committed to one of the stable boys but rufus still wanted to look at her for he never grew tired of admiring anything that belonged to him and he knew they wouldn't do her legs right now dr hutton you have come most kindly according to your promise so as to give us an hour or two to spare before the dinner-time shall we take a turn with the guns i can put my hand on a covey or shall we walk round the garden and have the benefit of your advice rufus looked in dismay at his choice black kerseymeres he had taken his antigropolos off and was proud to find not a flake on them but to think of going out shooting he ought not to have dressed before he left home but he hated many skinnings and he could only guess the distance from the lodge to this place so he voted very decidedly for a walk in the kitchen garden into this he was solemnly instituted and the beauties all pointed out to him what a scene of weeds and rubbish how different from bull garnet's dainty and trim quarters or from his own new style of work at geopharmacy lodge rotten bean sticks crackling about the scum of last summer's cabbages toadstools cropping up like warts or arums rubbed with caustic a fine smell of potato disease and a general sense of mildew the wall trees curled and frizzled up with aphis coccus and honeydew and the standards scraggy and full of stubs canker and american blight sprawling slouching hunchbacked and stag-headed like the sick ward of a workhouse fighting with tattered umbrellas ah said rufus at his wit's end to find anything to praise what a perfect paradise for the songsters of the grove oh replied mr kettledrum you should hear the duke admire it kettledrum my boy he said when he dined with me last friday there is one thing i do envy you no sir neither your most ladylike wife nor yet your clever children although i admit that neither of them can be paralleled in england but kettledrum it is forgive me it is your kitchen garden my kitchen garden your grace i replied for i hate to brag of anything it is a poor thing my lord duke compared to your own at lion's hill may i be deeds his grace replied for i never shall break him of swearing if i ever saw anything like it dear kettledrum and so i told the duchess and after all you know dr hutton a man may think too little of what it has pleased god to give him well said rufus to himself i'm blessed if you do but i don't like you any the worse for a bit of brag i have met great brags in india and most of them honest fellows but i must peck him down a bit i must i fear it is my duty as an enlightened gardener but you see now said bailey kettledrum smacking his lips and gazing into profundity you see my dear sir there is nothing ab omni parte beatum perhaps you remember the passage in the heroic epistles of uh, cicero it was i believe who wrote all those epistles to somebody no doubt of it said rufus hutton who knew more of hindustani than of latin and greek combined and yet st paul wrote some not in latin my dear sir all st paul's were greek nihil est i now remember ab omni parte beatum i don't know how it scans which i suppose it ought to do but that isn't my lookout perhaps however you can tell me i'm blowed if i can said rufus hutton in the honesty of his mind and i am not quite sure that it has any right to scan well i can't say but i think it ought he was in the mists of memory where most of the trees have sensitive roots though the branches are not distinguishable however that can't matter at all i see you are a classical scholar and hutton i like a classical scholar because he can understand me but you see that these trees are rather um what's the expression for it cankered and scrabby and scrubs that is to say yes i suppose they would crop the better 
if that be possible for a little root pruning you have gathered the fruit for this year i presume well no not quite that the children have had some of course but we are very particular not to store too early i really don't think you need be why many people say let well alone but my gardener talks of making a jolly good bonfire of them if he knows anything of his business then drain the ground trench and plant new ones mr kettledrum looked quite thunderstruck he caught hold of a tree to help him and a great cake of rotten bark bearded with moss came away like the mask of a mummer it was slimy on the underside and two of his fingers went through it nice state of things said rufus laughing i suppose the duke likes lepers why my dear sir you don't mean to say that i would leave only one of them and i would hang the head gardener upon it that worthy was just coming round the corner to obtain the applause of a gentleman well known to the gardener's chronicle but now he turned round abruptly and scratched his head and thought of his family when rufus came down and entered the drawing-room he was perfectly gorgeous for although he had been in full dress for the main he knew better than to ride with his alumbugger waistcoat on there was nothing in all the three presidencies to come up to that waistcoat it would hold dr hutton and rosa too for they had stood back to back and tried it and rufus vainly sighed for the day when his front should come out and exhaust it he stole it they say from a petty raja who came to a great derba with it worn like an oxford hood at any rate there it was and the back of cashmere stuff would fit either baby or giant but the front the front oh bangles and jiminy it is miles beyond me to describe it all simple writers from job and hesiod downwards convey an impression of some grand marvel not by direct description of it which would be feeble and achromatic but by the rebound recoil and redouble from the judgment of some eye-witness if that eye-witness be self-possessed wide awake experienced and undemonstrative the effect upon the reader's mind is as of a shell which has struck the granite burst there and scattered back on him so will i mistrusting the value of my own impressions give a faint idea of rufus his waistcoat by the doubt of it on that assembly the host was away for the moment somewhere perhaps blowing up the butler for his wife was telling her sister how nervous and even fidgety her beloved bailey was growing but mr corklemore was there and came forth to salute the great rufus when his heavy eyes settled upon the waistcoat and all his emotions exploded in a haw of incredulous wonder mrs kettledrum rose at the same instant and introduced her sister my sister dr hutton whom i have so earnestly longed to make acquainted with dear mrs hutton mrs noel corklemore mr corklemore i know has had the pleasure of meeting you georgie dear you will like her so oh goodness gracious me i don't wonder you are surprised at me anna exclaimed mrs corklemore with wonderful presence of mind how stupid i am to be sure oh no why didn't you tell me how shameful of you but you never look at me now i think and she swept from the room in the cleverest manner as if something wrong in her own dress had caused her sister's ejaculation excuse me one moment said mrs kettledrum taking her cue very aptly and she ran out as if to aid her sister but in reality to laugh herself into hysterics after all there was nothing absurd per se in rufus hutton's waistcoat only it is not the fashion just at present to wear pictorial raiment but the worthy doctor could not perceive any reason why it should not be he was pleased with the prospect of creating a genuine sensation and possibly leading the mode and having lost all chance of realizing these modest hopes at nowelhurst why he must content himself with a narrower stage for his triumphs he had smuggled it from home however without his wife's permission he had often threatened her with its appearance but she always thought he was joking and it truly required some strength of mind to present it to modern society although it was a work of considerable art and no little value 
the material of it was indian silk of the very richest quality it had no buttons but golden eyelets and tags of golden cowries the background of the whole was yellow the foreground of a brilliant green portraying the plants of the jungle on the left bosom leaped and roared an enormous royal tiger with two splendid jewels called cat's eyes flashing and a pearl for every fang upon the right side a hulking elephant was turning tail ignominiously while two officers in the howdah poked their guns in the eyes of the tiger the eyes of the officers in their terror had turned to brilliant emeralds and the blood of the tramping elephant was represented by seed rubies the mahout was catting away in the distance looking back with eyes of diamonds beyond a doubt it required uncommonly fine breeding especially in a lady to meet that waistcoat at a dinner party and be entirely unconscious of it and perhaps there are but few women in england who would not contrive to lead up to the subject quite accidentally of course before the evening was over the ladies came back as grave as judges and somehow it was managed as if by the merest oversight that dr hutton should lead to dinner not the lady of the house whom of course he ought to have taken but mrs noel corklemore he felt as he crossed the hall with her that the beauty of his waistcoat had raised some artistic emotion in a bosom as beautiful as his own oh rufus think of rosa let none be alarmed at those ominous words the tale of craddock noel's life shall be pure as that life itself was the historian may be rough and blunt and sometimes too intense in the opinion of those who look at life from a different point of view but be that as it will his other defect i trust and pray will chiefly be deficiencies we will have no poetical seduction no fascinating adultery condemned and yet reprieved by the writer and infectious from his sympathy georgiana corklemore was an uncommonly clever woman and was never known to go far enough to involve her reputation she loved her child and liked her husband she had all the respect for herself which may abide with vanity nevertheless she flirted awfully and all married women hated her bold thing they called her sly good-for-nothing and did you see how she ogled well if i only carried on so oh if i were only her husband but poor man he knows no better such a poor dear stick you know perhaps that is what makes her do it and nothing in her at all when you come to think of it no taste no style no elegance when will she put her back hair up and her child fit to be put into long clothes did you observe her odious way of putting her lips up as if to be kissed my dear i don't know how you felt but i could scarcely stay in the room with her nevertheless the ladies did stay and took good care to watch her and used to say to her afterwards oh if i were only like you dear then i need not be afraid of you but you are now don't tell stories so clever so attractive as if you did not know it dear well you are so simple-minded i am always telling my louis and maggie to take you for their model dear on the present occasion georgie corklemore as she called herself set about flirting with rufus hutton not from her usual love of power nor even for the sake of his waistcoat but because she had an especial purpose and a very important one the kettle drum come corklemore conspiracy was this to creep in once more at nowelhurst hall through the interest of dr hutton they all felt perfectly certain that craddock nowell had murdered his brother and that the crime had been hushed up through the influence of the family they believed that the head of the family in his passionate sorrow and anger might be brought to their view of the subject if he could only be handled properly and who could manage that more adroitly than his first cousin once removed the beautiful mrs corklemore only let her get once invited once inducted there and the main difficulty after that would be to apportion the prey between them 
they knew well enough that the old entail expired with the present baronet and that he before his marriage held in fee pure and simple all that noble property his marriage settlement and its effects they could only inkle of but their heart was inditing of a good matter and mr chope would soon pump brockwood not quite so fast my amphictyonics a solicitor thirty years admitted though his original craft may not be equal is not to be sucked dry on the surprise even by spongy young chope however that was a question for later consideration and blood being thicker than water and cleaving more fast to the ground they felt that it would be a frightful injustice if they were done out of the property only two things need to be added one that sir cradock had always disliked and invited them but for appearances sake the other that they fairly believed in the righteousness of their cause and that rufus hutton could prove it for them as the principal witness tampered with mrs corklemore was now perhaps twenty-five years old possibly turning thirty for that lustrum of a lady's life is a hard one to beat the bounds of at any rate she had never looked better than she did at the present moment she was just at the age to spread open with the memory of shyness upon them like the dew when the sun is up the curving petals of beauty who understands the magnetic current who can analyze ozone is there one of us able to formularize the polarity of light will there ever be an age when chemists metaphysical will weigh no more by troy weight and carrot as now the mode is but by subtle heart gas our liking for a woman let us hope there never will be that soft georgiana corklemore so lively lovely and gushing focused all her fascinations upon rufus hutton she knew that she had to deal with a man of much inborn acuteness and who must have seen a hundred ladies quite as fair as georgie but had he seen one with her well she knew not what to call it though she thoroughly knew how to use it so she magnetized him with all her skill and rufus shrewdly suspecting her object and confiding in a certain triarian charge a certain thrust jarnation which he would deliver at the proper moment allowed her to smile and to show her white teeth and dimples of volatile velvet so natural so inevitable at his playful delightful humour and to loose whole quiverfuls of light shafts from the arch flash under her eyelids what sweet simplicity she was what innocent desire to learn what universal charity how dreadful dr hutton oh please not to tell me of it how could any ladies do it i should have fainted at once and died half an hour afterwards she turned up her large mild eyes deeply beaming with centralized light in a way that said if i died is there any one who would think it a very very great pity rufus had been describing historically not dramatically the trials of the ladies when following their regiment during a sudden movement in the perils of the mutiny with a man's far stiffer identity he did not expect or even imagine that his delicate listener would be there and go through every hour of it but so it was and without any sham although she was misusing her strange sympathetic power mrs noel corklemore would have made a very great actress she had so much self-abandonment such warm interjection and hot indignant sympathy and yet enough of self-reservation to hoop them all in with judgment meanwhile mrs kettledrum a lady of ordinary sharpness like a good pudding apple georgie being a peach of the very finest quality she i say at the top of the table was watching them very intently delighted amused indignant glad that none of her children were there to store up auntie's doings as for mr corklemore he was quite accustomed to it and looking down complacently upon the little doctor thought to himself how beautifully my georgie will cold shoulder him when we have got all we want out of the conceited chattering jackanapes when the ladies were gone mr bailey kettledrum who had no idea of playing dummy even to mrs corklemore made a trick or two from his own hand corklemore my dear fellow you think we are all teetotalers on with the port if you please 
Cessantum bibuli consulus amphorum. Never shall forget that line. The bibulous consul, eh? Capital idea. Corkumore, can you construe that? Oh, perhaps I can't. Really don't know. They beat a heap of stuff into me when I was a very small boy, and it was like whipping. Ha, ha, something like whipping. Eggs, said Rufus Hutton. All came to bubbles, eh? Not at all, sir, not at all. You entirely misunderstand me. I mean that it was similar to... to the result produced by a... by the whipping of a top. Only made your head go round, said Mr. Kettledrum, winking at Rufus, and thenceforth had established a community of interest in the baiting of Long Corklemore. Well, at any rate, he continued, Hutton is a scholar. Excuse my freedom, my dear sir. We are such rustics here that I seldom come across a man who appreciates my quotations. You are a great acquisition, sir, the very greatest to this neighbourhood. How can we have let you remain so long without unearthing you? Because, said Rufus to himself, you did not happen to want me. When are you going to offer to introduce me to the Duke? And now, gentlemen, continued Mr. Kettledrum, rising, swelling his chest out, and thumping it athletically, it is possible that I may be wrong. I have never been deaf to conviction. But if I am wrong, gentlemen, the fault is in yourselves. Mark me now. I am ready. Such is the force of truth. I am ready here at my own board, humble as it is, once for all to admit that the fault is in yourselves. But the utterance I swell with, the great thought that is within me, is strife. No, I beg your pardon, is, is, rife, and strongly indicting of a certain lady who is an honour to her sex. I rise to the occasion, friends. I say an honour to her sex, and a blessing to the other one. Gentlemen, no peroration of mine is equal in any way to the greatness of the occasion. Could I say with Cicero, Veni, Vidi, Vici, where would be my self-approval? I mean, you understand me, it is the privilege of a man in this blessed country, the first gem of the ocean. No, I don't mean that. It applies, I believe, to Scotland, and the immortal Burns, but this, sir, I will say, and challenge contradiction, a Briton, sir, a Briton, never, never, never will be free. And now, sir, in conclusion, is there one of you, let me ask, who will not charge his eyes, gentlemen, and let his glass run over? Ha! Huh, cried Mr. Corklemore. Charge his glass, come, Kettledrum, and let his eyes run over. Ha! Huh. I think that is the way we read it, Dr. Hutton. Gentlemen, I sit down, finding it impossible to obtain an adequate bearing. I close my poor attempt at cleansing my bosom of the perilous stuff, sir. You know the rest, the health of Mrs. Hutton and that most remarkable children, excuse me, most remarkable woman whose children I am quite convinced will be an honour to their age and sex. Port of fifty-one, gentlemen, a finer vintage than forty-seven. He had told them that it was thirty-four, but both knew better and now in vino veritas at last mr bailey kettledrum had hit the weak point of rufus and what was more he perceived it himself you might butter and soak for a month and he would take it at all its value but magnify his rosa exalt the name of his rosa and you had him at discretion remarkable sir he inquired with a twinkle of fruity port stealing out from his keen little eyes. You really do injustice. So many ladies are remarkable. Oh, well, I never heard. Confound you, Corklemore, said Kettledrum to him aside. Can you never hold your tongue? Sir, to Rufus, I beg your pardon if I said remarkable. I meant to say, sir, most remarkable. The most remarkable lady. This to Corklemore in confidence. I have ever been privileged to meet. What children, I said to my wife, but yesterday, what children they will be blessed with. Oh, he's a lucky dog, the luckiest dog in the world, my boy. However, they were not so very far from the sloping shores of sobriety when they rejoined the ladies and made much of the small Mrs. Kettledrum, tidy children, rather pretty, and all of the pink ribbon pattern. After some melting melodies from soft George's lips and fingers, Mrs. Kettledrum said, Oh, Dr. Hutton, do you ever play chess? 
we are such players here all except my poor self i am a great deal too stupid i used to play a little when i was in india we are obliged to play all sorts of games in india dr hutton piqued himself not a little on his skill in the one true game at a sign from their mother the small kettle drums rushed for the board most zealously and knocked their soft heads together mrs corklemore was declared by all to be the only antagonist worthy of an indian player and she sat down most gracefully protesting against her presumption just to take a lesson you know only to take a lesson dear oh please don't let any one look at me rufus however soon perceived that he had found his match if not his superior in the sweet impulsive artless creature who threw away the game so neatly when she was quite sure of it oh poor me now i do declare isn't it most heartbreaking i am such a foolish thing oh can you be so cruel thrilling eyes of the richest grey trembled with dewy radiance as rufus coolly marched off the queen and planted his knight instead of her mrs corklemore can i relent you are far too good a player the loveliest eyes the most snowy surge in the mare magnum of ladies would never have made that dry rue hutton well content with his rosa give away so much as the right to capture a pawn in passing now observe the contrariety the want of pure reason the confusion of principle i am sorry and ashamed but i can't express these things in english for the language is rich in emotion but a pauper in philosophy the distress upon my premises of the cleverest woman in mind she had purposely thrown her queen in his way but she never forgave him for taking it a glance shot from those soft bright eyes when rufus could not see them as if the gentle evening star venus herself all tremulous rushed like a meteor up the heavens and came hissing down on a poor man's head she took good care to win the next game for policy allowed it and then of course it was too late to try the decisive contest early hours liberty hall liberty hall at kettledrum gentlemen stay up and smoke if they like but early hours sir for the ladies we value their complexions they don't that i know do you now my dearest no of course you don't this was mr kettledrum except for your sake darling said mrs kettledrum curtsying for the children were all gone to bed ever so long ago well said georgie coming forward because she knew her figure would look well with three lamps upon it such a figure of eight my opinion is never worth having i know because i feel so much but i pronounce here she stood up like portia with a very low-necked dress on gentlemen and ladies i pronounce that one is quite as bad as the other ho said noel corklemore and so they went to bed and rufus hutton wondered whether they ever had family prayers when all the rest were at breakfast in came mrs corklemore looking as fresh as daybreak Oh, I am so ashamed of myself. What a sluggard you would think of me What is it in the divine song of that great divine dr. Watts? No, dear you must not scold me I cannot bear being scolded because I never have tit for tat good morning dearest Anna How is your headache darling? Oh, dr. Hutton? I forgot no wonder I overlooked you I shall never think much of you again because I beat you at chess so game and game said rufus solemnly and i ought to have won that last one mrs corklemore you know i ought to be sure to be sure oh of course i do but a little thing prevented him his antagonist was too good sir ah we'll play the conqueror some day and then the tug of war comes oh anna i am so conceited to think of my beating dr hutton the best player in all india well darling we all know that and we must not blame you therefore for lying in bed till ten o'clock oh said rufus with a groan do look at lady's logic mrs corklemore gained one game out of two only because i was ahem, i mean by her very fine play and now she claims absolute victory and mrs kettledrum accepts it as a premise for a negative conclusion which has nothing on earth to do with it but rufus got the worst of that protest he tilted too hard at the quintain 
all came down upon him at once till he longed for a cigar then mrs corklemore sympathized with him arose their breakfast being over and made him a pretty curtsey she was very proud of her curtsies and contrived to show her figure so confound that woman thought rufus i can never tell when she is acting i never met her like in india and thank god for that saying she saw that her most bewitching curtsey was entirely thrown away upon him for he was thinking of his rosa and looking out for the good mare polly dr hutton i thank you for your condescension in giving me that lesson you let me win that last game out of pure good nature i shall always appreciate it meanwhile i shall say to every one oh do you know dr hutton and i play even taking very good care meanwhile never to play a game with you shocking morality yes very shocking but then i know no better do i noel dear ha oh, well georgie i am not so sure of that my wife is absolute nature sir simple absolute ha oh, unartificial nature but unartificial nature is in my opinion ha oh, yes a very wise nature sometimes ha oh, said his wife exactly like him while everybody laughed then she stood upon tiptoe to kiss him she was so unartificial even before the company all the pretty airs and graces of a fair parisian combined with all the domestic smugness of an english wife what a fine thing it is to have a yoke mate with a playful charming manner good-bye dr hutton we are on the wing as you are i fear you will never forgive me for tarnishing your laurels so tarnishing laurels what wonderful fellow so ingeniously mixed metaphors now or never thought rufus hutton she has beaten me at chess she thinks now i'll have the change out of her only let her lead up to it mrs corklemore we will fight it out upon some future occasion i never played with a lady so very hard to beat oh you must mean at nowelhurst but we never go there now there is i ought to say very likely there are mistakes on both sides still there seems to exist some prejudice against us anna dear you put a lump of sugar too much in my tea i am already too saccharine well dear i put exactly what you always tell me and you sent your cup for more afterwards matter of fact animal how can she be my sister georgie only muttered this rufus hutton did not catch it mr garnet would have done so now is the time thought rufus again as she came up to shake hands with him not a bit afraid of the morning sun upon her smooth rich cheeks where the colour was not laid on in spots but seemed to breathe up from below like a lamp under water outside he saw pet polly scraping great holes in the gravel and the groom throwing all his weight on the curb to prevent her from bolting homewards hang it she won't stand still he cried her mouth is like a sea anemone take her by the snaffle rein can't you see you fool that she hasn't seven coats to her mouth like you excuse my opening the window he apologized to mrs corklemore and excuse my speaking harshly for if i had not stopped him he would have thrown my horse down and i value my polly enormously especially after her behaviour the other night in the forest it is only the same with all you gentlemen the worse you are treated the more grateful you are oh yes we heard of it but we won't tell mrs hutton no indeed i hope you won't i should be very sorry for her to get even a hint of it to be sure laughed georgie to be sure we will keep the secret for ever so many reasons one of them being that dr hutton would be obliged to part with miss polly if her mistress knew of her conduct but i must not be so rude i see you want to be off quite as much as fair polly does ah what a thing it is to have a happy home here mrs corklemore sighed very deeply if a woman who always has her own way and a woman who is always scheming can be happy she georgie must be so but she wanted to stir compassion come she said after turning away for she had such a jacket on the most bewitching thing it was drawn in tight at her round little waist and seemed made like a horse's body clothes on purpose for her to trot out in come dr hutton say good-bye and forgive me for beating you simple creature she knew not the sacrophames of chess players we must have our return match i won't say good-bye until you have promised me that shall it be at my house 
no there is only one place in the world where i would dare to attack you again and that is nowelhurst hall and why there more than anywhere else because there is a set of men there with which i can beat anybody i believe i could beat morphy with those men at nowelhurst ah you think me i see grossly and stupidly superstitious well perhaps i am i do sympathize so with everything i hope we may meet at nowelhurst replied rufus preparing his blow of jarnac when they have recovered a little from their sad distress ah poor sir cradock exclaimed the lady with her expressive eyes tear-laden how i have longed to comfort him it does seem so hard that he should renounce the sympathy of his relatives at such a time as this and all through some little wretched dissensions in the days when he misunderstood us of course we know that you cannot do it that you a comparative stranger cannot have sufficient influence where the dearest friends have failed my husband too in his honest pride is very very obstinate and my sister quite as bad they fear i suppose well it does seem ridiculous but you know what vulgar people say in a case of that sort they actually fear the imputation of being fortune hunters Georgie looked so arrogant in her stern consciousness of right that Rufus said and for the moment meant it How absurd to be sure yes said Georgie confidentially and in the sweetest of all sweet voices Between you and me dr. Hutton for I speak to you quite as an old friend of the family whom you have known so long Hello thought Rufus in the last breath. I was a comparative stranger I think it below our dignity to care for such an absurdity and that now as good Christians we are bound to sink all petty enmities and Comfort the poor bereaved one if you can contribute in any way to this act of Christian charity May I rely upon your good word? But for the world don't tell my husband he will be so angry at the mere idea I Will do my best mrs. Corklemore you may rely upon that oh Thank you thank you i felt quite sure that you had a generous heart i should have been so disappointed perhaps after all we shall play our next game of chess at christmas with the men i am so lucky with and then look to yourself dr hutton i trust you will find a player there who can give me a pawn and two moves if you beat him you may boast indeed what player do you mean asked georgie feeling rather less triumphant any indian friend of yours Yes, one for whom I have the very greatest regard for whose sake indeed I first renewed my acquaintance with Sir Craddock Because I bore a message to him For the Colonel is a bad correspondent The Colonel I don't understand you as she said these words how those eyes of hers those expressive eyes were changing and Her lovely jacket so smart and well cut began to draw over the chest Did you know? asked rufus watching her in a way that made her hate him worse than when he took her queen is it possible that you have not heard that colonel noel clayton noel sir craddock's only brother is coming home this month and brings his darling child with him now for your acting georgie now for your self-command we shall admire henceforth or laugh at you according to your present conduct she was equal to the emergency she commanded her eyes and her lips and bosom after that one expansion even her nerves to the utmost fiber everything but her color the greatest actor ever seen when called on to act in real life can never command color if the skin has proper spiracles the springs of our heart will come up and go down as god orders the human weather but she turned away with that lily whiteness because she knew she had it and rushed up enthusiastically to her sister at the end of the room dear anna darling anna oh i am so delighted we have been so wretched about poor sir cradock and now his brother is coming to mind him with such delightful children we thought he was dead oh so many years what a gracious providence ha huh, said noel corkymore the devil said bailey kettledrum and rufus caught the re-echo but hoped it might be a mistake then they all came forward gushing rushing rapturous to embrace him oh dr hutton surely this is too good news to be true i think not said rufus hutton 
mystical and projecting i really trust it is not but i thought you must have heard it from your close affinity otherwise i should have told you the moment i came in but now i hope this new arrival will heal over all make good i mean all family misunderstandings colonel clayton knoll said mr knoll corklemore conclusively and with emphasis colonel clayton knoll was shot dead outside the barracks at mal on the twenty-fifth day of june sir in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and fifty-six correct me sir if i am wrong then said sir rufus i venture to correct you at once shot sir continued corklemore as i am i may say ha huh, in a position to prove by a man called abdullah manji believed to be a mussulman colonel clayton knoll sir commanding officer in command of her majesty's company's native regiment number one hundred and sixty three who was called excuse me sir designated the father of his regiment because he had so many illegitimate huh, i beg your pardon ladies because of his ha huh, yes patriarchal manners sir and kindly disposition he oh where was i i am sure i can't say said rufus no sir my memory is more tenacious than that of any man i meet with he colonel clayton knoll sir upon that fatal morning was remonstrated with by the two ah uh, yes the two executors of his will upon his rashness in riding forth to face those carnal i mean to say those incarnate devils sir are you fools enough he replied to think that my fellows would hurt me give me a riding whip and be ready with plasters for i shall thrash them before i let them come back now isn't every word of that true yes almost every word of it replied rufus now growing excited well sir he took his favourite half-bread for he understood cross-breeding thoroughly and he rode out at the side gate where the heap of sand was coming back he cried to the english sentry coming back in half an hour with all my scamps along of me keep the coppers ready and with that he spurred his brown and black mare and no man saw him alive thereafter except the fellows who shot him ha huh. yes said rufus hutton one man saw him alive after they shot him in the throat and one man saved his life and he is the man before you what you dr hutton what you oh how grateful we ought to be to you thank you well i don't quite see that rufus replied most dryly then he corrected himself you know i only did my duty and his son inquired georgie timidly and with sympathy but the greatest presence of mind she has stood with her hands clasped and every emotion except the impossible one of selfishness quivering on her sweet countenance and now she was so glad oh so glad she could never tell you his poor illegitimate son dr hutton will he bring the poor child home with him how glad we shall be to receive him the child he brings with him is eoa dear natural odd eoa his legitimate daughter then you know her dr hutton you could depose to her identity a very odd question but some women have almost the gift of prophecy oh yes i should rather think so i have known her since she was ten years old and now they are coming home how pleasant how sweet to receive them as it were from the dead by the overland route i suppose and with a lack of rupees no said the badger rufus you are wrong in both conjectures they come round the cape by the clipper ship aliwal and with very few rupees colonel noel has always been extravagant a wonderfully fine-hearted man but a hand that could never hold anything except indeed a friend's by the moisture in rue hutton's eyes georgie saw that her interests would fare ill with him if brought into competition with those of colonel noel meanwhile polly was raving wild and it took two grooms to hold her and the white froth dribbling down her curb was to rufus hutton as the foam of the sea to a sailor he did love a tearing gallop only not through the thick of the forest good-bye good-bye i shall see you soon thank you i will take a cheroot 
but i only smoke my own good-bye i am so much obliged to you you have been so very kind mrs hutton will be miserable until you come over to us good-bye once more good-bye rufus hutton you see was a man of the world and could be false on occasion john rosedew could never have made that speech on the back of detected falsehood away went polly like a gale of wind and rufus who was no rogue by nature only by the force of circumstances and then could never keep it up he going along twenty miles an hour set his teeth to the breeze which came down the funnel of his cigar as down a steamer's chimney stuck his calves well into polly's sides and felt himself a happy man going at a rocket speed to a home of happiness all of us who have a home and unless we leave our heart there whenever we go away we have no home at all all of us who have a hole in this shifting sandy world the sand as of an hourglass but whence we have spun such a rope as the devil can neither make nor break i mean to say we all who love without any hems and haws and rubbish those who are only our future tents formed from the present by adding so all of us who are lucky enough i believe we may say good enough to want no temporal augment from the prefix of society only to cling upon the tree to the second aorist of our children wherein the root of the man lurks and the grand indefinite so anomalous all these fellows if they can anyhow understand this sentence will be glad to hear that rufus hutton had a jolly ride rufus waited at the gate why do his mare's shoes linger rosa ran in and ran out again and was sure that she heard something pelting down the hill much too fast for her sake but who could blame him when he knew he was coming home at last then rosa snapped poor jonah's head off for being too thick to hear it meanwhile a mighty senate was held at kettledrum hall mrs corklemore herself taking the curule chair after a glimpse of natural life and the love of man and woman we want no love of money so we lift our laps like the roman envoy and shake out war with the whole of them fools who think that life needs gilding life whose flowing blood contains every metal but gold and silver because they clog and poison it blessed is he who earns his money and spends it all on a saturday he looks forward to it throughout the week and the beacon of life is hope even as god is its pole star End of chapter 1craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter two mr garnet's house well away to the west was embraced more closely and lovingly by the gnarled arms of the forest than the hall or even the rectory just in the scoop of a sunny valley high enough to despise the water and low enough to defy the wind there was nothing to concern it much but the sighing of the branches over the brown thatch hung two oak trees whispering leaves of history offering the acorn cup upon the parlour hearth chafing their rheumatic knuckles against the stone of the chimneys wondering when the great storm should come that would give them an inside view of it for though the cottage lay so snugly scarcely lifting its thatched eyebrows at the draught which stole up the valley nevertheless those guardian oaks had wrestled about or two with the tempests in the cyclone of the morning of november twenty ninth eighteen thirty six and again on the seventh of january eighteen forty two they had gripped the ground and set hard their knees and groaned at the thought of salt water since then the wind had been less of a lunatic though there had been some ruffianly work in eighteen fifty four and they hoped there was a good time coming and so spread their branches further and further and thought less of the price of timber there was only one wind that frightened them much and that was two points north of west the very direction whence if they fell crash they must come on the cottage for they stood above it 
the root head some ten feet above the back floor of the basement and the branches towering high enough for a wood pigeon not to be nervous there now we only get heavy pressure of squalls from the west northwest after a thorough going tempest which has begun in the southward and means to box half the compass so the two great oaks were regarded by their brethren up the hill as jolly fellows happy dogs born with a silver spoon in their mouths good for another thousand years although they might be five hundred years old unless indeed and here all the trees shuddered there came such another hurricane as in 1703 but which of us knows his own brother's condition those two oaks stood and each knew it upon a steep bank where no room was for casting out stay roots to east south east bull garnet hated those two trees with terror added to hatred even if they never crushed him which depended much on the weather they would come in at his bedroom window when the moon was high wandering shapes of wavering shadow with the flickering light between them walking slowly as a ghost does and then very likely a rustle and tap a shivering a shuddering it made the ground floor of his heart shake in the nightmare hours never before had he feared them so much one quarter so much as this october and during the full and the waning moon after clayton nowell's death he got very little sleep for them by day he worked harder than ever did more than three men ought to do was everywhere on the estates but never swore at any one though the men scratched their ears for the want of it labored hard and early and late if so he might come home at night only not in the dark come home at night thoroughly weary his energy was amazing no man anywhere felling wood mr garnet's especial luxury no man hedging and ditching or frithing or stubbing up fern and brambles but had better look out what he had in his bag or the governor would be there and no mistake a workman could scarcely stand and look round and wonder how his sick wife was or why he had to go to work so hard could scarcely slap himself on the breast or wet his hard hands for a better grip but there was bull garnet before him with sad fierce dogged eyes worse than his strongest oaths had been everybody said it was and everybody believed it for the gossip had spread from the household in spite of the maiden's fear of him the cause of it was beyond all doubt the illness of his daughter pearl garnet that very eccentric girl as rufus hutton concluded who had startled poor polly so dreadfully was prostrate now with a nervous fever and would not see even the doctor our amy who pleaded hard to see her because she was sure she could do her good received a stern sharp negative and would have gone away offended only she was so sorry for her not that any fervid friendship such as young ladies exult in for almost a fortnight incessant not that any rapturous love exclusive of all mankind had ever arisen between them for they had nothing whatever in common save beauty and tenacity which girls do not love in each other only that she was always sorry for anyone deep in trouble and believing that pearl had loved clayton nowell and was grieving for him bitterly how could amy help contrasting that misery with her own happiness for amy was nice and happy now in spite of craddock's departure and the trouble he had departed in he loved her almost half as much she believed as she loved him and was not that enough for anybody his troubles would flow by in time who on earth could doubt it unless they doubted god he was gone to make his way in the world and her only fear was lest he should make it too grand for amy to share in she liked the school children so and the pony and to run out now and then to the kitchen and dip a bit of crust in the dripping pan and she liked to fill her dear father's pipe and spread a thin handkerchief over his head would all these pleasures be out of her sphere when craddock came back with all london crowning him the greatest and best man of the age innocent amy never fear nemo nisi ob homicidium repente fuit clarissimus 
Mr. Garnet would have felled those oaks, in spite of Sir Craddock's most positive orders, if there had not been another who could not command, but could plead for them. Every morning, as the steward came out, frowned and shook his fist at them, the being whom he loved most on earth, far beyond himself, his daughter, and the memory of their mother, all multiplied into each other. That boy Bob came up to him and said, Father, don't, for my sake. We have not heard much of Bob Garnet yet. We have scarcely shaped him feebly. By no means was he a negative character, yet described most briefly by negatives. In every main point except two, he was his father's cardinal opposite. These two were generosity, which combines the love of truth with a certain warmth of impulse, and persevering energy. Even those two were displayed in ways entirely different, but the staple was very similar. Bob Garnet was a naturalist, gentle almost as any girl, and more so than his sister. He took small pleasures in the ways of men, intense delight in those of every other creature. Bob loved all things God had made, even as fair Amy did. All this day, and all his life, he would have spent, if he had the chance, among the ferns and mosses, the desmidiae of the forest pools, the sundew and the fungi, the buff tips and red underwings, privet hawks and emperors. He knew all the children of the spring and handmaids of the summer, all of autumn's laden train and the comforters of winter. The happiest of mankind is he whose stores of life are endless, whose pure delights can never cloy, who sees and feels in every birth, in every growth or motion, his own almighty father, and loving him is loved again as a child who spreads his arms out. Mr. Garnet's affection for this boy surpassed the love of women. He petted and patted and coaxed him and talked nonsense to him by the hour. He was jealous even of Bob's attachment to his sister Pearl. In short, all the energy of his goodness, which, like the rest of his energies, transcended the force of other men's, centred and spent itself mainly there. But of late Bob had passed all his time with his mother. I mean, of course, with nature, for his mother in the flesh was dead many years ago. He had now concluded, with perfect contentment, that his education was finished, and to have the run of the forest at this unwanted season more than consoled him for the disgrace of his recent expulsion from school. Scarcely any one will believe that Bob Garnet, the best and gentlest boy that ever cried over Euripides, not from the pathos of the poet certainly, but from his own, Bob Garnet, who sang to snails to come out, and they felt that he could not beat them, should have been expelled disgracefully from a private school whose master must needs expel his own guineas with every banished pupil. However, so it was, and the crime was characteristic. He would sit at night in the lime trees. Those lime trees overhung the grey stone wall of the playground near Southampton, and some wanton boys had been caught up there, holding amoy bayings with little nursemaids and girls of all work, come out to get lung and tongue food. Thereupon a stern ukase was issued that the next boy caught up there would be expelled without trial, as the corrupter of that pure flock. The other boys laughed, I am sorry to say, when Bob the Natural, as they called him, meaning thereby the naturalist, was the first to be discovered there, crawling upon a branch as cleverly as a looper caterpillar. Even then the capital sentence was commuted that time, for every master knew, as well as every boy, that Bob could never say bo to anything of the feminine gender capable of articulating. So Bob had to learn the fourth Georgic by heart, and did most of it, with extreme enjoyment, up in that very same tree, for he kept all his caterpillars there, his beetle traps, his moth nets, even some glorious pupae which were due at the end of August. And he nursed a snug little fernery, and had sown some mistletoe seeds, and a dozen other delicious things, and the lime hawks wanted to burrow soon. In a word, it was Bob's hearth and heart place, for no other boy could scale it. But just when Bob had got to the beginning, 
of Aristaeus, and the late bees were buzzing around him, although the linden had buried, an officious usher spied him out, a dirty little fellow, known and despised by all the more respectable Sapitier of Southampton, with hottest indignation, that mean, low beggar cried out, Boy in the tree there, I see you, your name this moment, you rascal. Garnet, sir, Bob Garnet, and if you please, sir, I am not a rascal. Come down, sir, this very instant, or else I'll come up after you. I don't think you can, sir, replied Bob, looking down complacently, for, as we shall see by and by, he was no coward in an emergency. If you please, sir, no boy in the school can climb this tree, except me, sir, since Brown Senior left. I can tell you one thing, Garnet, it's the last time you'll ever climb it. Oh, then I must collect my things. I am sorry to keep you waiting, sir, but they are such beauties, and I can't see well to pack them. Bob packed up his treasures deliberately in his red pocket handkerchief, and descended very cleverly, holding it with his teeth. The next morning he had to pack his box, and became in the school a mere legend. His father flew into a violent passion, not with the son, but the schoolmaster. However, he was so transported with joy at getting his own Bob home again, that he soon forgave the cause of it. So the boy got the run of the potato fields, pollard trees, and rushy pools, and hunted and grubbed and dabbled, and came home sometimes with three handkerchiefs, not to mention his hat, full. One lovely day this October, before the frost set in, a frost of a length and severity most rare at that time of year, Bob Garnet took his basket and trowel, nets, lens, etc., and set out for a sandy patch not far from the stream by the rectory, where, in his July holidays, he had found some gladiolus illyricus, a bloom of which he had carried home, and now he wanted some roots of it. He could not think why his father left him so very much to himself now, and had ceased from those little caresses and fondlings which used to make Bob look quite ashamed sometimes in the presence of strangers. He felt that his father loved him quite as much as ever, and he had found those strong eyes set upon him with an expression, as it appeared to him, of sorrow and compassion. He had a great mind to ask what the matter was, but his love for his father was a strange feeling, mixed with some dread and uncertainty. He would make Pearl tell him all about it. That would be the best way, for she as well had been carrying on very oddly of late. She sat in her own room all day long, and would never come down to dinner, and would never come out for a stroll with him, but slipped out by herself sometimes in the evening. That at least he was sure of. And to tell him indeed, him going on now for seventeen years of age, that he was too young to ask questions. He would let her know, he was quite resolved, that because she happened to be two years older, a pretty reason that was for treating him like a baby. She who didn't know a wireworm from a ringworm, nor an elater from a tipula, and thought that the tippet moth was a moth that fed upon tippets. Recalling fifty other instances of poor Pearl's deep ignorance, Bob grew more and more indignant, as he thought of the way she treated him. He would stand it no longer. If she was in trouble, that was only the greater reason. Hello! Helter Skelter! Off dashed Bob after a Queen of Spain fritillary, the first he had ever seen on the wing, and a grand prize for any collector, even of ten times his standing. It was one of the second brood, invited by the sun to sport a while, and rare sport it afforded Bob, who knew it at once from the other fritillaries for the shape of the wings is quite different, and he had seen it in grand collections. An active little chap it was, greatly preferring life to death, and thoroughly aware that man is the latter's chief agent. Once Bob made quite sure of it, for it had settled on a blackberry spray, and smack the net came down upon it, but a smack too hard, for the thorns came grinning out at the bottom, and away went the butterfly, laughing. Bob made good the net in a moment with some very fine pins that he carried, and off again in still hotter pursuit, having kept his eyes on dear Lithonia. 
but the prey was now grown wondrous skeery since that narrow shave and the huntsman saw that his only chance was a clever swoop in mid-air so he raised his net high and zigzagged recklessly round the trees through the bushes up the banks and down them at last he got quite close to her but she flipped round a great beech trunk bob made a cast at hazard and caught not the queen but amy amy was not frightened much neither was she hurt though her pretty round head came out through the net for she had taken her hat off and the ring lay upon her shoulders which the rich hair had shielded from bruises she would have been frightened terribly only she knew what was going on and had stepped behind the tree to avoid the appearance of interfering for she did not wish she knew not why but by some instinct she did not wish to have much to do with the garnets she regarded poor bob as a schoolboy who was very fond of insects and showed his love by killing them but if amy was not frightened much bob the captor was he dropped the handle of his net and fell back against the beech tree then amy laughed and took off the net or the relics of the gauze at least and kindly held out her hand to him and said oh how you are grown and so are you oh dear me have you seen her have you seen her seen whom asked amy my aunt eudoxia she is on there by the ash tree the queen of spain miss rosedew the queen of spain frittlery oh tell me which way she went if i lose her i am done for then i fear master garnet confound it thought bob how all the girls do patronize me i am very much afraid that you must make up your mind to annihilation if by the queen of spain you mean that common brown little butterfly you wanted just now to kill so much is she gone across the river then that is nothing i assure you i would go through fire after her oh tell me only tell me amy could not help laughing poor bob looked so ridiculous fitting a new net all the time upon the ring of the old one the crown of his hat come to look for his head his trousers kicked well up over his boots and his coat an undoubted ventilator i really don't know said amy how could you expect me to see through your shrimp net master garnet oh i beg your pardon how stupid i am to be sure i beg your pardon a thousand times really i might have hurt you i would not do that for even the queen of spain to tell you the truth master garnet if i knew where she was gone i would not tell you because i can't bear to have things killed in my opinion it is so cruel oh cried bob a very long oh drawn out into half an ell and he looked at amy all the time he was saying it which was a wonderful thing for him to do then it occurred to his mind for the first time possibly what a beautiful creature she was more softly shaded than a chalk hill blue and richer than a cream spotted tiger moth the moment he felt this bob was done for amy had caught her captor flushed as he was with the long hot chase his cheeks grew hotter and redder as he got a dim consciousness of a few of the things which he was feeling he was like a chrysalis touched in the winter when it goes on one side from the crust of the thorax and sometimes can never get right again after having said oh with emphasis and so much diuresis bob did not feel called upon for any further utterance till amy was gone to her aunt eudoxia and then he contrived to say ah he was more put out than he had been even when his pet poplar hawk caterpillar was devoured alive by ichneumon grubs he went round the tree ever so many times and wondered what was the matter with him how he came there and what he was doing alas poor bob nature who overlooks nothing was well aware of the difficulties when she cried jump up on my lap bob and never be weaned from me she knew that things of all sorts would come between herself and her child some of them drawn from her own mother milk but most of them from man's muzzling of the latter she had not much fear with bob but the former she knew were beyond her and she had none but herself to thank for them she knew that the lad so strongly imbued with her own pleasant affluences was almost sure to be touched with that one 
which comes from her breast the warmest and then what would become of zoology phytology entomology and all the other yard-long names which her children spin out of her apron strings while bob was still fiddling with his fingers and forgetting all about butterflies miss eudoxia fetched by amy came to hold discourse with him why master robert i do declare robert my butterfly boy i have not seen you for such a time robert and she held out her hand which bob took with very little sense of gratitude to be called a butterfly boy before amy and amy to acquiesce in it ah you think i have nothing for you robert you schoolboys live upon suction but just wait a moment my dear she drew forth an old horn comfort box which had belonged to her grandmother and was polished up like amber from the chafing of many a lining this she opened with much ado poured three crinkled sugar plums on her gloved palm and a smooth one as large as a hazelnut and offered them all to robert with a smile of the finest patronage no thank you miss rosedew no thank you i am very much obliged to you miss eudoxia had been wondering at her own generosity and thought that he was overcome with it so her smile became one of encouragement and assurance against self-sacrifice oh you need not be afraid robert you can put some under your pillow and wake up in the night and suck them how nice that will be to be sure you see i know what boys are and i have plenty left for the infant school and they don't deserve them as you do robin miss rosedew said bob in his loftiest manner though he was longing for them only that amy was there you will believe me when i assure you that i never touch sweets of any sort not even at a late dinner party miss eudoxia turned her eyes up and almost dropped the sugar plums but amy instead of being impressed merrily laughed and said give them to me then auntie please some of the men at the night school eat sweets after early suppers bob said good-bye disconsolately for he knew that he had affronted miss doxy without rising in amy's opinion he forgot all about the gladiolus and let many great prizes escape him for the day was the last of the soft and sunny which tempt forth the forest denizens ere the frosty seal is set on them in the glimpses of every brown arcade in the jumbled gleam of the underwood in the alleys between the upstanding trees even in the strong light where the golden patches shone and the wood fell back to look at them in all of these he seemed to see and then to lose his angel her face he could not see clearly yet hard as he strove to do it affection is but love is not a photographic power still he could see her shadowly her attitude the fall of her hair the manner of her gestures even the ring of her voice would seem to dwell about the image but he never got them all together one each time was the leading thing vague and yet it went through him he made one attempt for he feared from the first although he never could feel it so that his love was a thorough wild goose chase the poor boy made one last attempt to catch at some other pursuit father he said that very same night after sitting for hours of wandering will you give me a gun and let me take to shooting a gun cried bull garnet starting a gun bob what do you mean by it i meant nothing at all father only i know the way to stuff birds and there are some rare ones here sometimes and i want to make a collection bob garnet as long as i am alive you never shall own a gun then will you lend me yours father i know very well how to use it i mean your patent never bob my son if you love me never speak of it again End of chapter two of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter three when miss rosedew and her niece came in to get ready for dinner amy cried out suddenly oh only look at the roses aunt how they have opened to-day what delicious louise odia 
and just look at general jacomino and i do declare jules margotin is finer than he was at midsummer i must cut a few for i know quite well there will come a great frost if i don't and then where will all my loves be amy's prediction about the weather was as random a guess as we may find in great authorities who are never right although they give the wind sixteen points of the thirty-two to shuffle in but it so turned out that the girl was right a point of the compass never hit till a day too late by our weather clerks that very same night such a frost set in as had not been known in october for very nearly a century it lasted nine nights and eight days twice the mercury fell more than half way from the freezing point to zero and the grass was crisp in the shade all day though the high sun wiped off the whiteness at noon wherever he found the way to it boys rejoiced and went mitching to slide on the pools of the open fursery no boys since the time of their great-grandfathers had done the heel-tap in october but the birds did not appreciate it what in the world did it mean why there were the hips not ripe yet and the holly-berries come to no colour and half the blackberries still too acid and lo it was freezing hard enough to make a worm cold for the stomach even if you could get him surely there was some stupid mistake of two months in the piper's almanac all they could say was that if it were so those impudent free and easy birds who came sponging on them in the winter and too stuck up forsooth to live with them after sucking all the fat off the land and winning their daughters affections those outlandish beggars be hanged to them had got the wrong almanac too why they had not even heard the chatter the everlasting high fashion clack of those jerk tail field fairs yet nor had a missile thrush come swaggering to bully a decent throstle that had sung hard all the summer just because his breast and his coarse shaped spots were bigger why they had not even seen a clumsy short-eared owl flopping out of the dry fern yet much good it might do him the fern that belonged to themselves nor a single wedge of grey lag geese nor a woodcock that knew his business and those nasty dissolute quacking mallards that floated in bed all day the sluggards and then wouldn't let a respectable bird have a chance of a good night's roost there they were still on the barley stubble please god they might only get frozen and yet confound it all what was the weather coming to you might dig and tap and jump with both feet and put your head on one side in the most knowing manner possible and get behind a tuft of grass and wait there ever so long and devil a worm would come up and as for the slugs oh don't let me hear of them though the thieves had not all gone home yet they were ten degrees too cold for even an oyster catcher's stomach feathers and pip my dear fellow it gives me the colic to think of one put your head under my wing jenny wren oh my darling how cold your beak is such so far as i could gather them were the sentiments of the birds and their confabulation when they went to roost half an hour earlier than usual for bed is the warmest place after all besides what was there to do on the twenty fourth of october eighteen fifty nine and they felt the cold rime settling down on grey twig and good brown leaf yet some of the older birds cocks of long experience buffers beyond all chaff perked one eye at the eastern heavens before tucking it under the scapula down the eastern heavens all barred with murky red then they gave a little self-satisfied tweedle which meant to the ear of melampus aha an old bird like me knows something about the weather bless my drumsticks and merry thought i shan't be so cold and hungry please god this time to-morrow night oh you little wiseacres much you know what impendeth a worse row than all the mallards you grumble at could make in a thousand years will spoil your roost to-morrow night think it a mercy if you do not get your very feathers blown off of you 
ay and the tree of your ancestors snapped beneath your feet before this time tomorrow night john rosedew met the prettiest bird that had ever nest in the new forest his own little duck of an amy in the passage by the parlour door at eight o'clock in the morning of that twenty-fifth of october he kissed her white forehead lovingly according to early usage and he glanced at the weather glass and went nearer supposing that his short sight had cheated him why amy dear you must have forgotten to set the glass last night no indeed papa i set it very carefully you know i can do it as well as you can since you showed me the way it was just a little hollow last night and i moved the varia scale just a hundred parts of an inch downwards and then it was ten o'clock then may the lord have mercy on all seafaring men especially our poor boatmen and the dredging people off rushford mr rosedew as has been said before was parson of rushford as well as of nowelhurst in the former place he kept a curate but looked after the poor people none the less for the distance was only six miles and now as his legs were getting stiff he had bought coribus to help him rushford lies towards the eastern end of the great hurst shingle bank the most dangerous part of christchurch bay being fully exposed to the southwest gales and just in the run of the double tide in the eddy of the needles why what is the matter papa even if it rains it won't hurt them much and it's as lovely a morning as ever was seen and the white frost sparkling beautifully what a magnificent sunrise or at least a very strange one sibi temperat unda carinis all is smooth for the present but i heard the lash of the ground sea last night when i lay awake fetch my telescope darling and come with me to the green room we can see thence to st alban's head but the danger is for those beyond it all the ships on this side of it will have time to work up the solent never before have i known the mercury fall as it has done now an inch and a tenth in only ten hours when they went to bed on the previous night the quicksilver stood at thirty degrees ten minutes now it was at twenty nine degrees and cupped like the bottom of a champagne bottle which showed that it still fell rapidly but as yet the silver of the frost was sparkling on the lawn and the morning sun looked up in the heavens as if he felt all right nevertheless it was but show he is bound to make the best of it and like all other warm-hearted beings sometimes has sorry work there when they saw that no large craft had rounded st alban's head only that the poor cement dredgers were working away at septaria john and his daughter went to breakfast hoping that no harm would be while miss eudoxia lay in bed and reflected on her own good qualities amy came out after breakfast without any bonnet or hat on to make her own observations that girl so loved the open air the ever glorious concave the frank palm of the hand of god for in cities we get his knuckles that she felt as if she had not bowed before her friend and maker the all-giving the all-loving one until she had paid her orisons and sung her morning hymn with his own ceiling over her so now she walked beneath the branches laden with his jewellery and over the ground hard trodden by ministers doing his will and beside the spear and the flat grass chilled with the awe of his breath and among the wailing flowers wailing and black and shrivelled up because his face was cold to them for these poor amy grieved sadly for she was just beginning to care again for the things whose roots were outside of her Lo, the bright chrysanthemums plumed reflex and fimbriate Lo, the gorgeous dahlias bosses quilled and plaited tight and wrought with depth of colour and then the elegant asters cushioned cochleate praying only to have their eyes looked into most of all her own sweet roses chosen flowers of the chosen land they hung their heads and stuck together as brown as a quartered apple who could look after them who could think of them and not feel as if some of herself were dead now walking there this youthful maiden fairest of all his works and purest 
began to observe as he has taught us the delicacies the paws the glints of the grand universal footprint not that the girl perceiveth one tenth of the things being done around her any more than i can tell them for observation grows from as well as begets experience and the girlish mind and the boyish too at any rate for the most part has very lax and indefinite communion with nature how seldom do we meet a lady who knows what way the wind is they all believe that it must freeze harder when the sky is cloudy not one in fifty but trembles more at the thunder than at the lightning yet amy with true woman's instinct being alarmed for the lives of others after her father's prediction looked around her narrowly and first her eyes went upwards and they were right in doing so of the sky she knew less than nothing although herself well known there but the trees come now she was perfectly sure she knew something about the trees so do you you darling and yet a very wee little though more than half the ladies do you know an elm from a witch elm and a hornbeam from a beech and what more can we expect of you the rhyme upon the dark tree boles and the forward push of the branches the rhyme of white fur newly breathed but an hour ago when a flaw from the east came cat-like and went through without moving anything this delicate down from the lips of morning silk-work upon the night fleece was as almost beautiful is the first to fleet and vanish changing into a doubtful glister which you must touch to be sure of then trickling away into beaded drops like a tear which will have no denial it came down the older and harder rhyme and perhaps will bring that into its humour and perhaps will get colder and freeze again into little lumps like a tap leaking then the white face of the rough pillared trunks pearled with glistening purity was bited into with scoops and dark bays like the sweep of a scythe in the morning on the bars of the gate the silver harvest spiked and cropping indefinitely began to sheave itself away and then the sheaves were full ripe tears and the tears ran down if you thought of them but the notable sight of all at least to a loitering mind the most striking was to see how the hoar-frost gradually was lifting its light wing from the grass in little tufts and random patches random to us who know not why the spangles the spears and the crusted flakes the fairy tinsel the ermine of dew the very down of moonlight the kiss of the sky too pure for snow and the glittering glance of stars reflected all this loveliness caught and fastened by the night's halogic in one broad sheet of virgin white was hovering off in tufts and patches as if a blind angel had breathed on it with his flight only guided by pity but through and in and between it all the boles of the trees and the bars of the gate the ridge of the ruts and dapples of lawn one thing amy observed which puzzled her for even she knew that it was a thing against all usage the thaw was not on the south side or the southeast side of anything though the sickly sun was gazing there but the melting came from the north and took the frost aback she wondered vainly about it but the matter was simple enough like most of the things which we wonder at instead of at our own ignorance a floor of warm air from the north had set in a lower warp which shot through and threaded the cold southeastern woof this is not a common occurrence since my vague unguided and weak observations began i have only seen it thrice and on each of those three times it has been followed by a fearful tempest usually a frost breaks up with a shift of the wind to the southeast a gradual relaxing a fusion of warmer air and a great effusion of damp a blanket of clouds for the earth and a doubt in the sky how to use them then the doubt ends as many other doubts end in precipitation the wind chops round to the west of south the moisture condenses outside our windows instead of starring the inside and then come a few spits of rain but the rain is not often heavy at first although it is stinging and biting a rain which is half ashamed of itself 
as it ought to be hail but after all these things depend on things we cannot depend on moods of the air to be multiplied into humours of the earth and sea and the product traversed endorsed divided touched and sliced at every angle by solar lunar and astral influences felix qui potuit rerum cognoscere causas lucky the man who knows when to take out his umbrella that morning the north wind crept along sponging the rime from the grass and hustling it rudely from the tree sprays on many of which the black leaves draggled frozen while yet in verdure then the sky began to be slurred across with white clouds breathing out from it as a child breathes on the blade of a knife or on a carriage window these blots of cloud threw feelers out and strung themselves together until a broad serried and serrate bar went boldly across the heavens from southeast to northwest it marked the point whence the gale would begin and the quarter where it would end from this great bar on either side dappled and mottled like the wash of sepia on a drawing little offsets straggled away and began to wisp with the spiral motion slow and yet perceptible this went on for an hour or two darkening and deepening continually amassing more and more of the sky gathering vapors to it and embodying as it got hold of them but still there was some white wan sunshine through the mustering cloud blots and the spattering mud of the heavens and still the good folks who had suffered from chilblains and found it so much milder exclaimed what a beautiful day then about noon a mock sun appeared feeble wild and haggard whose mates on the crown and the east of the ark could scarcely keep him in countenance over all this and over the true sun and the cirrus outrunners heavily drove at one o'clock the laden and leaden cumulus blurred on the outskirts with cumulus strata and daubed with lumps of vapour which mariners call noah's arks then came the first sow of the wind a long prolonged deep-drawn dry sob a hollow and mysterious sound that shivered through the brown leaves and moaned among the tree boles away went every beast and bird that knew the fearful sign the deer lanced away to the home frith the cattle in huffs came bellocking to the loo of the bowery trees the hogs ran together and tossed their snouts and skittered home from the oberst the squirrel hied to his hollow dray the weasel slunk to his tuffet lair and every rabbit skipped home from grass the crows and the magpies were all in a churn the heavy-winged heron flapped off from the brookside the jar-bird flicked out from the ivy drum the yaffingale darted across the ride with his strange discordant laugh even the creepers that ply the trees crept into lichened fastnesses lay flat to the bark and listened nor less the solid heavy powers that have to stay and break the storm no less did they the beech and clump the funnelled glens the heathery breastwork even the depths of forest night whence common winds shrink back affrighted even the bastions of norman oak scarred by many a tempest siege and buckled by the mighty gale of seventeen o three one and all they whispered of the stress of heaven impending first came fitful scuds of rain flisky rain they called it loose outriders of the storm spurning the soft ice as they dashed by and lashing the woodman's windows then a short dark pause ensued in which the sky swirled up with clouds and the earth lay mute with terror only now and then a murmur went along the uplands suddenly ere a man might say good god or where are my children every tree was taken aback every peat stack reeled and staggered every cot was stripped of its thatch on the opposite side to that on which the blow was expected the first squall of that great tempest broke from the dark southeast it burst through the sleet and dashed it upwards like an army of archers shooting ere a man could stay himself one way it had caught him up from another 
the leaves from the ground flew up again through the branches which had dropped them and then a cloud of all manner of foliage whirling flustering capering flitting soared high over the highest treetops and drove through the sky like dead shooting stars all that afternoon the squalls flew faster screaming onward to one another furious maniacs dashing headlong smiting themselves and everything then there came a lull so sudden that the silence was more stunning than the turmoil a pause for sunset for brave men countless to see their last of sunlight that evening the sundown gun from Colshot was heard over all the forest i remember to have expected fully that the next floor of air would come like a heavy sigh from the southwest the expectation showed how much i underrated the magnitude of that broad storm's area if the wind had chopped then it would have been only a hard gale not a hurricane like a wave of the sea it came on solidly and from the old direction no squall no blast any more but one bodily rush of phalanx air through a chasm in the firmament black and tossing stone and metal as a girl jerks up her hat plume it swept the breadth of land and sea as bison's hoarded sweep the snowdrifts as niagara sweeps the weeds away where the full force of that storm broke any man must have been mad drunk who attempted to go to bed houses unroofed great trees snapped off and flung into another tree men caught like chaff from the winnowing and dropped somewhere in pond or gravel pit the carrier's van overthrown on the road and three oaks come down to lie upon it some blown away people brought news of these things and fetched their breath up to tell them our own staunch hearths rocked under us and we looked for the walls to fall in upon us as every mad rush came plunging miss eudoxia sat with amy near the kitchen fire at least where the fire should have been but the wind had quenched it long ago near them cowered jemima and jenny begging not to be sent to bed they had crawled upstairs to see about it and the floor came up to them so they said like the shifting plate of the oven the parlor chimney stack had fallen but in god's mercy clear and harmless from the roof of the house no fear of the thatch taking fire that wind would have blown out the fire of london now as they sat or crouched and sidled watching the cracks of the ceiling above jumping every now and then as big lumps of mortar fell down the chimney and shrinking into themselves every time the great stack groaned and laboured so miss eudoxia full of pluck was reading aloud to little purpose for she scarcely could hear her own voice the prayers which are meant to be used at sea and the hundred and seventh psalm and who shall say that she was wrong especially as the devil is supposed to be so busy in a gale of wind jemima and amy were doing their best to catch her voice at intervals as for jenny she did not care much what became of her now she knew at the last full moon that her sweetheart was thoroughly up for jilting her and now when she had ventured out purely of her own self-will the wind had taken her up anyhow and whisked her like a snowflake against the wash-house door she was sure to have a black eye in the morning and then it would be all up with her and jemima might go sweethearting and she could not keep her company the roar through the wood the yells at the corners the bellowing round the chimneys the thunder of the implacable hurricane any mortal voice was less than a whisper into a steam whistle who could tell what trees were falling a monster might be hurled on the roof and not one of them would know it until it came sheer through the ceiling amy was pale as the cinders before her but firm as the bars of iron and even trying to smile sometimes at the shrieks and queer turns of the tempest no candle could be kept alight and the flame of the parlor lamp quivered like a shirt badly pinned on a washing line but amy was thinking dearly of the father of the household the father of the parish out in the blinding wind and rain and where the wild waves were lashing and now and then amy wondered whether it blew so hard in london and hoped they had no big chimneys there 
John Rosedew had taken his little bundle in a waterproof case and set out on foot for Rushford when the storm became unmistakable. He would not ride Caribus, first because he would have found it impossible to wipe him dry, secondly because the wind has such perches upon a man when he is up there on the pommel. So the rector strode off in his stoutest manner an hour or so before nightfall, and the rain went into him neck and shoes before he got to the peach rick to a resolute man who feels sometimes that the human hide wants tanning there are few greater pleasures than getting basted and cracklined by the wet wind only it must not come too often neither last too long so john was in excellent spirits quelching along and going pop like a ball of india rubber when he came on a weaker fellow mortal stuck fast in a chair of beetroots why robert said mr rosedew and nine-tenths of his voice went to leeward robert my boy oh dear that last exclamation followed in vain john's favourite old hat which every one in the parish loved especially the children the hat went over the crest of the hill and leaped into an oak tree and was seen no more but of turtle doves who built therein next summer and for three or four generations and all the doves were blessed for the sake of the man who sought peace and ensued it let me go after it cried bob with his knees and teeth knocking together to be sure i will replied john rosedew the nearest approach to irony that the worst wind ever took him now robert come with me he hooked the light stripling hard and firm to his own staunch powerful frame and like a steamer lashed alongside forced him across the wind front and so by keeping the covered ways by running the grooves of the hurricane they both got safe to rushford to which achievement bob's loving knowledge of every inch of the forest contributed at least as much as the stern strength of the parson pretty bob had no right of course to be out there at that time but he had heard of a glorious company of the death's head caterpillar in a snug potato field scooped from out the woodlands he knew that they must have burrowed now and so he set out to dig for them with his little hand fork directly the thaw allowed him anything to divert his mind or rather revert it into the natural channel he had dreamed about sugar plums and amy and butterfly nets and queens of spain and his father scowling over all until his brain at that sensitive time was like a cyrex trying to get out but stuck fast by the antennae now bob though awake to the little tricks and pleasant ways of nature as observed in cricks and crannies knew nothing as yet of her broader moods her purging sweeps her clearances in a word he was a stranger to the law of storms therefore he got a bitter lesson and one which set him a-thinking john rosedew with his grand bare head bent forward to the wind blow and the grey locks sweeping backward how amy would have cried towed bob garnet down the coombe which spreads out to the sea at rushford the fall of the waves was short and hard no long ocean rollers yet only an angry beating surf sputtering under the gravel cliffs they found some shelter in the hollow which opens to the south-south-west for though it was blowing as hard as ever the wind had not counted round yet and the little village of rushford upon which the sea is gaining so was happy enough in its bunny and could keep its candles burning i'll go home with the boy at sundown when the gale breaks as i hope it will his father will be in a dreadful way and i know what that man is but i could not leave the boy there neither could i go back again so said john rosedew lulled by the shelter feeling as if he had frightened himself and all his household for nothing almost ashamed to show himself at octavius pell's sea cottage the very last dwelling of the village but octave pell knew better he had not lived upon that coast fagging out as a cricketer of the church of england with his feet and his hands ready always and his spiked shoes holding the ground he had not been on the outside of all things hoping for in some day without looking up at the sky sometimes and guessing about promotion so he knew that his rector 
whom he revered beyond all the fathers of men or women for he too was soft upon amy he saw that his rector was right in coming except for his own dear sake john came in with his shapely legs stuck all tight in the shrunk kerseymere shrunk and varnished and puckered like plaiting from the pelt of the rain and by one hand still he drew the quenched and wheely bob the wind was sucking round the cliff and the door flew open hard enough for a weak man's legs to go with it but octave pell as he was called because he would sing though he could not the reverend octavius was of a sturdy order well balanced and steady going he drew in his reeking visitors and dried and fed and warmed them bob being lodged in a suit of clothes which he could only inhabit sparsely then pell laid aside his rose-root pipe out of deference to his rector and made bob drink hot brandy and water till he chattered more than his teeth had done that curate was a fine young fellow a b a of john rosedew's college to whom john had given a title for orders not sold it as some rectors do for a twelve-month stipend a tall strong gentlemanly parson stuck up in no wise nor stuck down neither of the high nor low church rut although an improvement on the old type which cared for none of these things he did his duty by his parish and as follows almost of necessity his parish loved and admired him he never lifted a poor man's pot lid to know what he had for dinner he never made much of sectarian squabbles nor tried to exercise dissent in a word he kept his place because he felt and loved it only two rooms had pell to boast of but he was wonderfully happy in them he could find all his property in the dark and had only one silver spoon and the man who can be happy with one was born with it in his mouth those two rooms he rented from old jacob thwarthaws or rather from mrs jacob for the old man was a pilot on the southampton water and scarcely home twice in a twelvemonth the little cot looked like a boat-house at the bottom of the bunny so close it was to the high water mark that the froth of the waves and the drifting skate eggs came almost up to the threshold when the tide ran big and the wind blew fresh and in the gentle summer night pray what is in the theocritus john rose you could tell but not i at least i mean without looking along the pinched caboose on every side with mincing murmur swam the ocean tide end of chapter 3「Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume 2, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 4 By the time Octavius Pell had clothed and fed and warmed his drenched and buffeted guests, the sun was slipping out of sight and glad to be quit of the mischief. For a minute or two the cloud curtain lifted over st. Albans head and a narrow bar of lively green striped the lurid heavens This was the critical period and John Rosedew was aware of it as well as Octave Pell Either the wind would shift to southwest quicker than veins could keep time with it And then there would be a lively storm with no very wide area or else it would come on again with one impetuous leap and roar and no change of direction and worked to the southwest gradually blowing harder until it got there the sea was not very heavy yet when they went out to look at it the rain had ceased altogether there was not air enough to move the fur of a lady's boa but out beyond the atlantic offing ridges like edges of knives were jumping as if to look over the skyline nulla in prospectu navis said john rosedew who always talked latin as a matter of course when he met an oxford man at least so far as i can see with the aid of my long rangers no replied pell and i'm heartily glad that there is no ship in sight for unless i'm much mistaken 
run sir run like lightning i've got no more dry clothes they ran for it and were just in time before the fury came down again bob garnet was ready to slip away for he knew that his father would be wild about him he had taken his drenched hat from the fire tongs and was tugging at the latch of the door but now there was no hope for it we are in for it now cried mr rosedew i have not come down for nothing it is what i feared this morning the heaviest storm that has broken upon us for at least a generation and we are not yet in the worst of it god grant there be no unfortunate ship making for the needles all our boats you say pell are in the solent long ago bob my boy you must not expect to see your father to-night i hope he will guess what has happened the beach or pebble bank of hurst is a long and narrow spit of land growing narrower every year which forms a natural breakwater to the frith of the solent it curves away to the south of east from the straighter and more lofty coast of barton hordle and rushford hurst castle in which it terminates is the eastern horn of christchurch bay at hengisbury head in the western the isle of wight and the needle rocks protect this bay from the east wind's power but a due south wind brings in the sea and the southwest the atlantic off the coast we see at times those strange floating or rising islands known by the name of the shingles which sometimes stay above water so long that their surface is clad with the tender green of bladderwort and samphire but more often they disappear after taking the air for a few short hours for several years now they have taken no air and a boatman told me the other day that from the rapid strides of the sea he thought it impossible for the shingles ever to top the waves again up and down the solent channel the tide pours at a furious speed and the rush of the strong ebb down the narrows flushed with the cross tide from st helens cooms and pants out into christchurch bay above the flood mark of two hours since this great eddy or reflux is called the double tide and an awkward power it has for any poor vessel to fall into all that night it blew and blew harder and harder yet the fishermen's boats on the beach were caught up and flung against the gravel cliff the stout men if they ventured out were snatched up as a mother snatches a child from the wheels of a carriage the oaks of the wood after wailing and howling as they had done to a thousand tempests found that outcry go for nothing and with it went themselves seven hundred towers of nature's building showed their roots to the morning the old moon expired at zero thirty two and many a gap the new moon found where its mother threw playful shadows the sons of Aitin were not swift-witted nor deeply read in the calendar yet they are apt to mark and heed the great convulsions of nature the old men used to date their weddings from the terrible winter of seventeen eighty seven the landmark of the young men's annals is the storm of eighteen fifty nine all that night young robert garnet was strung by some strange tension of course he could not sleep amid that fearful uproar although he was plunged and lost from sight in octavius pell's great chair the only luxury pell possessed and that somehow by accident was a deep and soft and mighty chair big enough for three people after one of the windows came in which it did with a crash about ten o'clock scattering pell's tobacco jars and after they had made it good with books and boxes and a rug so that the wind was filtered through it john rosedew and his curate sat on a couple of hard old windsors watching the castle of hurst thence would come the signal flash if any hapless bark should be seen driving over the waters there they sat john rosedew talking as he could talk to a younger man when his great heart was moved to its depth and the multitude of his mind in march and his soul anticipating it talking so that octave pell following his silver tones even through that turmoil utterly forgot the tempest and the lapse of hours and let fall on his lap the pipe which john had made him smoke 
the thunder of the billows waxing for the wind was now southwest began to drown the roar of the gale and the storm of foam was flying when the faint gleam of a gun at sea was answered by artillery's flash from the walls of old henry the eighth both men saw the landward light leap up and stream to leeward but only the younger one descried the weak appeal from the offing where is she pell have you any idea she is away sir here to the right dead in the eye of the wind then may our god and father pity our brothers and our sisters out ran both those strong good men leaving poor bob as they thought asleep in the depth of the easy chair the little cottage was partly sheltered by an elbow of the cliff otherwise it would have been flying up the bunny long ago the moment the men came out of the shelter they were driven one against the other and both against the cliff my castle will go at high water said pell though no one could hear him but i shall be back in time enough to get the old woman out then as far as pell could make out in the fierce noise and the darkness john rosedew begged him to go back while himself went on alone for it was john's especial business he had procured the lifeboat chosen a crew and kept the accounts and he thought himself responsible for any wreck that happened but what good on earth could pell do and all his chattels in danger no good very likely pell shouted and a good deal perhaps indoors keep the sea out with a besom octave had a dry way with him not only when he sang but when he thought he saw the right and did not mean to argue it so rector and curate old man and young man trudged along together each bending low and throwing his weight like a quoit against the wind each stopping and crouching at every tenth yard as the blast irresistible broke on them crusted with hunks of froth pell-mell like a storm of eggs on the hustings drenched by pelting sheets of spray deafened by the thundering surf and often obliged to fly with the wind from a wave that rushed up scolloping they battled for that scoop of the bay where the ship must be flung by the indraft up to the present christchurch point and st albans head beyond it broke as the wind was westering some little of the wildest sea brunt but now they stood or rather crouched where the mountain rollers gathering sweeping towering onward avalanche upon avalanche burst on their destined barrier a thousand leagues of water swelled by the whole weight of heaven flung on it there leaped up on the solid earth and to the heaven that vexed it as a strong man in his wrath accepts his wife's endorsement so the surges took the minor passion of a fierce spring tide rolled it in their own and scorned the flat land they looked down upon tush the combing of their crests was bigger than any town there on they came too grand to be hurried even by the storm that roused them each had a quarter of a mile to himself and who should take it from him the white foam fell back in the wide water valleys and hissed and curdled away in flat loops and the storm took the mountain ridges again and swept the leaping snow off anon as it struck the shelving shore each rolling monster tossed its crest unspeakably indignant hung with impending volume curling like the scroll of god then thundered as in judgment down and lashed the trembling earth among them not a mile from shore as the breaking daylight showed it heaved and pitched and wallowed hog-like in the trough of waters a large ship swept and naked swept of her masts of her canvas naked but clad alas with men and women clustering clinging cowering from the great white grave beneath them as she labored reeled and staggered up the storm-rent heavens and then plunged down the yawning chasm every attitude every gesture of terror love despair and madness could be descried on the object glass of the too faithful telescope as a ghastly wan gleam from the east lit up all that quivering horror all that plight of anguish john rosedew turned away in tears and fell upon his knees 
but pell caught up the clear munich glass blocked every now and then with foam he wiped it with his cuff and levelled it on a stony ledge there he lay behind the pebbles himself not out of danger unable to move or look away spellbound by the awe of death in numbered moments coming round him many a sturdy boatman gazing listening rubbing his eyes wondering about the wives and children of the brave men there the great disaster imminent was known all over the village and all who dared to cross the gale had crept under shelter hitherwards none was fool enough to talk of boat or tug or lifeboat a child who had then first seen the sea must have known better than that the best ship in the british navy could not have come out of the needles in the tenth of such a hurricane some of the tars had brought their old dolans preventive glasses long cashiered and smugglers night rakers cheek by jowl and every sort of perspective fifty years old and upward with the lenses cracked and rattling and fungoid tufts in the object glass nevertheless each man would swear that his own glass was the best of the lot and his neighbors not of much count to their minds telescopes like spectacles suit the proprietor only by jove i believe she'll do it cried pell the chief interpreter his glass being the only clear one do what sir what asked a dozen voices hurriedly get her head round to windward and swing into smoother water they're in the undertow already oh if they only knew it they knew it he saw in a moment they ran up a spare sail ere he could speak to the stump of the mizzenmast and a score of brave men strained on the sheets until they had braced them home they knew that it would not stand long it would fly away to leeward most likely when they once mounted the wave crest but two or three minutes might save them with eight hands jamming the helm up and the tough canvas tugging them bellying the ship with the aid of the undertow plunged heavily to windward all knew that the ship herself was doomed that she never could fetch off shore but if she could only hold her course for some half mile to the westward she would turn the flank of those fearful rollers and a good stout boat might live for there a southwestern headland broke the long fury of the sea every eye was intent every bosom drew a deep breath as the next great billow rose under the ship and tossed her up to the tempest they had brought her as near to the wind as they dared so as still to have steerage way on her and she took the whole force of the surge on her port bow not on her beam as the people on shore had feared the sea broke bodily over her and she staggered back from the blow and shook through every timber then leaped and lurched down the terrible valley but still with the good sail holding she was under noble seamanship that was clear to everyone and herself a noble fabric if she could but surmount two billows more without falling off from the wind within three points of which her head lay most of the crew might be rescued already a stout galley manned with ten oars was coming out of christchurch harbour dancing like a cork on the waves though sheltered by the headland our ship rode over the next billow gallantly it was a wave that had some moderation and the lungs of the gale for the moment were panting just as she topped the comb of it hooray shouted the men ashore by god she'll do it yet by god alone could she do it but the father saw not fit the third billow was the largest of all that had yet rolled up from the ocean beam end on she clomb the mountain heeling over heavily showing to the shore her deck seams even the companion finial and the poor things clinging there a wail broke from them as the great sea struck her and swept away half a score of them now's your chance men dear eyes she won't hang there two minutes out with the boats you lubbers look sharp and be dee to you the ancient pilot thwarthors dancing and stamping his blue jacket flapping in the wind and his face of the deepest plum color roared to windward 
his whirlwind of oaths up an old split trumpet down which the wind came bellowing harder than his voice went up it stow that jacob cried an old scotchman survivor of many a wreck can you not see his reverence mon it's an unco thing for an old mon like you to swear at your mates and your shrews chap I ken the skipper of that there ship, and he's no lubber, no more than I be. Sandy McBride was known to fear God, and to have fifty pounds in his savings bank. Therefore, no one flouted him. You're right, Mac. You're right, by George, cried Pell. What a glorious fellow! I can see him there, holding on by the stanchion, giving his orders as coolly as if for the cabin dinner. I could die with that man. The tear in Octavius Pell's right eye compelled him to shift the glass a bit. He was just the man who would have done even as that captain did. Hooray! Hooray! They've got the launch out. Only she and the jig are left. Troops on the deck drawn up in a line, and the women hoisted in first. Give them three cheers, men, though they can't hear you. Three cheers if you are Englishmen. Glorious! Glorious! There they go. Never saw such a fine thing in all my life. Oh, I wish I had been a sailor. The tears ran down the young parson's cheeks and were blown into the eyes of old McBride. Or else he had some of his own. Shove off! Shove off! Now's your time, for the undercurrent is failing her. Both of them off as I'm alive. And yet a third boat I could not see. What magnificent management! That man ought to command a fleet. Two of them off for Christchurch Harbour. Away, away, while the wind lulls. But what is the third boat doing? Everyone was looking. No one answered. Old Mac knew what it was, though his eyes were too old to see much. Captain Roberts, I'll go bail, at his old tricks again. And there's none with the sense to mutiny on him, and lash his legs as we did in the samphire. At the side of the ship there is some dispute. The boat is laden to the water's edge, and the ship paying off to leeward, for there is no man at the wheel. There goes the sail from the bolt ropes. If they don't push off ere an oar's length, they will all be sucked into the rollers. Good God, now I see what it is. There is only room for one more, and not one of those three will take it. Two white-haired men and a girl. Life against honour with the old men, and what is life compared with it? Both resolve not to stir a peg. Now they join to make the girl go. Her father has got her in his arms to pitch her into the boat. She clings around his neck so that both must go, or neither. He could not throw her. She falls on her knees and clings to his legs to die with him. Smack! There, the rope is parted, and it is too late for further argument. The troops in the boat salute the officer and he returns it as on parade name of that ship said jacob curtly to old sandy mcbride aliwal east india trader captain roberts calcutta to southampton then it's all up now with the aliwal and every soul on board of her don't want a pilot to tell us that answered old mac testily you've seen a good many craft pilot but never one as could last five minutes on the shingle bank with this sea running Ropes, ropes, cried Octave Pell. In five minutes she'll be ashore here. No, she aren't. Nor yet in ten, answered his landlord gruffly. She'll fetch her way to the eastward first. Now she is in the tide again, especially with this gale on. And she'll take the ground over yonder and go to pieces with the next breaker. She took her course exactly as old Jacob mapped it out for her. He knew every run and flaw of the tide, and how it gets piled in the narrows by a very heavy storm, and runs back in the eddy, which had saved so many lives there. This has nothing to do with the double tide that comes after high water. As the good ship traced the track of death, doing as the waves willed, like a little boy's boat in the serpentine, the people on shore could see those three who had contested the right of precedence to another world. They were all upon the quarter-deck, and three finer figures never yet came to take the air there, in the weariness of an Indian voyage. Captain Roberts, a tall, stout man, with ruddy cheeks and a broad white beard, stood with his hands in his pockets and his feet asunder, and a sense of discipline in his face, as of a man who has done his duty, and now obeys his maker. No sign of flinching 
or dismay in his weather-beaten eyes as he watched his death roll towards him though the gazers fancied that one tear rose perhaps at the thought of his family just coming downstairs at lymington the military man beside him faced his death quite differently perhaps with even less of fear but with more defiance broken every now and then by anguish for his daughter he had not learned to fear the lord as those men do who go down into the great deep he looked as if he ought to be commanding officer of the tempest the ship running now before wind and sea darted along as a serpent darts over the graves in the churchyard she did not lurch any more or labor but rose and fell just showing her forefoot or sternpost as the billows passed under her and so that young maiden could stand and gaze with her father's arm thrown round her she was worthy to be his daughter tall and light of form and calm with eyes of wondrous brightness she was looking at her father's face to say the last good-bye then she flung both arms around his neck and fondly sadly kissed him meanwhile the ship captain turned away and thought of susie roberts suddenly he espied a life-belt washed into the scuppers he ran for it in a moment came behind the maid and without asking her consent threw it over her and fastened it there was little chance of it helping her but that little chance she should have she'll take the ground next biller cried oracular jacob stand by there with the ropes boys on the back of a huge wave rose for the last time the unfortunate aliwal stem on as if with strong men steering she rushed through the foam and the white whirl like a hearse run away with in snowdrifts then she crashed on the stones and the raging sea swept her from taffrail to bowsprit rolled her over pitched her across and broke her back in two moments the shock rang through the roar of billows as if a nerve of the earth were thrilling another mountain wave came marching to the roll of the tempest drum it curled disdainfully over the side like a fog sweeping over a hedgerow swoop it broke the timbers away as a giant tosses a fir cone i can't look any longer cried pell give me something to feel men quick there i see something he seized the bite of a rope and rushed anyhow into the waters but John Rosedew and the lifeboatmen held hard upon the coil of it and drew him with all their might back again They hauled Octavius Pell up in the manner of a codfish and he was so bruised and stupefied that he could not tell what he had gone for They only saw floating timber and gear and wreck of every sort drifting till just for one sight flash a hoary head whiter than driven waters leaped out of the comb of the billow a naval man or a military who knows and to whom does it matter brave men ashore all waiting ready dashed down the steep of death to save him if the great wave should toss up its plaything all rushford strained at the cables that held them from the savage recoil worse than useless the only chance of it was to make more widows the sea leaped at those gallant strong men there were five on either cable it leaped at them as the fiery furnace leaped on the plain of Dura. It struck the two ropes into one with a buffet, as a lion's paw shatters a cobweb. It dashed the men's heads together and flung them all in a pile on a ballast heap. Lucky for them that it fought with itself and clashed there and made no recoil. The white-haired corpse was seen no more, and all Rushford shrunk back in terror. The storm was now at its height and of more than a hundred people gathered on the crown of the shore and above the reach of the billows Not one durst stand upright Nearer the water the wind had less power for the wall of waves broke the full brunt of it But there no man unless he were most quick of eye and foot might stand without great peril For scarcely a single billow broke but what in the first rebound and toss two churning hummocks of surf met and flashed up the strand like a mad white horse far in advance of the rest then a hissing ensued and a roll of shingle and the water poured huddling and lappeting back from the chine itself had crannied 
as brave men fled from a rush of this sort and cowards on the bank were laughing at them something white was seen in the curl of the wave which was breaking behind it the ebb of that inrush met the wave and partly took the crash of it then the white thing was shot on the shore like a pellet and lay one instant motionless there was no rope there and the men hung back john rosedew cried shame and ran for it but they joined hands across and stopped him before they could look round again some one had raised the body twas young bob garnet and in his arms lay the maiden senseless she had looked at him once and then swooned away from the whirl and the blows and the terror no rope round his body no cork no pad he had rushed full into the raging waves as he woke from his sleep of heaviness he lifted the girl and a bending giant hung thirty feet above them then a shriek like a woman's rang out on the wind and two great arms were tossed to heaven bull garnet stood there and strove to rush on strove with every muscle but every nerve strove against it he was balanced and hung on the wind for a moment as the wave hung over his heart's love crash came the wave what shriek could stop it after three hundred miles of rolling a crash that rang in the souls of all whom youth could move or nobleness nothing was seen in the depth of water the swirling hurling whiteness until the billow had spent its onset and the curdle of the change was then bob swept many a fathom in shore but gripping still that senseless thing that should either live or die with him bob who could swim as well or better than he could climb a tree but felt that he and his load were only dolls for the wave to dandle down he went after showing his heels and fought the deadly outrush none but nature's pet would have thought of none but the favored of god could have done it he felt the back wave tugging at him he felt that he was going if another billow broke on him it was all up with his work upon wireworm holding his breath he flung his right leg over the waist of the maiden dug his two hands deep into the gravel and clapped his feet together scarcely knowing what was up he held on like grim death for life and felt a barrow load of pebbles rolling down the small of his back presently he saw light again and sputtered out salt water and heard a hundred people screaming out hooray and felt a strong arm thrown round him not his father's but john rosedew's three senseless bodies were born to the village bull garnets and bobs and the maidens end of chapter four to five of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter five meanwhile that keen engineering firm wind wave and tide had established another little business on the coast hard by this was the general wreck and crack up of the stout pell castle a proceeding unnoticed by any one except good mother jacob whose attention was drawn to it forcibly as the head of the bed fell in upon her thereupon the stout dame made a rush for it taking only her cat and spectacles and the little teapot of money as she started at a furious pace and presented to the elements a large superficial area the wind could not resist the temptation but wafted her to the top of the bunny without her feet so much as once a touching the blessed earth she goes mad if any one doubts it and planted her in a white thorn tree and brought an elam of thatch to shelter her from her own beloved roof there when the wind subsided she was happily discovered by some enterprising children the cat was sitting at her side in one blue hand she held her specks and in the other a teapot poor pell's easy chair was thrown up three miles to the westward in the course of the next spring tides and being well known all over the neighbourhood from his lending it to sick people was brought to him with a round of cheers by half a dozen fishermen they refused the half-crown he offered them 
and displayed the greatest anxiety lest his honour should believe it was them as had taken the shrine off the workmanship not being modern the chair was little the worse for its voyage only it took six months to dry and had a fine smell of brine ever afterwards then having been lent to an old salt's widow it won such a reputation all across the new forest as a specific for rheumatics in the small of the back that old women having no small to their backs walked all the way from lyndhurst just to sock themselves down in it and how much was to pay please for a quarter of an hour a shilling said octave pell a shilling for the new lifeboat that lives under christchurch head then they pulled out mighty silver watches and paid the shilling at the fifteen minutes the walk and the thought of the miracle and the fear of making fools of themselves did such a deal of good that a man got up a bus for it but pell said no one who come by bus shall sit in my chair of ease the greedy sea returned brave pell no other part of his property his red tobacco jar indeed was found by some of the dredgemen three or four years afterwards but they did not know it was his and sold it crusted as it was with testacea and ribboned with seaweed to the zealous secretary of i won't say what museum roman or perhaps samian or perhaps phoenician ware cried the secretary lit with fine though it may be loose ideas and he catalogued it phoenician in the opinion of an f a s there is every reason to believe it of ours fury cremation hello cried pell when he went there to lecture upon cricket as played by ulysses why i'm blessed if you haven't got the most undoubted phoenician relic contained in any museum so he laughed with other people's cheeks like a man of sense all the folk of rushford and many too of nowelhurst contributed to a secret fund for refurnishing octavius pell so great were the mystery and speed and so clever the management of the dissenting parson that two great vans were down upon pell before he had heard a word of it he stood at the door of the cobbler's shop and tried to make a speech but the hurrahs were too many for him and he turned away and cried tell me of any man in england need to be anything but popular who has a heart of his own and is not ashamed of having it at the crown where the three sick people were a very fine trade was doing but a finer one still upon the beach as the sea went down and the choice contents of the aloe came up for the terrible storm began to abate about noon on the twenty sixth it had blown as hard for twenty-four hours as it ever does blow in any land except in the gaps of the andes and during cyclones of the tropics now the core of the storm had no more cells in it and the puffs that came from the west and northwest and so on till it got to the pole star were violent indeed but desultory and seemed not to know where they were going finally about midnight the wind owned that its term was over and sunk well satisfied with its work into the arms of slumber placidaque ibi demon morte quievit and its work had been done right well no english storm since the vast typhoon of seventeen o three which i should like to write about some day if my little life storm blows long enough had wrought such glorious havoc upon that swearing beaver man it had routed his villages at the land's end and lifted like footstools his breakwater blocks it had scared of the lives of his eddystone watchmen and put out half his lighthouses it had broken upon his royalty and swept down the oaks of the new forest it had streaked with wrecks the goodwin sands and washed ships out of harbours of refuge it had leaped upon london as on a drain trap and jarred it as a man whistles upon his fingers it had huddled pell-mell all the coal trade saddest vaunt though not the last it had strewn with gashed and mangled bodies like its own waves countless the coasts of anglesey and carnarvon on the morning now of the twenty seventh with the long sullen swell gold beater skinned by the recovering sun the shingle bank was full of interest to an active trader they had picked up several bodies with a good bit of money upon them and the beach was strewn with oranges none the worse for a little tossing for the stout east indiaman aliwal 
had touched at the western islands and taken on board a thousand boxes of the early orange harvest and not only oranges were rolling among the rack the starfish the shark's teeth and the cuttle eggs but also many a pretty thing once prized and petted by women there were little boxes with gilt and paint sucked heartily by the salt water and porcupine quills rasping up from panels of polished ebony cracked mirrors inside them and mother of pearl and beading of scented wood all the taste and the labor of man yawning like dead cockles crimped backward sodden and shredded as hopeless a wreck as a drunkard then there were barrels and heavy chests planking already like hemp in the prison yard bulkheads and bulwarks and cordage and reeve blocks and ten thousand other things well appreciated by the wreckers who were hauling them up for bunnies while the admiralty droitsman made an accurate inventory of the bungs and the blacking bottles some of the sailors and most of the passengers who had escaped in the boats to christchurch came over to look for anything that might turn up of their property hereupon several fights ensued and many poor fellows enjoyed opportunity for a closer inspection of the rushford stratum than the most sanguine of their number anticipated until the police came down in force and extinguished at once all other rights of salvage except their own nevertheless there was yet one field upon which the police could not interfere although jack wished for nothing better than to catch the lubbers there this was jack's own domain the sea where an animated search was going on for the body of colonel noel his servant had hurried from christchurch to nowelhurst to report the almost certain death of sir cradock's only brother he did not go first to ascertain it for the road along the cliffs was impassable during the height of the storm sir cradock received the announcement with very few signs of emotion he had loved that clayton in early youth but now had almost forgotten him and clayton had never kept his brother at all apprised of his doings sir cradock had gone into mourning for him some three years ago and colonel nowell never took the trouble to vindicate his vitality until dr hutton's return and even though they had really known and loved one another as brothers the loss would have been but a tap on the back to a man already stabbed through the heart therefore sir cradock's sorrow exploded as we love to make our griefs do and as we so often express them in the moneyed form I will give five hundred pounds to the man who finds my poor brother's body That little speech launched fourteen boats What wrecker could hope for anything of a tenth part of the value? Men who had sworn that they never would pull in the same boat again together Might the great being the giver of life strike them dead if they did Forgot the solemn perjuration and cried give us your flipper Ben after all there are worse fellows going than you my lad and ben responded jump into the starn sheets you are just the hand as we want harry many's the time i've thought on you even the dredging smack hauled inshore from their stations and began to dredge for the colonel till the small boats resolved on united action tossed oars and held solemn council several speeches were made none of them very long but all embodying that fine sentiment fiat justitia ruat coelum in the form of fair play and be deed to you then sandy mac of the practical mind made a suggestion which was received with three wild rounds of cheers give em a little ballast boys as they come in shore to dredge for it with one consent the fourteen boats made for the shore like the fleet of canoes described by the great defoe nor long before each shallop's nose grated on the golden sands the men in the dredging smacks looked at the sky to see if a squall was coming and soon they got it thick as hail and as hot as pepper the fourteen boats in battle array advanced upon them slowly only two men rowing in each all the rest standing up and every man charged heavily when they were at a nice wicket distance old mac gave the signal and a flight of stones began which in the words of the ancient chroniclers well nigh darkened the noonday sun the bravest dredger durst not show his head above the gunwale for the rushford stones are close of grain and it is sweeter to start than to stop them as for southwesters and dreadnoughts 
they were no more use than vine leaves in a storm of electric hail ah little then those mellow grapes their vine leaves shall avail so thickly rattles on the tiles the pelting of the hail the dredgers gave in and hoisted a skirt as a signal for a parley the rushford men refused to hear a syllable about snacks what they demanded was unconditional surrender and the dredgers having no cement stones on board were compelled to accept it so they took up their bags and walked the smacks off three miles away to their station with very faint hopes indeed that the obliging body might follow them the boatmen celebrated their victory with three loud cheers for sandy mac and a glass of grog all round then they returned to the likeliest spot and dragged hard all the afternoon tarnation cute body cried ben as i ever come across who'd a thought as any professing christian would, would have stuck to davy jones's locker and refuged the parson and clerk so spit on your grapples my lads of wax and better luck to cast after the lord kens the best replied sandy mac with a long drawn sigh as poor vessels canna do more than is the will o the lord boys howsomever i brought a bit o bait a few lugworms and a soft crab or two and please the lord i'll rig my line out and see if the bass be moving and likely there be a tumbling cod on the run spearing after the pure bodies ah yes the will o the lord we ate them and they ate us the canny old scotsman without foregoing his share of the general venture for he helped to throw the grapnels or took a spell at the rudder rigged out a hook on his own account and fastened the line to the rowlocks fair play my son cried ben winking at his comrades us go snacks in what you catch mind and the will o the lord be done dinner you wish ye may get it the old man glowered at him indignantly i'll no fish at all on that understanding fish away old boy and be blessed then i see he ain't been in, in the poventis service for nothing but i'm blowed if he'll get much supper harry if it's all to come off that darned old hook they all laughed at old mac who said nothing but regarded his line attentively with many a joke and many an oath they toiled away till the evening fog came down upon the waters then as they turned to go home old mac felt a run upon his fishing gear hand over hand he began to haul in coiling the line in the stern sheets it's a whopping big fish as ever i feel mates na na you'll not touch it or you'll be claiming to come and sup with me i deal a bit the lord forgive me will ye have the grinning at an old man that likes o that i tell ye lord have mercy on me awake and sinful creetur they all fell back except mcbride as before them in the twilight rose the ashy grey face and long white hair of colonel clayton nowell mac stuck to his hall like a scotchman to him the main chance was no ghost many a time has he told that story and turned his quid upon it cleverly reigning between his teeth with fine art to prolong the crisis the line being his and the hook being his and the haul of his own hands only sandy mac could never see why he should not have all the money the question came close to litigation but for that except as a word of menace mac was a deal too wide awake he compounded at last for three hundred pounds and let the other four share the residue so poor colonel nowell's countenance still looking grand and dignified was saved from the congers and lobsters and he sleeps close by his nephew and namesake in nowelhurst churchyard the body of captain roberts was found a long way up the solent he had always carried a weather helm and shaped a good course for harbour may they rest in peace i have no doubt that captain roberts so rests and am fain to believe in the mercy of god the same of the brave old colonel at least we will hope that he is not gone to that eternal punishment whose existence our divines contend for in a manner so disinterested he had been a harem scarum man and now having drowned and buried him we may enter upon his history with the charity due to both quick and dead but paid to the latter only a soldier is in many things by virtue of his calling a generous careless man 
we have always credited the sailor with these popular qualities hornpipes national drama and naval novels imbuing us i doubt if the sailor be on the whole so careless a man as the soldier jack is obliged by force of circumstance to bottle up his money his rollicksomeness and sentimentality and therefore has more to get rid of when he comes ashore once in a twelvemonth but spread the outburst over the year strike the average of it and the rainfall at aldershot will equal that at portsmouth only by watching the army list which at length he was tired of doing could the english brother tell if the indian brother were living even the most careful of us begin to feel that care is too much for the nine lives of a cat when fahrenheit scores a hundred and ten degrees in the very coolest corner and the punker is too hot to move so after one or two griffin letters full of marvels which the writer pretended not to marvel at a silence as of the jungle ensued and sir cradock thought of tigers then the slides of his own life began to move upon him and less and less every year he thought of the boy who had laughed and cried with him lieutenant noel was ordered suddenly to the borders of the punjab and for twenty years his brother cradock drank his health at christmas and wondered how about the article against praying for the dead the next thing he heard though it proved his own orthodoxy disproved it by making him swear hard clayton noel had married married an afghan woman to the great disgust of his brother officers and the furious disdain of her kinsmen a very fine family of afghan chiefs immediately loaded their fusils and swore to shoot both that english dog and their own bright eyes of the morning to think cried sir cradock nowell that a brother of mine should disgrace himself and what matters far more his family by marrying a wretched low afghan woman to think cried mohammed khans that a sister of ours should disgrace herself and what matters far more her family by marrying a cursed low english dog which party was in the right judge ye who understand the matter the officers wives got over their prejudice against bright eyes of the morning and matronized and petted and tried to make a christian of her captain noel adored her she was so elegant in every motion so loving and so simple she quite reformed him for the time from his too benevolent anthropology from the love of dice from the vinous doings which the prophet does not encourage but the poor thing died in her first confinement while following her husband's regiment at the foot of the himalaya leaving her newborn babe to the care of a faithful afghan nurse who had kept at her dear lady's side even among the infidels this good nurse being great of soul and therefore strong of faith could not bear that the child of her mistress the highest blood of the afghans should become a low frank idolater so she set off with it in the dark night crouching past the sentinels thieves and other camp followers and trusted herself to the boundless jungle with only the stars to guide her she put the wailing child to her breast for her own dear babe was dead and hushed it from the vigilant ears of the man-eating tiger then off again for afghanistan six hundred miles in the distance how this wonderful woman soothing and coaxing the little stranger obtrusively remarkable for the power of her squalls how she got on through the thorns the fire the famine the jaws of the tiger and worse than all the pestilent fever bred from the rich stagnation of that alluvial soil is more than i or any other unversed in woman's unity may pretend to show enough that with her eyes upon the grand religious heights heathen high places we should call them she struggled along through nearly three-quarters of her pilgrimage and then she fell among robbers a villainous hill tribe of mixed origin always shifting never working never even fighting when they could run away hated and despised by the nobler mountain races the pariahs of the himalaya ignorant of any good debased as any africans in a single word rakshas or worshippers of the devil a nice school of education for a young lady of tender years or rather months to commence in the nurse was allotted to one of their chiefs and the babe was about to be knocked on the head 
when it struck an enlightened priest that in two years time she would make a savory oblation to the devil so the afghan woman was allowed to keep her until she began to crawl about among the dogs and babes of the station here she so distinguished herself by precocious skill in thieving that her delighted owner conferred upon her the title of never spot the dust and even instructed her how to steal the high priest's knife of sacrifice that last exploit saved her life such a genius had never appeared in any tribe of the rakshas until this great manifestation so never spot the dust was well treated and made much of by her owner to whom she was quite a fortune and soon all the band looked up to her as the future priestess of the devil for ten years she wandered about with them becoming every year more important proud that none could reproach her skill in stealing lying and perjury utterly void of all religion except the few snatches of muslimism which her nurse had contrived to impart and the vague terror of the evil spirit to whom the wild men paid their vows but when she was ten years old a tall and wonderfully active child and just about to be consecrated by the blood of inferior children a british force drew suddenly all around the nest of robbers of late the scoundrels had done things that made john bull's hair stand on end and when his hair is in that condition sparks are apt to come out of it seeing no chance of escape and having very faint hopes of quarter the robbers fought with a bravery which quite astonished themselves but the evil spirit was against them a rare inconsistence on his part their rascally camp was burnt which they who had burned some hundreds of villages looked upon as the grossest cruelty and more than half of their number were sent home to their patron and guardian when the afghan nurse so faithful and so unfortunate fled from the burning camp with her charge fell before the british colonel and poured forth all her troubles the englishman knew major noel and had heard some parts of his history so he took never spot the dust to her father who was amazed at once and amused with her she could run up the punkah and stand on the top and twirl around on one foot she could cross the compound in three bounds she could jump upon her father's shoulder and stay there with the spring of her soul she could glide along over the floor like a serpent and hold on with one hand to anything and then her most wonderful lightness of touch she had fully earned her name she could brush the dust without marking it she could come behind her father's back crawling over the table and fasten his sword hilt to his whiskers without his knowing a thing of it she could pick all his pockets of course but that was too rude an operation for her to take any delight in what she delighted to do and what even she found difficult was to take off his shoes and stockings without his being aware of it it was a beautiful thing to see her consummate skill is beautiful in whatever way it is exercised the shoes she could get off easily enough but the difficulty was with the stocking and there the chief difficulty was through the sensitiveness of the skin unaccustomed to exposure though she had never heard of temperature evaporation or anything long her genius told her the very first time where the tug was and how to meet it keeping her little cornelian lips lips which you could see through just at the proper distance she would breathe so softly upon the skin that the breath could not be felt as inch by inch she lowered down the thin elastic covering then she would jump up out of the ground and shout into his ears with a voice of argute silver faddery will you have a shoe fear to go without him she began to talk english after a bit and the weather-beaten colonel for now he had got that far who had never looked upon any child except as one rupee per month thinking of his beloved bright eyes of the morning who might with the will of god have made a first-rate man of him only she was too good for him thinking of her and seeing the gleam of her glorious eyes in her child he loved that child beyond all reason and christened her Eoa. He never took to bad things again. He had something now in pledge with God, a part of himself that still would live and love him when he was skeleton. And that, his better part, 
should learn how lying and stealing do not lead to the right half of the other world his ideas about that other world were as dormant as eoa's but now he began to think about it because he wanted to see her there so with lots of tears not only feminine eoa noel was sent to the best school in calcutta where she taught the other young ladies some very odd things indeed wherever she went she must be foremost second to none was her motto therefore she learned with amazing quickness but it was not so easy to unlearn then arose that awful mutiny and the colonel at mal was shot through the neck and let lie by his own soldiers his daughter heard of it and screamed and no walls ever built would hold her all the way from calcutta up the dreary ganges she forced her passage sometimes by boat sometimes on her weariless feet she had never cared much for civilization and loved every blade of the jungle the old life revived within her and she looked upon the broad waters and the boundless yellow tangle wherein glided no swifter thing nothing more elegant than herself she found her darling father in some rude cantonment prostrate helpless clinging faintly to the verge of death dead long ago he must have been but for rufus hutton and dead even now he would have been but for his daughter's presence his dreamy eyes went round the hut to follow her graceful movements she alone could tend the wounds as if with the fall of gossamer she alone could soothe and fan the intolerable aching they looked into each other's eyes and cried without thinking about it then as he gradually got better and the surge of trouble passed them eoa showed for his amusement all her strange accomplishments she had not forgotten one of them in the grand school of calcutta they had even grown in her growth and strengthened with her strength she would leap over rufus hutton's head like a flash of light and stand facing him without a muscle moving and on his back would be a land crab she would put his up-country hat on the floor and walk on one foot round the crown of it she would steal his case of instruments and toss them in the air all open and catch them all at once by her nursing and her loving her stealing and her mockery she won dr hutton's heart so entirely that he would have proposed to her had she only been of marriageable age or had come to think about anything then they had all to cut and run with barely three hours notice for the ebb of the rebellion swept through that district mightily eoa went to school again and her father came to see her daily until he was appointed to a regiment having something more than name and shadow now eoa having learned everything that they can teach in calcutta the himalaya or the jungle was coming to england to receive the down and crown of accomplishments who could tell but what they might even teach her affectation youth is plastic and imitative and she was sure to find plenty of models not that the honest colonel wished to make a sickly humbug of her his own views were wide and grand only too philoprogenitive still like most men of that class who upon sudden reformation love truth so much that they roll upon her having no firm rules of his own and being ashamed to profess anything with the bad life fresh in his memory he took the opinion of old fogies who had been every bit as unblessed as himself but had sown with a drill their wild oats the verdict of all was one miss noel must go to england finding his wound still troublesome he resolved to retire from service he had not saved half a lakh of rupees and his pension would not be a mighty one but between the two there would be enough for an old man to live upon decently and go wherever he was told that his daughter ought to go he had seen enough of life and found that it only meant repentance all that remained of it should be for the pleasure and love of his daughter and he knew that there was a sum in england which must have been long accumulating a sum left on trust for him and his children under a very old settlement he would never touch a farthing of it every farthing should go to eoa bless her dear eyes they had the true light of his own bright eyes of the morning End of chapter 5
six of Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume Two, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Six. Eoa was now sixteen years old, tall and lithe and graceful as the creepers of tropic woodlands. Her face was of the clearest oval a quick concise terse oval such as we find in the eggs of wild birds rather than of tame ones her eyes were of bewildering brightness always flashing always in motion rarely allowing the gazer a chance of guessing what their color was very likely they were of no positive color but a pure dark luster such as a clear swift river has when overhung by palm trees her complexion beautifully soft and even was toned with a delicate eastern tinge like that fawn-colored light which sometimes flushes a cloudless sky before the midsummer sunrise and her warm oriental blood suffused it at the slightest emotion as the leaping sun pervades that sky with a flood of limpid rubies she had never been flattened by education all her qualities and feelings like her beauty were in excess You could see it in the quick rise and fall of her breath in the sudden grace of her movements in the infinite variety of her attitudes and aspects Whatever she thought she said at once yet none ever called her a bold girl her modes of thought were as widely different from those of an English maiden as a wild honeysuckle differs in form habit and scent from a rose she cared for no one's opinion of her any more than the wind cares how a tree swings unless indeed it were one whom she loved and then she would crawl to please him for she loved with all her heart and soul and hated with no less and she always took care in either case to apprise the object of it and yet with all her depth of passion eoa was pure of heart and mind ay as pure as our own amy she soon recovered from her bruises being perfectly healthy and elastic as india rubber nevertheless she would not have been saved from that terrible sea but for the generosity of poor captain roberts and the gallantry of bob garnet now bob was hurt rather seriously and being as we are well aware an uncommonly shy young fellow he was greatly astonished and shocked a little when on the friday morning a beautiful girl very strangely dressed ran to the side of his sofa threw her arms round him and kissed him till he was out of breath and his face was wet with the dew of her tears oh please don't said bob i'm sure i don't deserve it yes you do and i will marry you when i am old enough i don't know what you are like and i don't care two straws directly they told me what you had done only i must have papa's leave kiss me again i like it now where is my darling papa what don't you know haven't they told you oh poor thing at the tone of his voice she leaped back like a bird at the gun flash and stood with her little hands clasped on her head her eyes with their deep light quivering and the whole of her form swinging to and fro from the wild push of sudden terror then she spoke with a hollow depth which frightened bob more than the kissing they told me that he was well gone to his brother somewhere and i thought it wasn't like him to leave me so and tell me the truth or i'll shake you to pieces no don't said bob as she leaped at him i have had shaking enough yes you poor boy and for my sake i am a brute i know tell me the truth if you love me your father is dead but they have found his body do you mean to say that god has been so wicked as to kill my father god knows best said bob he could think of nothing else to say no he doesn't no he doesn't no he never knows anything 
he couldn't have known who he was and how terribly i loved him or he wouldn't have the heart to do it oh you wicked boy oh you wicked boy i will never forgive you for saving me Hiya, hiya, hiya. bob never saw such a thing before and never will again and he won't be much the loser although the sight was magnificent the screams and shrieks of the clearest voice that ever puzzled echo brought up the landlord and landlady and our good friend rufus hutton who had set forth full speed from home on hearing about the aliwal he caught eoa in his arms carried her back to her room and dosed her he gave her some indian specific some powder of a narcotic fungus which he had brought on purpose it stupefied her for nearly three days and even then she awoke into the dreamy state of nirvana that bliss of semi-consciousness like mild annihilation into which the buddha is absorbed and to which all pious buddhists look as their eternal happiness then she opened her delicate tapering arms where you could see the grand muscles moving but never once protruding and she called for her darling father to come finding that he did not come she was satisfied with some trifling answer and then wanted to have bob instead but neither was bob forthcoming on the very day when dr hutton came to look for eoa mr garnet found himself getting better from that wretched low nervous fever into which his fright had thrown him then he asked dr hutton whether there would be any danger in moving robert and finding that there would be none whatever if it were carefully managed he ordered a carriage immediately and with some of his ancient spirit the crown which had the crossbar of its end set up the wrong way as is done by the by on the roof of hampton court chapel and in many other places made public claim to be regarded as a commercial hotel and posting house no rushford folk having yet been known to post anything except a letter at rare intervals and a bill at rarer this claim of the crown had never been challenged and strangers entertained a languid theoretical faith in it but mr brown looked very blue when bull garnet in reviving accents ordered a chaise and pair at the door in half an hour's time a roomy chaise if you please because my son must keep his feet up yes sir yes to be sure sir i quite understand sir it shall be attended to sir then why don't you go and order it to be sure sir i forgot i will speak to mrs brown sir mrs brown being a woman of resource mounted the boy on her donkey the only quadruped she possessed but her wanna to go as the boy said when you knows the right place to prog him in and sent him post haste to lymington whence the required conveyance arrived in about an hour and a half rufus hutton having promised to be at home that evening left dior to sleep off her heavy soporific and followed the carriage on horseback neither did he leave its track where the ringwood road turns off for he had undertaken to tell sir cradock how his niece was getting on he started nearly half an hour after the lymington chaise for polly would never demean herself by trotting behind the posters during that half hour he drank hot brown brandy and water although he could not bear it to ingratiate him with mrs brown for the sake of the poor eoa for mrs brown had no other hot method of crowning the flowing bowl and now while i think of it let me warn all gentle and simple people who deign on this tale of the new forest never to ask for pale brandy within the perambulations how do you think they make it by mixing brown brandy with villainous gin rufus was up to this of course and as he must take something for the good of the house and to get all the kindly colonel of the heavy-browed hostess he took that which he thought would be least for his own evil then leaving mrs brown who of course had taken her own glass at his sole charge and largesse after fifty times oh no sir never oh lord how my brown would be shocked having imbued that good mrs brown who really was not a bad woman which means that she was a good one for women have no medium with a strong aromatic impression that he was a pleasant gentleman 
and no pride not a bit of it in him no more than you nor me might off he trotted at a furious pace smoking two cheroots at once i believe that there was and is for i am happy to say that he still inhales the breeze of life down his cigar and looks browner and redder than ever i believe that in spite of all his troubles in connection with this story which took a great deal out of him there was and is no happier man in our merry england than the worthy rufus hutton and as all happiness is negative and goes without our knowing it and only becomes a positive past for us to look back upon so his went before it came and goes or ere it comes and yet he enjoys it none the less he multiplies it by three for the past and by nine for the future and he never finds it necessary to deduct for the present moment happy man who never thinks beyond salutary average who can accept in perfect faith the traditions of his forebears and yet is shrewd enough to hope that his grandsons will discard at least a portion of them who looks upon the passing life as a thing he need not move in a world which must improve itself and every day is doing it and all the while he sympathizes with his fellow men enjoys a bit of human nature laughs at the cross purposes of native truth and training loves whatever he finds to be true and does his best to foster it is pleased with his after-dinner story and feels universally charitable then smiles at his wife and kisses his children and goes to bed with the firm conviction that they are worth all the rest put together yet this man's happiness is not sound because it is built upon selfishness in nowelhurst village dr hutton met mark stote the gamekeeper who begged him to stop for a moment just to hear a word or two rufus after hearing his news resolved to take the upper road to the hall past mr garnet's house it was not so very far out of his way and perhaps he might be of service there and ah yes dr hutton this last was the real motive though you may not have thought so what a fine opportunity to discover something which plagued him perhaps i ought to say rather the want of which was plaguing him rufus took so kind an interest in his neighbors affairs that anything not thoroughly lucillant in their dealings mode of life or speech or management of their households was to him the subject matter of continual mental scratchings ah how genteel a periphrase worthy of bailey kettledrum how happily we have shown our horror of that english monosyllable beginning with the third vowel which must be according to dr aldrich the correlative of scratch score two and go on after dr hutton he overtook the garnets twain just at their front gate whence the house could not be seen on account of a bank of evergreens the maid came out with her cap flying off and all her mind perturbed rufus hutton checking his mare for the road was very narrow heard the entire dialogue oh sir oh master have you heard of it such a thing to be sure heard of what sarah of course i have heard of the great disaster at rushford no no here sir here the two big trees is down on the house it's a mussy as nanny and me wasn't killed and poor miss pearl have been in hysterics ever since without no dinner there you can hear her screeching now worse than the mangle ever so much mr garnet did not say a word but set off for the house full speed even forgetting that bob wanted help to get from the gate to the doorway rufus hutton jumped down from his mare and called to the driver to come and hold her just for a minute or two no fear of his horses bolting then helping bob to limp along he followed through the shrubbery when they came within full view of the house he was quite amazed at the mischief the two oaks interlocked had fallen upon it and crashing as they did from the height above the breaches they made were hideous they had cloven the house into three ragged pieces from the roof ridge down to the first floor where the solid joists had stopped them it had happened in the afternoon of the second day of the tempest when the heart of the storm was broken but tremendous squalls came now and then from the bright northwest 
mr garnet's own bed was occupied by the tree which he detested pearl had screamed judgment judgment and danced among the ruins so the maid was telling mr garnet as he feared to enter his own door judgment for what asked rufus hutton and mr garnet seemed not to hear him i'm sure i don't know sir answered the maid for none of us done any harm sir unless it was the bottle of pickled onions when master were away and there was very few of them left sir very few i do declare to you and we thought they was on the turn sir and it seemed such a pity to waste them and please sir we've all been working like horses though frightened out of our lives most and we fetched down all the things from your room where the cupboards was broken open for fraid it should come on to rain sir and we taken all our meals standing sir and made up a bed in the meat screen and another upon the dresser and miss pearl what turns she has given us here she comes i do declare dr hutton said bull garnet hastily good-bye i am much obliged to you i shall see you i hope next week good-bye good-bye excuse me but before he could get him out of the way for rufus lingered strangely pearl garnet came into the little hall with her eyes distended fearfully there there it is she cried there it is i tell you no wonder the tree came down upon it no wonder the house was crushed for it and she pointed to the shattered box tilted up endwise among a heap of account books clothes and furniture oh yes you may look at it to be sure you may look at it god would not have it hidden longer i have done my best god knows and my heart knows and my i mean that man there knows is there anything more i can do for you anything more dear father you have done so much for me you know and i will only ask you one little thing put me in his coffin the girl is raving cried mr garnet poor thing it comes from her mother no it comes from her father said pearl going boldly up to him and fixing her large bright eyes upon his do as you like with me i don't care but don't put it on any one else oh father 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 moaning she turned away from him and then sprang into his arms with shrieks he lifted her tenderly and forgot all about his own safety his great tears fell on her wan sick face and his heavy heart throbbed for his daughter only as he felt hers bounding perilously he carried her off to an inner room and left them to their own devices i should like uncommonly said rufus hutton rubbing his chin to know what is in that box indeed i feel it my duty at once to ascertain no you shan't cried bob limping across in front of it i know no more than you do sir but i won't have father's things pried into you are very polite replied the doctor a chip of the old block i perceive but perhaps you will believe me my boy when i tell you that if ever there was a gentleman totally devoid of improper curiosity it is dr rufus hutton sir oh i am so glad said bob because you won't be disappointed then rufus grinned in spite of his wrath but he was not to be baffled so easily he could not push poor bob aside in his present disabled state without being guilty of cowardice so he called in an auxiliary betsy my dear your young mistress wished me just to examine that box be kind enough to bring it to the light here unless it is too heavy for your little hands oh if he had only said miss sarah what a difference it might have made betsy indeed cried sarah who had followed her mistress but being locked out had come back to see the end of it my name sir is nothing so low as that my name is sarah macarnis sir very much at your service and my mother keeps a potato shop the largest business in lyndhurst sir betsy indeed and from a stranger not to say a strange gentleman for fear of making a mistake and as for my hands she thought he had been ironical for her hands were above regulation size my hands are such as please god to make them and honest hands anyhow and doesn't want to interfere with other people's business 
oh what will poor nanny say to think of me sarah macarnes be promiscuous called betsy at this moment when sarah macarnes having recovered breath was starting into another native discourse on pri nomina and rufus was calling upon his resources for some constitutional measure bull garnet came back treading heavily defiant of all that the world could do his quick eyes never glimpsing that way but taking in all the room at once espied the box unmeddled with and bob upon guarding in front of it he was his own man now again what did he care for anybody so long as he had his children dr hutton i thought that you were gone you see i am not said rufus squaring his elbows and looking big for he was a plucky little fellow and what's more i don't mean to go till i know what is in that box 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 cried bull garnet striking his enormous forehead as if to recall something have we a box of yours dr hutton no no that box of yours your daughter told us to examine it and from her manner i believe that i am bound to do so bound to examine one of my boxes bull garnet never looked once that way and rufus took note of the strange avoidance my boxes are full of confidential papers surely sir you have caught my daughter's i mean to say you are laboring under some hallucination there are no papers in that box the contents of it are metal i have seen one article already through the broken cover and shall not forget its shape beware there have been strange things done in this neighborhood if you refuse to allay my suspicions you confirm them the only answer he received was a powerful hand at the back of his neck a sensation of being lifted with no increase of facilities for placid respiration finally a lateral movement of great rapidity through the air and a loud sound as of a bang recovering reason's prerogative he found himself in a dahlia whose blossoms turned into heel balls by the recent frost were flapping round his countenance and whose stake had gone through his waistcoat back and grazed his coxswain dicks or something he knows best what it was as a medical man deeply interested he had also a very unpleasant reminiscence of some such words as these to which he had no responsive power you won't take a hint like a gentleman so take a hit like a blackguard dr rufus hutton was not the man to sit down quietly under an insult of any sort at the moment he felt that brute force was irresistibly in the ascendant and he was wonderfully calm about it he shook himself and smoothed his waistcoat and tried the stretch of his garters then never once looked toward the house never shook his fist nor frowned even he walked off to his darling polly as if nothing at all had happened gave the man a shilling for holding her after looking long for a sixpence then mounted and rode towards nowelhurst hall showing no emotion whatever only polly knew that burning tears of a brave man's sense of ignominy fell upon her glossy shoulder and were fiercely wiped away at the hall he said nothing about it never even mentioned that he had called at garnet's cottage but told sir cradock like a true man of eoa's troubles of her poor forlorn condition and power of heart to feel it he even contrived to interest the bereaved man now so listless in the young life thrown upon his care as if by the breath of heaven we are never so eloquent for another as when our own hearts are moved deeply by the feeling of wrong to ourselves unless indeed we are very small and that subject excludes all others so it came to pass that the grand new carriage was ordered to the door and sir cradock would himself have gone only rufus hutton had left him and the eloquence was oozing the old man therefore turned back on the threshold saying to himself that it would be hardly decent to appear in public yet and mrs o'gayan was sent instead sitting inside and half afraid to breathe for fear of the crystal as for her clothes they were good enough she knew for the lord mayor's coach five and sixpence a yard ma'am leave alone trimming and binding but knowing what she did of herbs she could not answer for the peppermint 
of course they did not intend to fetch poor eoa home yet but biddy had orders to stay there until the young lady was movable biddy took to her at once in her heavy long-drawn sleep with the soft black lashes now and then lifting from the rich brown cheek and if she isn't illigant then said biddy to mrs brown ain't me without a purity i'll come over the blue missus Sazins then if me and pat had only got a child this day belikes ma'am for the matter of that a drop of whiskey disagrees with you biddy feeling strongly moved and burning to drink her new child's health showed a bottle of brown pateen to tell you the truth ma'am said mrs brown i know nothing about them subjects spiritous liquors is a thing as has always been beyond me then i'll clap it away again said biddy and the devil only the wiser i never takes it alone ma'am it would ill become me ma'am replied mrs brown to be churlish in my own house ma'am i have heard of you very often ma'am yes i assure you i have from the people as comes to bathe here as a lady of great experience in diseases of the chest if you recommend any cordial ma'am on the strength of your experience for a female of weak vitality i should take it as a duty ma'am strictly as a duty to my husband and two daughters Ah, right, then i'm your female me vitality goes crossways like till i has a drop of the crater and so they made a night of it and mr brown had some end of chapter six of craddock noel a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 7 Leave we now with story pending Biddy and Eoa, Pearl and even Amy. Thee too, rare bull, and thee, O Rufus, overcast with anger. It is time to track the steps of him whom fortune, blithe at her cruel trade, shall track as far as Gades, Canterbury and wild certes where the moorish billow is for ever heaving will he exclaim with the poet who certainly was a jolly mortal i praise her while she is my guest if she flap her nimble wings i renounce her charities and wrap me in my manhood robe and woo the upright poverty the bride without a dower a very fine sentiment master horace but were you not a little too fond even of sabine and lesbian when the massic juice was beyond your credit to do anything more than feel it as craddock knoll trudged that night towards the brockenhurst station before he got very far from amy and while her tears were still on his cheek he felt a little timid lick a weak offering of sympathy hereby black weena made known to him that she was melted by his misfortunes and saw that the right and most feeling course and the one most pleasing to her dead master was the transfer of her allegiance and the swearing of fealty to the brother to which conclusion the tender mode in which she was being carried conduced perhaps considerably for she was wrapped in clayton's woolly jacket enthroned on craddock's broad right arm and with only her black nose exposed to the moon so she jogged along very comfortably until she had made up her mind and given Craddock the kiss of Sizin. Dear little thing, he cried, for he looked on her now as Amy's keepsake. You shall go with me wherever I go. You are faithful enough to starve with me, but you shall not starve until after me. Then he put her down, for he thought that a little run would do her good, and, in spite of all her misery, Amy had kept her pretty plump, plumper than she herself was, and it became no joke to carry her with a travelling bag etc after the first half mile then weena capered about and barked and came and licked his shoe and offered to carry the coat for him as he would not let her do this she occupied her mind with the rabbits which were out upon the feed largely and were the last she would see for a long while except the fat ostenders when he got to london and took small lodgings at a mrs ducksacre's greengrocer and general fruiterer mortimer street cavendish square i quote from the ladies bags confound it there i am always saying improper things 
en histoire i mean of course her paper bags it was not long before he made two important discoveries valuable rather than gratifying the first of these discoveries was that our university portals are a mere side postern and not the great janua mundi he found his classical scholarship his early fame at oxford his love of elegant literature rather a disadvantage than a recommendation for business prigs sir prigs said a member of an eminent city firm of course i don't mean to be personal but i have always found you oxford men prigs quite unfit for desk work you fancy you know so much you are always discovering mares nests and you won't bear to be spoken to even if you stick to your work which i assure you is quite the exception then you hold yourself aloof with your stupid etiquette from the other young men who are quite as good as you are i assure you the place was too hot to hold us with the last oxford man we took in the counting-house he gave himself such airs the donkey i vowed never to do it again and i never will sir good morning sir gregson show this gentleman the way out gregson did so with a grin for craddock's face proved that the principal had not been altogether wrong is this prejudice or rather perhaps i should say this aversion disappearing nowadays or is it upon the increase at any rate one cause of it is being removed most rapidly for the buckram etiquette of oxford will soon become a tradition we will only hope she may not run too far into the free and easy craddock's other discovery was that fifty pounds is no large capital to commence in life with especially when the owner does not find his start prepared for him fails to prepare it for himself and has never been used to economy he would not apply to any of his father's friends or of the people whom he had known in london to help him in this emergency he would rather starve than do that for he had dropped all name and claim of noel and cut his life in twain at manhood and the parts should never join again only one feeling should be common to the two existences to the happy and the wretched life that one feeling was the love of amy and what now seemed part of it his gratitude to her father john rosedew had given him a letter to a clergyman in london a man of high standing and extensive influence whom john had known at college but the youth had not undertaken to deliver that credential and he never did so it would have kept him to his identity which so far as the world was concerned he wished to change entirely immediately and irrevocably so he called himself noel no longer although the name is common enough in one form or another the knolls of nolhurst however are proud of the double l and think a good deal of the w and craddock noel became charles newman without license of her majesty even before his vain attempts to enter the stronghold of commerce and before he had learned that oxford men are not thought primo virorum he had lifted the latch of literature but the door would not swim back for him the mare magnum to mix metaphors although bars are added to the lucrine the mare magnum of letters was more like his native element and if he once could have gotten barefooted as we must be over the jagged rocks which hedge that sea i believe he might have swum there in one respect he was fortunate the publishers upon whom he called were gentlemen and told him the truth oh poetry exclaimed one and all as their eyes fell upon his manuscript we cannot take it on our own account and if we published it at your expense we should only be robbing you indeed replied craddock in the first surprise is there no chance then of a sale for it none whatever poetry unless it be some one's whose name is well known is a perfect drug in the market in the course of ten or a dozen years by advertising continually by influence among the reviewers by hitting some popular vein or being taken up by some authority you might attain an audience are you ready to encounter all this even if you are we must decline we are sorry to say to have anything to do with it verse eh better have cut your throat more tersely replied an elderly gentleman well known for his rudeness to authors 
however even that last was a friend when compared with some whom it might have been his evil luck to consult they advertised their patent methods of putting a work before the public without any risk to the author etc etc disinterested gentlemen they are to have no profit whatever except from the sale of the work and they know they won't sell five copies however there are not many of this sort in an honourable and most important profession and craddock nowell was lucky enough not to fall in with any of them so he accepted the verdict so unanimously returned and stored away with a heavy heart his laborious little manuscript it was only a translation in verse of the haleutics and a few short original pieces the former at any rate valuable as having been revised by john rosedew there are courts and alleys in the neighbourhood of mortimer street which for misery and poverty dirt and desperation may vie with almost any of the more famous shames of london craddock's own great trouble the sympathy he had met with and the comfort he received from it had begun by this time to soften his heart and render it more sensitive to the distress of others at first it had been far otherwise the feeling of bitter injustice resentment at it and defiance of a blow which seemed to him so unmerited and worse than all his own father's base and low mistrust of him who could have been surprised if these things acting upon a sad lone heart and a bold mind beginning to think for itself had made the owner an infidel and very likely they would have done so when he was removed from john rosedew's influence but for that scene with amy he loved that girl so warmly so devotedly so purely that when he found his love returned in equal quantity and quality it renewed his faith in justice he saw that there is a measure and law even where all appears to be anarchy and anomaly that the hand of god is not stretched forth upon his children wantonly that we cannot gauge his circling survey by the three-inch space between human eyes neither does he rest his balance on his earthly footstool so craddock escaped the deadly harm which almost seems designed to poise that noblest gift of heavens a free and glorious intellect he escaped it through the mercy which gave him true affection and now once more he looked with love upon his fellow men such love as the frigid atheist school shall never form nor educate which truth alone to a great heart might be conclusive against that school the love which few religions except our own inculcate and no other takes for its essence as yet he was too young to know the blind and inhuman selfishness the formality and truckling and the other paltry dishonesties which still exist and try to cheat us under the name of society the cant is going by already every man who dares to think knows that its laws are obsolete because they have not for their basis either of these three truth simplicity charity even that young man was astonished at the manner in which society ignores its broader and only true meaning fellowship among men and renounces all other duties save that of shaking from its shoes its fellow dust he could not look upon the scenes so nigh to him and to each other parted often by nothing more than nine inches of brick or two inches of deal the wealth and the want the feast and the famine the satiety and the ravening the euphemy and the blasphemy though sometimes that last got inside the door blew its nose and was infidelity the prudery and the indecency the whispered lie and the yelled one the sale of maidens by their mothers or of women by themselves though here again the difference was never very perceptible all this impious contrast spread as if for god's approval for the universal father's blessing in the land most chiefly blessed by him which of his sons not cast out for ever could look on it without weeping craddock did something more than weep he went with his little stock of money though he knew it could not do much and he tried to help in little ways though as yet he had no experience he bought meat and clothes and took things out of pawn and tried to make peace where fights were at first he was grossly insulted 
as a meddlesome swell but when he had done two or three good things and done them as a brother should he began to be owned among them in one thing he was right although he had no experience he confined his exertions to a very narrow compass at first he got imposed upon of course he helped the unworthy but after a while he began to know them and even the unworthy some two hundred per cent began to have faint ideas of trying to deserve good luck one man who attempted to pick crad's pocket was knocked down by the biggest thief there i wish i had a heap of money said craddock every day i must keep some for myself i suppose perhaps after all i was wrong in throwing up so hastily my chance of doing good then he remembered that but for his trouble he might never have thought of the good to be done and the good done to him was threefold as much as he could do to others every day he grew less selfish less imperious less exacting every day he saw more clearly the good which is in the worst of us there is a flint of peculiar character i know not the local name of it which is found sometimes in the great chisel bank and away towards line regis it is as hard and sullen and dull a flint with even the outside polish lost from the chafing of the waves a stone as grey and foggy looking as ever deucalion took the trouble to cast away over the left into an empty world yet it has through the heart of it traversing it from pole to pole for its shape is always conical a thread a spindle a siphuncle of the richest golden hue none but those who are used to it can see the head of the golden column can even guess its existence the stone is not hollow it is quite distinct from all pudding stones and conglomerates many such flints poor crad came across and sought in vain for the beauty in them he never tried to split them with a hammer as too many do of our bow and eye guy. but he was too young to see or feel the cord of the golden siphuncle one especially one great fellow was harder and rougher than any flint like the matrix of the concentric jasper confound that fellow said craddock to himself i never shall get at the heart of him if my pluck were up a little more i'd fight him though i know he would lick me he'd be sorry for me afterwards issachar jupp would lick any two men in the court he was a bargee of good intentions at least when he took to the cuddy but his horses had pulled crosswise ever since and the devil knew better than the angel what his nature now was none of your deed scripture reading for me he cried when craddock came near him though the young man had never attempted anything of the sort he knew that the word of god is not bread to a blackguard's empty belly and another thing he knew that he was not of the age and aspect for john bunyan's business moreover jupp was wonderfully jealous of his wife a gentle but grimy woman forty-five years old whom he larruped every day although he might be an infidel he would ensure his wife's fidelity nevertheless he had his pure vein and craddock at last got at it mrs and miss ducksacre were very good-hearted women but like many other women of that fibre whose education has been neglected of a hot and hasty order not that we need suppose the pepper to be neutralized by the refinement only to be absorbed more equably and transfused more generally a little thing came feeling the way into the narrow dingy shop one dark november evening groping along by the sacks of potatoes all of them seconds for the firm did not deal much in ware regents feeling its way along the sacks which towered above its head like bulky snow giants embrowned with thaw and then by the legs of the tatty bin with the great scales hanging above it and then by the heap of lighting wood piled in halfpenny bundles with the ends against the wall and so the little thing emerged between two mighty hills of coal warts and under the frugal gas burner and congratulated itself with a hug of the heart upon safety take care my dear cried mrs ducksacre looking large behind the counter or you'll tumble down the coal trap where the black bogies lives bless my heart if it ain't little lou 
why lou i hardly knew you you ain't looking like yourself a bit child and who sent you out at this time of night what a shame to be sure lou the pride of issachar jupp was rather a pretty little body about three and a half years old going on for four as she loved to say if anybody asked her and her pale but clean face would have been very pretty if her mother would have let her hair alone but it was all combed back and tied tightly behind like the tail of a horse at a fair or as affording a spout to pour the little girl out by she looked up at mrs ducksacre while her fingers played with the coal warts for her hands were hot and this cooled them and then with the instinct of nature she stuck up for her father and mother peace ma'am lou not fray much though her trembling frock belied her all over the throat and the heart of it and father don from home ma'am on a wessetote basingstoke canal and mother dot nobody only lou to do things and she send this cause lou poor throat to be bad ma'am the little child whose throat was tied up with worn flannel from the char bucket with the gray edge still upon it wriggled in and out of her shape and self in the way only children can do and at length drew from some innermost shrine a halfpenny and a farthing and what am i to give you for it lou oh you poor little thing how very hoarse you are lou with a confidence in human nature purely non-londinian had placed her cash upon the altar upon the inside of which so many worship while on the outside so many are sacrificed without circumlocution the counter her eyes were below the rim of it till she stood upon tiptoe with one foot while the other was up in the colwalt roots and then she could see the money and she poked out her little lips at it as if she would fain suck it back again peace ma'am lou's throat so bad mother a going to make a two three haper for tripe three haper for type and haper for agent and fuddy vinions what a splendid stew lou said mrs ducksacre seeming to smell it and so you want a haper of taters and a farthing's worth of onions and you shall have them my dear and as good a three farthing's worth as ever was put up in london where are you going to put them all lou opened her sore throat and pointed down it she had not yet lost her appetite and that child did love tripe so no no i don't mean that lou i know you have a nice room inside though some will be for mother won't it now i mean how are you going to carry it home in lou's pinny replied the child delighted with her success for ever so many people had told her that the duck's acres now were getting so high they would soon leave off making farthings worths and any tradesman who does that is above the sphere of the street child my dear your pinny won't hold them potatoes are so cheap now she had just sworn that they were awfully dear to a person she disliked i am sure you can't carry a haypeth oh mr newman you are so good-natured craddock was just coming in rather glum from another failure i really don't believe you would think you were bemeaning yourself to go home with this poor little atom i should rather hope i would not replied craddock looking grand oh i did not know i beg your pardon i'm sure i would go myself only sally is out and the boy gone home ever so long ago i beg your pardon i'm sure mr newman i thought you were so good-natured mrs ducksacre said craddock you utterly misunderstand me i replied to the form of your sentence perhaps rather than to its meaning what i meant is that i should rather hope i would not think it below me to go home with this little dear if i could suppose it any disgrace to me i should deserve to be kicked by your errand boy all round this shop mrs ducksacre and i am surprised you misunderstood me so why i know this little girl well and her name is louisa jupp tis lou said the little child standing up on tiptoe and spreading out her arms to craddock all the children loved him as the little ones at nolehurst would run after mr rosedew children are even better judges of characters than dogs why you poor little soul said crad as he seated her on his strong right arm with her little cheek to his and she drew a thousand straws of light through her lashes from the gas-jet 
which she had never yet been so close to how hot and dry your lips are i hope you are not taking the sickness he was going to say fever but feared to frighten lou mother frey cried the small girl proud of the importance accruing to her lou dot weaver irish as dot bad weaver and the fool below mother lou det nice things and lay abed if me dot with the weaver put the poor child's things whatever they are in a basket mrs ducksacre how odd her little legs feel and a shilling's worth of grapes if you please in a bag by themselves here's the money for them you know i'll bring back the basket but the bags don't come back do they no sir of course not half a crown a gross for the small ones with the name and a cross handle basket and the cabbage and carrots sir sixpence more for cornopian pattern with a pineapple and grapes and oranges but law sir the cornopian would frighten half our customers the basket pattern pays better for an advertisement than to get them back again even if parties would bring them which i knows well they never would sir then craddock set forth with the child on his arm his coat thrown over his shoulders and the best shillings worth of foreign grapes mrs ducksacre never bought english ones and the best three farthings worth of potatoes and onions that was made that day by any tradesman in any part of london not excluding them low costers as the ducksacre firm expressed it little lou jupp's sore throat proved to be as craddock feared it would be the first symptom of scarlet fever and the young man had the pleasure one of the highest and purest pleasures which any man can have of saving a human life he watched that trembling flame of life and fostered it and sheltered it as if the hopes of a nation hung as the penny a liners love to say of some babe not a whit more valuable upon its feeble flicker he hired another room for her where the air was purer he made the doctor attend to the case which at first that doctor cared little to do he brought her many a trifling comfort in a word he waited upon her so that the old women of the court called him thenceforth nurse newman what you here again you white-livered young sneak cried issachar jupp reeling in at the door just as craddock was coming out take that then and he lifted a great oak bludgeon newly cut from the towing path of the basingstoke canal if craddock had not been as quick as lightning and caught the stick over the bargeman's shoulder there would have been a weeping and wailing and a lifelong woe for amy hush he said don't make such a noise man your child is at the point of death in the room overhead poor crad naturally of a bright complexion but pale from long unhappiness might now have retorted the compliment as to the pallager chorus the bargee turned so pale that he looked like a collier's tablecloth then he planted his heavy stick on the ground else he would have lain flat on the threshold my lou my lou was all he could say oh my lou it's a lie sir i wish it was replied craddock take my arm mr jupp don't be over frightened we hope with all our hearts to save her and to-night we shall know already i think i perceive some change in her breathing though her tongue is like a furnace he spoke with a tone and in a voice which no man ever has described nor shall but which every born man feels to be genuine long ere he can think condemn me for a sanguine year's fall cried jupp with two enormous tears guttering down the coal dust and his great chest heaving and wanting to sob only it didn't know the way condemn my eyes for swearing so and making such a female dog of myself and what the hades am i to do oh my lou my lou if you die i'll go to hades after you excuse me for washing out this speech to regulation weakness perhaps it was entered in white on high as the turn of a life of blackness craddock turned away and trembled who can see a rugged man split to the bottom of his nature and not himself be splintered i don't believe that any can not even the cold iron scoundrels whom modern plays delight in now come up with me mr jupp said crad taking care not to look at him out at this door in at the other poor little soul she has been so good you can't think how good she has been and she has taken her medicine so nicely 
pray god almighty not to condemn me for not condemning myself enough said issachar jupp below his breath as he leaned on craddock's arm it was his form of prayer and it meant more than most of ours do though i may be discarded by turtle dove quill drivers for daring to record it will he ever be worse for uttering it of course it was very shocking but far more so to men than to angels End of chapter 7of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter eight little lou's fever took the turn that night craddock went away of course now her own father was come and the savage bargee would have gone on his knees and crawled in that fashion wherein all fashion crawls down the rough stairs every one of them if the young man would only have let him we are just beginning to scorn the serfdom of one mind to another we begin to desire that no man should without fair argument accept our dicta as equal to his own in wisdom and i fully believe that if fate had thrown us across shakespeare bacon or newton we should now refer to our own reason what they said before admiring it for after all what are we what are our most glorious minds only one spark more of god and yet the servience not of the mind but of the heart to a larger one is a fealty most honourable to the giver and the receiver in a bold independent man such as issachar jupp was this fealty was not to be won by any of that paltry sentiment about birth clanship precedency position appearance etc which is our national method of circumcising the new testament it was only to be won by proof that the other heart was bigger than his prove that once and till death it was granted now the small loo jupp being out of danger and her father grinning like a gridiron with the firelight behind it every day at her bedside the force of circumstances which in good english means the want of money sent craddock knoll once more cats cradling throughout london to answer advertisements his heart rose within him every day as he set out in the morning and in the same relative position fell as he came home every evening do sir do cried issachar jupp who never swore now before craddock except under strongest pressure do come aboard our barge i've almost got the appointment of skipper to the industrious maiden homeside of nine elms as tight a barge as ever was built and the name done in gold letters fact i might say and not tell no secrets i'd be safe to be aboard of her if my loo allow me to go and i don't swear hard at the check-house and perhaps i shall be able to help it after loo so ill and you such a hangel well i don't know replied craddock who could not bear to simulate intense determination i should like a trip into the country if i could earn my wages as agent or whatever it is but suppose the canal is frozen up before our voyage begins jupp oh dean that cried issachar for the idea was too much for him even in craddock's presence i never yet knew a long winter sir after a wonderful stormy autumn and in that conclusion he was right to the best of my experience perhaps because the stormy autumn shows the set of the gulf stream by this time more than a month had passed since craddock and weena arrived in london half his money was spent and he had found no employment he had advertised and answered advertisements till he was tired he had worn out his one pair of boots with walking for he had thought it better to walk as it might be of service to him to know london thoroughly and that knowledge can only be acquired by perpetual walking no man can be said to know london thoroughly who does not know the suburbs also who if suddenly put down at the elephant and castle or at shoreditch church cannot tell exactly whither each of the six fingers points such knowledge very few men possess it requires a genius loci to apply the expression barbarously as well as peculiar calls upon it craddock of course could not attain such knowledge in a month 
indeed he was obliged to ask his way to so well known a part as hammersmith when he had seen an advertisement for a clerk to help in some coal office there with the water quelching in his boots which were worn away to the welting for the sky was like the pulp of an orange and the pavement wanted draining he turned in at a little gate near the temporary terminus of the west london line in a wooden box with a kitchen behind it he found mr clinkers who thought when he saw crad's face that he was come to give a large order and when he saw his boots that he was come to ask to be errand boy clinkers was a familiar jocular red-faced fellow whom his friends were fond of calling not at all a bad sort take a glass mister said he when craddock had stated his purpose won't do you no harm such a day as this and i don't fancy twould me either jenny jenny why bless that gal ever since my poor wife died she's along o' them small coals fellows i'll bet a tanner she is what do you say to it sir will you bet well replied craddock smiling it wouldn't be at all a fair bet sir in the first place i know nothing of miss jenny's propensities and in the second i have no idea what the small coals fellows are the small coals men are the truck drivers and the greengrocers in the by streets who buy the crushings and riddlings by the sack at the wharf or terminus and sell them by the quarter hundred weight weight at a profit of two hundred per cent Craddock might have known this, but the Ducksacre firm was reticent upon some little matters. Mr. Clinkers could not stop to explain, only he said to himself, Pretty fellow to apply for a clerkship in the coal line and not know that. Jenny appeared at last, looking perfectly self possessed. Jenny, you baggage, two tumblers and silver teaspoons in no time, and the little kettle, mind now. I tell you, the little kettle. Can't you understand, Gar? That I may want to shave with the water, but ain't going to have the foot tub. Jenny's broad face, mapped with coal dust, grinned from ear to ear as she looked at her master saucily, a proof almost infallible of a very genial government. She heard that shaving joke every day, and the more she heard it, the more she enjoyed it. So the British public at the theatre or an election appreciates a joke according to the square of the number of the times the joke has been poked at. Hurrah for the slow perception and the blunt knife that opens the oyster Queer gal that said clinkers producing his raw material Uncommon queer gal sir as any you may have met with No doubt of it Replied Craddock and now for the cause of my visit Hang me sir. You don't understand that girl. I say she is the queerest gal that ever lived out of a barge You should see her when she gets along of some of them small coal fellows Blow me if she can't twist a dozen of them round her finger, sir. And her master, too, thought Craddock, unless I am much mistaken. She will be the new Mrs. Clinkers. Jenny heard most of her master's commentary as she went to and fro, and she kept up a constant grin without speech, in the manner of an empty coal scuttle. Ah, sir, grief is a dry thing, a sad dry thing. And clinkers banged down his tumbler till the spoon reeled round the brandy No business if you please now not a word of business till we both be below the fiddle and if it isn't to your liking speak out like a man sir Below the fiddle mr. Clinkers what fiddle I don't at all understand you Very few people does young man very few people indeed scarcely any I may say except Jenny and the cook shop woman and the latter have got encumbrances as quite outweighs the business ain't you ever heard of the fiddle of a teaspoon sir oh very well said craddock tossing off his brandy and water to bring things to a point it was a good thing for him that he got it poor fellow for he was sadly wet and weary law now to see that cried clinkers opening his eyes i'm blowed if you mustn't be a hoxford gent to be sure so i am replied craddock laughing but i should not have thought that you would have known i mean i am surprised that you at this distance should know anything of oxford men tell you about that presently come over again for the fire sir up with your heel tap and have another no thank you mr clinkers you are very kind but i shall not take one drop more then you ain't be there very long that's certain now you've come about this place i know 
though it's a queer one for a hoxford gent gent under a cloud thinks i the moment i claps eyes on you ah i know the aristocracy, sir now what might be your qualifications none whatever except such knowledge as springs from a good education phew whistled mr clinkers and that sound was worth fifty sentences then you conclude said craddock not so greatly downcast for he had got his speech by heart by now that i am not fitted for the post offered in your advertisement knows what they hoxford gents is continued clinkers reflectively come across a lot of them once when i was gay and rattling they ran into my tax cart coming home from ascot about a mile this side of brentford famous good company over a glass when they drops their aristocracy they runs up a tick all over town and leaves a sky dog to pay for it comes home about four in the morning and don't know the latch from the scraper always pays in the end though nearly always pays in the end so a hoxford tradesman told me and interest ten per cent differs in that from the medicals the fast medicals never do pay sir most unjust said craddock rising a most unjust thing mr clinkers you not only judge the present by the past but you reason from the particular to the universal the most fruitful and womanlike of the fallacies it ain't anything about fallacy sir that makes me refuse you cried clinkers who liked this outburst i'll tell you just what it is you hoxford scholars may be very honest but you ain't got the grease for business sorely down at heart and heel craddock plodded away from the yard of the hospitable clinkers who came to the door and looked after him fearing to indulge his liking for that queer young fellow but he had taken crad's address for who knew but something might turn up that man said craddock to himself has a kindly heart and would have helped me if he could he wanted to pay my fare back to town but of course i could not let him it was well worth while to come all this distance and get wet through twice over to come across a kind-hearted man when a fellow is down so i began with applying for grand places what a fool i was places worth a hundred and fifty pounds or two hundred pounds a year no wonder i did not get them and what a lot of boot i have wasted now i am come down to fifty pounds per annum and seventy-five pounds would be a fortune if I had only begun at that mark, I might have got something by this time. Vaulting ambition doth o'erleap itself, and I might have emigrated. Good heavens, I might have emigrated upon the bounty of Uncle John to some land where a man is worth more than the cattle of the field. Only Amy stopped me, only the thought of my Amy. Darling love, the sweetest angel. Stop, I am so unlucky. If I begin to bless her very likely she'll get typhus fever After all what does it matter what sort of life I take to or whether indeed I take the trouble to take to any at all Only for her sake a man who has done what I have lives no more but drags his life Now I'll go in for common labor work of the hands and muscles Many a better man has done it and it will be far wiser for me while my brain is so loose and wandering I wonder I never thought of that isn't it raining though what we used in the happy days to call wood fiddly rain the future Chironax trudged more cheerfully after this decision but he was very sorry to get so soaked for he had his only suit of clothes on he had brought but one suit of his own and all he had brought with the rector's money was six shirts at three shillings sixpence and four pairs of cotton hose so he could not afford to get wet there could be no doubt that he was shabbily dressed no rich game to a hotel tout no tempting fare to a cabman but neither could there be any doubt that he was a pure and noble gentleman that was as clear as in the heyday of finest oxford dandyism only he carried his head quite differently and the tint of his cheeks was gone he used to walk with his broad and well-set head thrown back and slightly inclined to one side now he bore it flagging drooping as if the spring of the neck were gone but still the brave clear eyes met frankly all who cared to look at him the face and gait were a man unhappy but not unmanly 
if at the time sir cradock condemned his only son so cruelly he had looked at him once and read the sorrow so unmistakable in his face the old man might have repented and wept and saved a world of weeping a tear in time saves ninety-nine but who has the sense to yield it soaked and tired out at last he reached his little lodgings quite large enough for him though and found black wena warming the chair the only chair he had to sit on unluckily he did not want to do what a man who cared for himself would have done having no change of raiment in plain english only one pair of trousers he should have gone to bed at once or at any rate have pulled his wet clothes off instead of doing so he sat and sat with the wet things clinging closer to him and the shivers crawling deeper until his last inch of candle was gone and the room was cold as an ice-house for the rain had turned to snow at nightfall and the fire had not been lit wena sat waiting and nodding upwards on the yard and a half of brown drugget which now was her chiefest pelvinar and once or twice she nudged her master and whined about supper and bedtime but cradock only patted her and improved the turn of his sentence he was making one last effort to save from waste and ridicule his tastes and his education a craftsman if he saves self-respect is worthy valuable admirable nearer to the perception of simple truth than some men of high refinement nevertheless it is too certain as i who know them well and not unkindly can testify that there is scarcely one in a dozen labourers even around the metropolis who respects himself and his calling whose fault this is i pretend not for pretence it would be to say probably the guilt is much of a muchness as in all mismanaged matters the material was as good as our own how has it got so vitiated it is as lowering to us as it is to themselves that the enlightened working men of england cannot go out for their holiday cannot come home for their work cannot even speak among their own children and in the good wife's presence without words not of manly strength but of hoggish coarseness in time this must be otherwise but the evil is not cured easily the boy believes it manly to talk as he hears his father talk he rejoices in it the more perhaps because the school forbids it he does not know what the foul words mean and all things strange have the grandest range those words tell powerfully in a story with smaller boys round him upon the green or at the street corner and so he grows up engrimed with them and his own boys follow suit cradock was young and chivalrous and knew not much of these things which his position had kept from him nor in his self-abandonment cared he much about them nevertheless he shrank unconsciously from the lowering of his existence and now he sat up writing writing till his wet clothes made little pools on the floor while he answered twenty advertisements commercial literary promiscuous then he looked at his little roll of postage stamps and with shivering fingers affixed them there were only fifteen and it was too late to get any more that night and he felt that he could not afford to use them now so rashly so he ran out into the slushy streets gambaged with london snow and posted those fifteen of his letters which were the least ambitious by this time he knew that the best chance was of something not over gorgeous wena did not go with him but howled until he came back then he gave the poor little thing with some self-reproach at his tardiness all the rest of his cottage loaf and his haporth of milk which he took with some protestations looking up at him wistfully now and then to see whether he was eating no wena I can't eat tonight bilious from overfeeding perhaps but i've done a good evening's work and we'll be very lucky for breakfast girl and have sixpence worth of cold ham no fear there of making a cannibal of you you innocent little soul he was desperately afraid as most young fellows from the country are of having unclean animals spicily served up by the london allantopoli this terror is the result of the most part of rustic sham knowingness and the british love of stale jokes however beyond all controversy dark are the rites of sepulture of the measly pigs around london 
he crept at last beneath his scanty bedding clean although so patched and threadbare and the iron cross strap shook and rattled with the shudders that went through him Weena, who slept beneath the bed in a nest which she made of the drugget scrap jumped upon the blanket at midnight to know pray what was the matter then she licked his face and tried to warm him in his broken slumbers that day he had taken a virulent cold which struck into his system and harbored there for a fortnight till it broke out in a raging fever the next day Craddock received a letter of doubtful classicality and bearing the Hammersmith postmark Respected sir was sorry after you streaked off yesterday that had not kept you longer You were scarce gone out of the gate as one might say when in comes a gent No end of a knob beats you as one might say in some respects and a head of hair as good Known by the name of hearty hearty with Braham, a squire but friends prefers callin him hearty such being his character and hearty he were with my brandy i do assure you and no mistake this gent say as he want to establish a agency for the sale of first class hettons to the members of the bone tons was i agreeable to supply him so i say certainly by all means if i see my way to my money and then he breaks out in a manner as would frighten some hands about the artlessness of the age the suspiciousness of commercial gents and the confidence between man and man waste of time says i coals is coals now and none of them leaves this yard for nothing better keep that sort of stuff says i for the green young gent from hoxford as was here just now what says he hoxford man after a situation yes i says nice young gent only under a cloud says he i love sir hoxford man hope he has got some money for what i says have you got anything good for him to invest in haven't i he says take a little more brandy old chap my own brandy mind you blow me if he ain't a hearty one well i can't tell you half he said not being a talkative man myself since the time as i lost mrs clinkers only the upshot of it is i think you couldn't do no harm by calling if he write you as he said he would yours to command and hope you didn't get wet robert clinkers jr for poker clinkers and company coal merchants west london terminus hammersmith m b coke supplied in your own sacks on the most moderate terms by the next delivery craddock got another letter far more elegantly written but not half so honest mr hearty wibraham having heard of mr charles newman from a mutual friend mr clinkers of hammersmith presents his compliments to the former gentleman and thinks it might be worth mr newman's while to call upon him mr h w at six o'clock this evening supposing the post to do its duty which it rarely does hearty wibraham number sixty six orea themis buildings notting hill district m b the above is bona fide references will be required but perhaps they may be dispensed with h w well said craddock to weena shivering as he said it for the cold was striking into him you see we are in request my dear not that i have any high opinion of mr hearty wibraham as a gentleman i mean but for all that he may be an honest man and beggars as you know weena dear when you sit up so prettily beggars must not be choosers do you think you could walk so far weena if you could it would do you good my beauty and i'll see that you are not run over weena agreed rather rashly to go for the london stones to a country dog are as bad as a muscle bank to a bather but she thought she might find some woodcocks and so she did at the game shops and some curlews which they sold for them but her real object in going was that she had made some nice acquaintances in the neighborhood whom she wanted to see again she wouldn't speak to any low dog for she meant to keep up the importance and grandeur of the Noel family but there were some dogs hey ho they had some ways with them and they were brushed so nicely what could a poor little country dog do but fall in love with them therefore weena came after her master and made believe not to notice them but she lingered now and then at a scraper and when she snapped her teeth had gloves on when Craddock and his little dog after many a twist and turn found Aurea Themis buildings The master rang at the sprightly door newly grained and varnished 
being inducted by a young woman with a most coquettish cap on he told black wena to wait outside and she lay down upon the doorstep then he was shown into the first floor drawing room according to arrangement and requested to take a seat sir the smart maid who carried a candle lit the gas in a twinkling but Craddock wondered why the coal merchant had no coals in his fireplace Just when he had concluded after a fit of shivering that this defect was due perhaps to the extreme familiarity Which breeds in a grocer contempt for figs Mr. Wibraham came in quite by accident and was evidently amazed to see him What ah no my good sir not mr. Charles Newman a member of the University of Oxford Yes, sir. I am that individual replied Craddock very uncomfortable at the prominent use of his alias then allow me sir to shake hands with you I am strongly prepossessed in your favor young gentleman from the description I received of you from our mutual friend mr. Clinkers ah I like that Clinkers no nonsense about Clinkers sir So I believe said Craddock, but as I have only seen him once it would perhaps be premature of me Not a bit my dear sir not a bit that is one of the mistakes we make I always rely upon first impressions and they never deceive me now I see exactly what you are an upright honorable man full of conscientiousness, but not overburdened here He gave a jocular tap to his forehead which was about half the width of Craddock's Well thought Craddock you are straightforward even to the verge of rudeness but no doubt you mean well and perhaps you are nearer the truth than the people who have told me otherwise Anyhow it does not matter much But in spite of this conclusion he bowed in his stately manner and said if that be the case sir I fear it will hardly suit your purpose to take me into your employment Ah, I have hurt your feelings. I see I am so blunt and hasty Hearty Wibraham is my name and hearty enough. I am God knows and perhaps a little too hearty Hasty Wibraham you ought to be called by Jove you ought said one of my friends last night and by gad I think he was right sir I'm sure I don't know said Craddock. How can I pretend to say without myself being hasty? I Suppose mr. Newman you can command a little capital It is not at all essential you know in a bona fide case like yours That is a good job said Craddock for my capital like the new one of Canada is below contempt to a man imbued mr. Newman with a genuine spirit of commerce no sum however small but may be the key of fortune My key of fortune then is about 20 pounds 10 shillings a Very very small sum my dear sir But I dare say some of your friends would assist you to make it say 50 guineas You Oxford men are so generous always ready to help each other. That is why I can't help liking you so Thoroughly fine fellows he added in a loud aside thoroughly noble fellows when a messmate is in trouble Can't apply to his family. I see but it would be mean in him not to let his friends help him I do believe the highest privilege of human life is to assist a friend in difficulties Craddock of course could not reply to all this because he was not meant to hear it But he gazed with some admiration at the utterer of such exalted sentiments Mr. Harty Wibraham now about 45 years old was rather tall and portly with an aquiline face a dark complexion and a quick decisive manner His clothes were well made and of good quality unpretentious neat substantial His only piece of adornment was a magnificent gold watch chain which rather shunned than courted observation No said Craddock at last I have not a single friend in the world to whom I would think of applying for the loan of a sixpence well, we are independent mr. Wibraham still held discourse with himself But hearty Wibraham likes and respects him the more for that he'll get over his troubles whatever they are My good sir he continued aloud I will not utter any opinion lest you should think me inclined to flatter the last thing in the world I ever would do Nevertheless in all manly candor I am bound to tell you that my prepossession in your favor Induces me to make you a most advantageous offer. I Am much obliged to you pray. What is it a clerkship in my counting house? Which I am just about to open having formed a very snug little connection to begin with oh Cried Craddock for green as he was 
he would rather have had to do with a business already established i see you are surprised no wonder sir no wonder but you must know that i shall have at least my quid pro quo my connection is of a very peculiar character in fact it lies entirely in the very highest circles to meet such customers as mine not only a man of gentlemanly manners is required but a man of birth and education how could i offer such a man less than a hundred and fifty pounds per annum your terms are very liberal very liberal i am sure replied cradock reddening warmly at the appraisement of his qualities i should not be comfortable without telling you frankly that i am worth about half that yearly sum until i mean until i get a little up to business i shall be quite content to begin upon a hundred pounds a year no will you though exclaimed hearty wilbraham flushed with a good heart's enthusiasm you are the finest young fellow i have seen since i was your age myself suppose now we split the difference say a hundred and twenty five pounds and i shall work you pretty hard i can tell you for we do not confine our attention exclusively to the members of the ministry and the house of lords we also deal with the city magnates and take a contract for somerset house and remember one thing you will be in exclusive charge whenever i am away negotiating a man deserves to be paid you know for high responsibility and where will the he hardly knew what to call it the office the counting-house the headquarters be not in any common thoroughfare replied mr wibraham proudly that would never do for a business of such a character what do you think sir of howard crescent park lane not so bad sir is it for the sale of the grimy i really do not know said cradock but it sounds very well when do we open the books monday morning sir at ten o'clock precisely let me see to-day is friday perhaps it would be an accommodation to you to have your salary paid weekly until you draw by the quarter now remember i rely upon you to promote my interest in every way consistent with honour that you may do most fully i shall never forget your kind confidence and your liberality you will have two young gentlemen if not three wholly under your orders also a middle-aged gentleman a sort of sleeping partner will kindly attend pro tem and show you the work expected of you i myself shall be engaged perhaps during the forenoon in promoting the interests of the business in a most important quarter now be true to me newman i take liberties you see keep your subordinates in their place and make them stick to work sir and remember that one ounce of example is worth a pound of precept if you act truly and honestly by me as i know you will you may look forward to a partnership at no distant date but don't be over sanguine my dear boy there is hard work before you and you will not find me shrink from it said cradock throwing his shoulders back but we have not settled yet as to the amount of the premium or deposit whichever it may be thank you to be sure i had quite forgot that incident thirty guineas i think you said was all that would be convenient to you no mr wibraham i said twenty pounds ten shillings ah yes my mistake i knew that there was an odd ten shillings say twenty-five guineas a mere matter of form you know but one which we dare not neglect it is not a premium simply a deposit to be returned at the expiration of the first twelve months will you send it to me by cheque that perhaps would be the more convenient form it will save you from coming again i am sorry to say i cannot for now i have no banker neither can i by any means make it twenty-five guineas i have stated to you the utmost figure of my present census ah quite immaterial i am only sorry for your sake the sum will be invested i shall hold it as your trustee but for the sake of the books merely to look well on the books we must say twenty-five guineas how could i invest twenty pounds ten shillings this appeared reasonable to cradock who knew nothing about investment and after reflecting a minute or two he replied as follows i believe mr wibraham that i might manage to make it twenty guineas you said i think that my salary would be payable weekly to be sure my dear boy to be sure at any rate until further arrangements then i will undertake to pay you the twenty guineas next monday i suppose will do for it oh yes monday will do but stop i shall not be there on that morning and for form's sake it must be paid first let us say saturday evening 
I shall be ready with a stamped receipt. Will you meet me here at six o'clock as you did this evening? Craddock agreed to this, and Mr. Hearty Wibraham shook hands with him most cordially, begging that mutual trust and amity might in no way be lessened by his own unfortunate obligation to observe certain rules and precedents. In the highest spirits possible under such troubles as his were, Crad strode away from Aurea Themis buildings and whistled to Black Wiener, whom two of the most accomplished dog stealers in London had been doing their best to inveigle. Failing of skill, for Wiener was a deal too knowing, they at last attempted violence, putting away their chopped liver and hoof meat and other baits still more savoury, upon which I dare not enlarge. But just as Black George, having listed her bodily by the nape of the neck, was popping her into the sack tail foremost, though her short tail was under her stomach, what did she do but twist round upon him in a way quite unknown to the faculty, and make her upper and lower canines meet through the palm of his hand? It won't do to chronicle what he said. I am too much given to strictest accuracy. Enough that he let her drop in the manner of a red-hot potato, and Blue Bill, who made a grab at her, only got a scar on the wrist. Then she retreated to her step, and fired a royal salute of howls, never ending, ever beginning, until her master came out. Weena, dear, he said, for he always looked on the little thing as an inferior piece of Amy. You are very tired, my darling. The pavement has been too much for you. Sit upon my arm, pretty. We are both going to make our fortunes, and then you shall walk in silk attire and silla hay to spare. Weena nuzzled her nose into its usual place in Craddock's identicity and growled if any other dog took the liberty of looking at him. And so they got home, singing snug little songs to each other upon the way, and they both made noble suppers on the strength of their rising fortunes. End of chapter 8《Craddock Knoll A Tale of the New Forest》Volume 2 by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 9 The following day was Saturday, and the young fellow spent great part of it in learning the rules, the tables, and statistics of the coal trade, so far as they could be ascertained from a sixpenny work which he bought. Not satisfied with this, he went to the Geological Museum in German Street, and pored over the specimens, and laid in a stock of carbonic knowledge that would have astonished Clinkers and Jenny. When the building was closed at four o'clock, he hurried back to Mortimer Street, paid Mrs. Ducksacre for his week's lodgings, and ran off to a pawnbroker's to raise a little money. Without doing this, he would not be able to deposit the twenty guineas. Mr. Gill's shopman knew Craddock well, from his having been there frequently to redeem some trifling articles for the poor people of the court, and felt some good will towards him for his kindness to the little customers. It increased the activity of his trade, for most of the pledges were repledged or ever the week was out, and of course he got the money for issuing another duplicate. "'Hope there's nothing amiss, Mr. Newman,' said the pawnbroker's assistant, sorry to see you come here sir on your own account oh you ought to congratulate me returned craddock with a knowing smile i am going to pay a premium and enter into a good position upon advantageous terms very advantageous i may see seeing how little i know of the coal trade take care sir take care i beg of you people run down our line of business and call it coining tears etc but you may take my word for it there's a deal more roguery in the coal trade or rather in the pretence of it than ever there is in the broking way there can be none in the present case for the simple reason that i am not in any way committed to a partnership neither am i to be at all dependent upon the profits and craddock looked thankful for advice but a deal too wise to want it well, sir, I hope it may be all right, for I am sure you deserve it. But there is a man, not far from here, I think you took some things out for him, by the name of Zaki Jupp. A shrewish sort of fellow, though, a deal too fond of fighting. 
He'll be up to some of the cold tricks I expect he's about in the yard so much and the whippers and heavers are good uns to talk Don't you think it beneath you sir to consult with Zaki Jupp if you have the pleasure of his acquaintance I am proud to say that I have at last replied Craddock smiling grimly But he went on board the industrious maiden at nine elms yesterday morning and may not be back for a month he wanted me to go with him, but I did not see how to be useful and had not given my landlady notice Now if you please I have not a moment to spare The shopman saw that he could not without being really impertinent press his advice any further And although Craddock was so communicative as young men are apt to be especially about their successes He never afforded much temptation to anyone for impertinence and how much upon them little articles was the next question put to Craddock and he did not ask any very high figure for fear of not getting them out again as He set off full speed for Aurea Themis buildings without inviting Wiener It struck him that it would be but common prudence just to look at the place of business So he dashed aside out of Oxford Street at the rate of ten miles an hour for he was very light of foot and made his way to Howard Crescent Whose position he had learned from the map Sure enough there it was when he got to the number indicated and what a noble plate So large indeed that it was absolutely necessary to have it in two parts What a refulgent brass what fine engraving especially on the lower part you might call it chalco illumination chromography chromometallurgy I do not know any word half grand enough to describe it and the legend itself so simple how could they have made so much of it the upper plate though beautifully bright was comparatively plain and only carried the words Wibraham Fuchs and company the lower and far more elaborate part enabled the public to congratulate itself upon having the above as coal merchants and colliery agents to her most gracious majesty and the duchy of Lancaster hours of business from ten till four Craddock just took time to read this by the light of the gas lamp close to it then glanced at the house which looked clean and smart though smaller than what he expected and feeling ashamed of his mean suspiciousness darted away towards notting hill when he arrived at aurea themis buildings he was kept waiting at the door so long that it made him quite uneasy lest hearty wibraham should have forgotten all about his little deposit at last the smart girl opened the door and a short young man whose dress more than whispered that he was not given to compromise his ascetic views Came out with a bounce and clapped a shilling in the hand of the smiling damsel There Polly get a peach colored cap ribbon and wear it in a true knot for my sake I fancy I've done your governor. He's a trifle green isn't he? But in spite of his conversational powers the handmaid dismissed him summarily when she saw Craddock waiting there the gas in the drawing-room was lit this time and a good fire burning and mr Wibraham his spirits absolutely jocular sprang forward to meet Craddock and cried hail old future partner Then he offered him a glass of rare old Madeira and producing a blank receipt form exclaimed whatever you do my young friend Never let it be known in the counting-house that I accepted you with so ridiculous a deposit as a sum of thirty guineas twenty sir Twenty was what you agreed to accept Poor Craddock trembled from head to foot lest even now at the last moment he should be rejected But to his delight his new principal replied then sir twenty be it if in a weak moment I agreed Hearty Wibraham would rather throw up all his connection than allow any man to say of him sir that he had departed from his word His voice trembled slightly and there was a twinkle as of tears in his eyes Crad began to apologize so he could not quite see what harm he had done Dash it my boy not another word. We understand each other. There is your receipt In his confidence hearty Wibraham passed a receipt form now filled up to the aspiring coal merchant Without having seen so much as the color of his money Then Craddock pulled out Amy's purse in which he had put the cash for good luck and paid his footing bravely Sir, I will not thank you said mr. Wibraham as he took the money because the act would not be genuine And I am proudly able to declare that I have never yet done anything even for the sake of the common courtesies of life Which has not been thoroughly genuine 
my boy this paltry twenty guineas is the opening of your mercantile life may that life be prosperous as i am sure you deserve craddock took another glass of madeira as genuine as its owner and after a hearty farewell felt so rapidly on the rise so touched for the first time of many weeks by the dexter wand of fortune that he bought a quarter of an ounce of bird's eye with infusion of latakia grown in the footpath field of mitcham and actually warmed his dear brother's pipe which had not once been incremated since the sacred fire of the Pritanium had languished Weena was overjoyed to see him and she loved the smell of tobacco and had often come sniffing about on the hearth rug or the bit of baize that did for it to know whether it was true that a big man a mastiff of a man they told her had succeeded in abolishing it now seeing the blue curls quivering nicely she jumped upon his lap and although she was rather heavy he thought it would be practiced towards the nursing of amy and possibly amy's children then when he thought of that he grew more happy than fifty emperors fortune may jump on a young fellow's heart with both heels set together but the moment she takes one off up it comes like a bladder too big to go into the football on monday morning at ten o'clock our crad in a state of great excitement appeared before the gorgeous plate and rang the bell thereover it was answered by an office boy with a grin so intensely humorous that it was worth all the guineas that could have been thrust into the great mouth he exhibited mr newman asked the boy with a patronizing air which a little mind would have found offensive to be sure replied craddock i suppose i am expected that you are said the cheeky boy grinning harder than ever the other three gents is waiting sir give you a penny paper for three half pence thank you answered craddock hoping to depress that boy i am not come here young man i trust to waste time in reading the papers oh no oh law no cried the boy as he led the way up tip-top business this is and all of us wears out our marrow bones his royal highness will be here bum by Expect they'll appoint you to receive him cause you would look such a swell with our governor's best boots on Don't you refuse now mind me don't refuse mate if you loves me You want a little whipcord said Craddock and you shall have it to my boy if you come much into my neighborhood There now there now sighed the boy who would have been worth something on the stage I have never been appreciated and I suppose I never shall What's the odds to a jinker? Cockerlocks, there go in and let me mind your beaver Craddock was shown into a room furnished as philosophically as the wash house of Cincinnatus Still it looked like business there was no temptation to sit down even though one had rowing trousers on There were four tall desks of deal uncovered Each had four legs and resembled a naked punch and Judy box Hales the Norfolk giant could not have written at either of them while sitting on any of the stools there Three of these desks were appropriated by three very nice young gentlemen all burning to begin their labors Two of the men were unknown to Craddock, but the third the very short one who had taken a stool to stand upon and Was mending a pen most earnestly him Craddock recognized at once as the disperser of the shilling the sanguine youth of broad views in apparel who had cheated mr. Wibraham so Mr. Fuchs I presume he exclaimed with a leap from the stall and a little run towards Craddock You see we are all ready sir to receive the junior partner hardly know what to be up to I'm sure I cannot tell you answered Crad with a smile I do not belong to the firm as yet although I am promised a partnership at a date not very far distant so am I said the little man staring indeed. I came up from Cambridge principally upon the strength of it The devil you did cried a tall strapping fellow crossing suddenly from his death if you'll hearken me my time comes first The arrangement was shined for Candlemas when the glute of business allows it and a Durham man knows what coals are a Gray man thin is it exclaimed the fourth a flourishing red-haired Irishman Do you think I'd have left me University Trinity College Dublin? Without having it down all black and white By the same token it's myself as is foremost Christmas is the time we boys and the first dividend and St. Patrick's Day Wakely stipend and in the interim 
Divil take me so, but none of you should get before Manus O'Toole. Gentlemen, said Craddock, don't let us be in a hurry. No doubt Mr. Fuchs will be here presently, and then we can settle precedence. I see there is work set out for us, and I suppose we are not all strangers here. Can't answer for the other gentleman, returned the little Cambridge man, but I was never here before, except to see the place on Saturday. And that's just my own predicament, cried the tall man from Hartfield Hall. Chop me up, smile, said the Irishman, when they turned to him as their senior. But the gentleman has the advantage in me. I never was here at all at all, and I hope I never shall be. The four young men gathered round a desk and gazed sadly at one another. At this moment, the office boy, seeing the distance safe, for he had been watching through the keyhole, pushed his head in at the door and shouted, Hi there! young coal merchants don't you sell too much now telegram from the exchange gents grimy is on the rise but excuse me half an hour gents her majesty have commanded my presence to put the royal arms on me who ho i'm off to you molly don't be afraid of my splashing your legs dear well said craddock as the rising young coal merchant seemed to look to him for counsel and stood in silent bewilderment it appears to me that there is something wrong let us hope that it is a mistake only at any rate let us stop and see the matter out i trust that none of you gentlemen have paid a premium as i have i'm sure i don't know said the cantab what the others have done but i was allowed to enter the firm for the sum of eighty guineas a great deal too little considering all the advantages offered the proper sum being a hundred but an abatement was made in my favour Eighty guineas cried the durham man why i was admitted for sixty because i had no more it's me blessed self then as beats you all shouted the son of dublin sure i've made a clear sixty by it for i hadn't no more than forty and i replied craddock with a melancholy air was received for the trifling sum of twenty on account of my being an oxford man why gentlemen said the little cantab let us shake hands all round we represent the four chief universities only scotland being omitted catch a scotchman with salt me friends cried the red hibernian as they went through the ceremony by jasus that infernal old jew would have had to pay the porridge man for the pleasure of his company now let us fall to our work gentlemen crad tried to look hopeful as he said it the books before us may throw some light upon this strange and as it seems very roguish matter i was told to act for our principal during the absence of the sleeping partner to keep you all in your places and make you stick to your work and especially to remember that one ounce of practice is worth a pound of precept i should be most happy sir to obey orders said the little cambridge man bowing only i hold the identical commission ounce of practice and all for your benefit my good sir and that of all the other juniors now that shows a want of variety cried the tall dunelmian for the sole charge of all o' ye is committed to me and me blessed self that got it last night and that means to keep it what time were you there gentlemen at ory thymis buildings it was settled that the irishman had received his commission last for some whisky having been produced he and hearty wibraham had kept it up until twelve o'clock on the saturday night so to his intense delight he was now appointed captain and if i don't drag him from his hole to pay him the sixty guineas i owe him out of your money gentlemen same as my name isn't manner so tall now the first order i give is to have in the boy and wallop him easier said than done mr tall there is no boy to be found anywhere and the only result of a strong demonstration in the passage was a curt note from the landlord gentlemen i understood as i had left my rooms to a respectable party rent payable weekly and week is up this day will take it a favour to reserve two pounds ten per bearer john codger the four university men looked wondrously blank at this Gelludesque per imar cucurit osa tremor well i am blow cried the little cantab getting smaller and with the sky-blue stripes on his trousers quivering there's a cousin of mine a solicitor cried the young north countryman would take up this case for us if we made a joint deposit 
have down the landlord and fight him proposed the emerald islander i don't care a fig for the landlord said craddock who now recalled some shavings of law from the quarter sessions spokes shave he can do nothing at all to us until twelve o'clock and then he can send us about our business and no more harm done we were not parties to the original contract and have nothing to do with the rent now gentlemen there is only one thing i would ask you in return for my lucid legal opinion what is that cried all the rest whatever it is you shall have it that you make over to me viva voce your three-fourths of the brass plate i have taken a strange fancy to it the engraving is so fine you are perfectly welcome to it exclaimed the other three but won't it belong to the landlord not if it is merely screwed on as probably is the case and i have a screwdriver in my knife which very few screws can resist then go and take it by all means before twelve o'clock for afterwards we shall only be trespassers crad put his hat on and went out but returned with the wonderful screwdriver snapped up into his knife handle and the first flush of real british anger yet seen upon his countenance what wonderful beings we are he had lost nearly all his substance and he was vexed most about the brass plate done at every point he said that glorious underplate is gone and only the narrow bar left with the name of the thief upon it which of course would not suit him again oysters all round cried the cambridge man as the landlord cannot distrain us an oyster is a legal esculent i see they teach law at oxford let us at least die jolly and i claim the privilege of standing oysters because i have paid the highest premium and am the most promising partner at any rate the softest fellow gentlemen if you refuse me i claim our captain's decision captain o'toole how is it arathin i order oysters at this gentleman's expense london stout for the waker stomachs and a drop of patine for digestion to them as are weakest of all done said the little cantab if only to rile the landlord and he may distrain the shells call four university men by implication unrespectable parties we may have our action against him gentlemen i am off for the grub and see that i get in again faith then my honey cried the irishman forgetting all university language and if you don't twill be a queer job for the bones of the knuckles of menace o'toole while all four were enjoying their oysters for craddock being a good-natured fellow did not withhold his assistance a sharp rap-tap announced the postman and mr o'toole returned from the door with a large square letter sealed with the coat of arms of the company ship letter and eightpence to pay begorra gentlemen will we take it how is it addressed asked two or three most gentle to the senior clerk or junior partner of the firm of wibraham fuchs and company coal merchants and that's meself if it's nobody then it's you to pay the eight pence cried the durham man do you think then it's me who can't do it answered mr o'toole angrily and then he broke open the letter and read p and o steamer will o the wisp off the start point sunday respected and beloved partners his royal highness the pasha of egypt having resolved to light with gas the interior of the pyramids also to provide hot water bottles for the comfort of his household brigade principally female and to erect extensive gas cooking premises where hot crocodile may always be had has entrusted me with the whole arrangements and the entire supply of coal with no restriction except that the nile shall not be set on fire interested as you are in the success of our noble firm you will thank me instead of blaming me for an apparently unceremonious departure by an extraordinary coincidence mr fuchs has also been summoned peremptorily to constantinople to contract with the sultan for warming the sacks of the ladies who are from time to time deposited in the bosporus therefore gentlemen the entire interest of the london branch is left in your experienced hands be steady i entreat you be diligent be methodical above all things remember that rigid probity and the strictest punctuality in meeting payments are the very soul of business and that an ounce of practice is worth a pound of precept but i have the purest confidence in you i need not appeal to the honour of four university men from my childhood upward i have admired those admirable institutions and the knowledge of life imparted by them 
quid lege sine moribus excuse me it is all the latin i know there is a raw irishman among you rather of the physical order if he is violent expel him every gentleman will be entitled to his own deal desk upon discharge of the bill which he will find made out in his name in the drawer thereof and now farewell i have been prolix in the endeavour to be precise there are no funds in hand for the london branch but our credit is unbounded push our united interests for i trust you to the last farthing i hope to find you with coffers full and commercial honour untainted on the thirty first of february prox believe me gentlemen ever your affectionate partner hearty wibraham d c l p s if none of my partners know the way to enter an order the office boy will instruct the manager of the firm h w consummate scoundrel exclaimed the little cantab with the beard of an oyster in his throat detestable hypocrite cried the representative of durham raw irishman oh then the powers and the punch of the head i never give him i week will be next saturday mr o'toole danced round the room caught up the desks like dolls and dashed all their noses together then he summoned the landlord and pelted him out of the room and up the stairs with oyster shells and books and the whisky bottle and two pewter pots after his legs as he luckily got round the landing place the terrified man and his wife worse frightened locked themselves in and then threw up a window and bawled out for the police Craddock feeling ashamed of the uproar seized O'Toole by the collar and the Durham man being sedate and steady grasped him on the other side So they lifted him off the ground and bore him very even into Hyde Park And there they left him upon a bench and each went his several way The police according to precedent were in time to be too late End of chapter 9ten of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter ten craddock knoll shivered hard partly from his cold and partly at the thought of the bitter life before him he had amy's five and sixpence left an immutable peculium in currency his means were limited to exactly four and ninepence with the accuracy of an upright man even in the smallest matters he had forced upon mr o'toole his two pence the quaternary of that letter also he had insisted upon standing stout when thirst increased with oysters now he took the shillings four having lost all faith in his destiny and put one in each of his waistcoat pockets for he had little horseshoes upwards as well as the straight chinks below this being done he disposed of his ninepence with as tight a view to security all that day he wandered about and regretted issachar jupp towards nightfall he passed a railway terminus miserably lighted a disgrace to any style of architecture teeming with insolence pretence dirt discomfort fuss and confusion let us call it the grand junction wasting and screwing line because among railway companies the name is generally applicable in a window never cleaned since the prorogation of parliament the following notice tried to appear and if you rub the glass you might read it wanted immediately a smart active young man of good education his duties will not be onerous wages one pound per week uniform allowed apply to mr kilquick next door to the booking office craddock read this three times over for his wits were dull now and then he turned round and felt whether all his money was safe yes every blessed half penny for he had eaten nothing since the oysters surely i am an active young man of good education said crad to himself although not very smart perhaps especially as to my boots but a suit all uniform allowed will cure my only deficiency i could live and keep weena comfortably upon a pound a week 
I hope however that they cash up railway companies have no honor I know but I suppose they pay when they can't help it Having meditated with himself thus much he went growing excited on the way for now He was no philosopher to the indicated whereabouts of that lion's factotum mr. Kilquick here he had to wait very nearly an hour mr. Kilquick being engaged as usual in the company's most active department arranging very effectually for a collision down the line Successfully I would have said but though the accident came off quite according to the most sanguine or Sanguinary expectation the result was a slur on that company's fame only three people being killed and five-and-twenty wounded now young man said mr. Kilquick when all his instructions were on the wires. What is your business with me? Craddock having stated his purpose name and qualifications the traffic manager looked at him with interest and reflection Then he said impressively you can jump well I should think I have never yet been beaten Crad answered, but of course there are many who can beat me and run no doubt and your sight is accurate and your nerves very good my nerves are not what they were sir but i can run fast and see well why do you shiver so that will never do and the muscles of his calf are too prominent we lost number six through that it is only a little cold i have caught it will go off in a moment with regular work you have no relation i suppose in any way connected with the law no friends i mean of litigious tendencies oh no i have no friend whatever none i mean in london only one family far in the country to care at all about me no father or mother to make a fuss eh no wife to prevent your attending to business no sir nothing of the sort i am quite alone in the world and my life is of no importance wonderful luck muttered mr kilquick exactly the thing for us and I have been so put out about that place. It has got such a reputation Poor Mooreshead cannot get through the work any longer by himself and the coroner made such nasty remarks If we kill another man there before Easter the times will be sure to get hold of it Young man he continued in a louder tone you are in luck this time. I believe it is a very snug situation only you must look sharp after your legs and be sure you never touch spirits not given to blue ruin i hope oh no i never touch it that's right i was afraid you did you look so down in the mouth you can give us a reference i suppose yes to my landlady mrs ducksacre a most respectable person in trade in mortimer street good replied mr kilquick you mustn't be alarmed by the way by any foolish rumours you may hear as to dangers purely imaginary your predecessor lost his life through the very grossest carelessness you are as safe there as in your bed unless your nerves happen to fail you and when that is the case i should like to know asked the traffic manager indignantly which of us is not in danger even in coming downstairs what will my duties be then asked craddock with some surprise why you are not afraid are you mr kilquick looked at him contemptuously no i should rather hope not replied craddock meeting him eye to eye so that the wholesale smasher quailed at him there is no duty even in a powder mill which i would shrink from now ah terrible things those powder mills a perfect disgrace to this age and country their wanton waste of human life how the legislature lets them go on so is more than i can conceive why they think no more of murdering and maiming a dozen people please sir cried one of the clerks coming down from the telegraph office no end of a collision on the slayham and berry branch three passengers killed and twenty-five wounded some of them exceedingly fatally bless my heart if i didn't expect it told sykes it would be so how's the engine jemmy she's all right sir jumped over three carriages and went ahead her into a sand hill driver cased in glass from vitrification of the sand stoker took the hot water a thing he ain't much accustomed to no what a capital joke hell fire jack i can swear it was him 
preserved in a glass case from the results of his own imprudence i shall be up with you in five minutes james be quite ready to begin now said mr kilquick drawing out his cigar case i have little more to say to you young man except that you can begin at eight o'clock tomorrow morning we will dispense with the references for i have the utmost confidence in you and you will be searched very carefully every time you come out of the gate which you never will be allowed to do except when your spell is over and your mate is in you will go at once to our outfitters and upon presenting this ticket they will fit you up as tightly as possible with your regimentals and see that you don't take boots but the very best shoes for jumping in what they call oxford shoes are best when tied tight over the instep and not too thick in the sole no nails mind for fear of slipping upon the flange good-bye my boy be very careful by the by you say you don't value your life very little indeed said craddock except just for one reason then now you must add another reason you must value it for our sake the company can't have another inquest for at least six months i mean of course by the same coroner confound that fellow he will not take a right view of things at eight o'clock tomorrow morning you will be at the gate of the cram jam goods station the clerk there will have his orders about you he will supply you with a book and map out for you your duties also moorshead your mate an invaluable man will show you the practical part of it now good-bye my lad remember you never wear any except your official dress we allow you two suits in the twelvemonth your duties will be of a refined character and the exercise exhilarating i trust to receive a good report of you and i hope my boy that you are at peace both with god and man even mr kilquick had been touched a little by craddock's air of uncomplaining sorrow and the stamp of high mind and good breeding very foolish of me he muttered as he lit his cigar and went up to telegraph to the slam station master commit yourself to nothing observe the strictest economy and no bonfires of the splinter wood as they had last week very foolish of me he said on the stairs but it goes to my heart to kill that young fellow how i should like to know his history that face does not mean nothing craddock caring very little what his duties might be and feeling the night wind go through his heart hastened to the outfitters and there he was received with a grin by an experienced shopman on the production of his note capital customers sir he said famous customers of ours that grand junction wasting and screwing line and the best of all for the gentlemen in your way of business sir must have new clothes every new hand and they changes pretty often sir provides all the comforts of a home for you and a gentlemanly competence before you've been half a year with them the man grinned still more at his own grim wit while craddock stared at him in wonderment don't you see sir they can't pass the clothes on after the man has been killed even if there's a bit of them left for they must fit you like your skin sir the leastest little wrinkle sir or the ruffle of a hinch or so much as the fray of the hem and there you are sir and they have to look for another active young man sir and active young men are getting shy sir uncommon shy of it now except they come from the country hope you insured your life sir before taking the situation there's no company will accept your life now sir what a nice young man the last were what a nice young man to be sure outrageous fond of filberts till they cracked him and found a shell for him well said craddock whom the busy tailor had been measuring all this while from all that you tell me there would be less imprudence in ordering my coffin than tomorrow's dinner what is there so very dangerous in it well you'll see sir you'll see i would not frighten you for the world because it's all up in the moment if you lose your presence of mind thank you sir all right now except the legs of the tights and that's the most particular part of it all may i trouble you to turn your trousers up it will never do to measure over them we shall put six hands on at once at the job the whole will be ready at eleven this evening you must kindly call and try everything we are ordered to insist upon that 
the next morning crad in a suit of peculiar tough and yet most elastic cord which fitted him as if he had been dipped in it walked in at the open gates of the front yard leading to the cram jam general goods terminus this was the only way in or out except along the metals and as it was got up with heaps of stucco all the porters were very proud of it and called it a slap-up archway stop stop cried a sharp little fellow gurgling up like a fountain from among the sham pilasters what's your business here my man on the premises of the grand junction wasting and screwing company ah i see by your togs just come this way if you please then here let me call a little halt for time enough to explain that the more fashionable of the railway companies have lately agreed that a station yard is a sort of royal park which cannot be kept too private which no doors may rashly open upon a pleasant rural solitude and weed nursery for the neighbourhood and wherein the senior porter has his private mushroom bed they are wise in this seclusion and wholesome is their privacy so long as they discard all principle so long as they are allowed to garrote us while they jabber about public interests perhaps ere very long we shall have a modern daedalus and then the boards of directors so ready to do collectively things which done individually no gentleman would own to may abate a few jots of their arrogance and have faint recollections of honour Craddock, not very deeply impressed by the compo arch, about half the size of the stone one at Nowelhurst Hall's chief entrance, presented himself to the sharp little fellow and told him what he was come for. "'Glad to hear it,' said the gateman. "'Uncommonly glad to hear it. Moreshead is a wonderful fellow. There is not another man in England could have stuck to that work as he has done. He ought to have five pounds a week. That he ought, instead of a single sovereign screwing company that was their common name will be sorry when they have lost him now your duty is to enter in this here book the number of every truck jerry trod or blinkham tarpaulin or covering of every sort also the destination chalked on it and the nature of the goods in the truck so far as you can ascertain them coals iron chalk packing cases boxes crakes crates what not so fast as they comes into the higher end or so fast as they goes out of it you return this book to the check office every time you come off duty you begin work at eight in the morning and you leave at eight in the evening you don't pass here meanwhile and you can't pass up the line hope you have brought some grub you'll have five minutes in the afternoon long enough to get a snack in after the up goods for millstone is off oh you ought to have brought some grub if you faint you will never come to again but perhaps Morthead can spare you a bit he'll be glad to see you that's certain for he ain't slept a wink for a week and such a considerate chap i enter you in and out number taker twenty six that's all right from your cap my lad no room for it on your sleeve might stick out you know and you must pack tighter than any of the goods is undertakers we call you always good-bye sir Moore's head will tell you the rest and I hope to see you all right at 8 p.m. The first day is always the worst go in at that door by the Pickford and ask the first porter you see for Moore's head and take care how you get at him Moore's head was resting for a moment upon a narrow piece of planking amid a regular seven dials of sidings points and turntables Craddock could scarcely see him for trucks and vans and boxes on wheels were gliding past in every direction thick as the carts on london bridge creaking groaning ricketing lurching thumping up against one another and then recoiling with a heavy kick straining upon coupling chains butting against bulkheads staggering and jerking into grooves and out of them crushing flints into a shower of sparks doing anything and everything except standing still for a moment and among them rushed about like dragons ramping and routing and swearing fearfully gargling their throats with a boiling riot and then goring the ground with tusks of steam whisking and flicking their tails and themselves in and out of the countless cross webs screaming and leaping and rattling and booming the great ponderous giant goods engines 
every man was out swearing his neighbor every truck browbeating its fellow every engine out yelling its rival there is nothing on earth to compare with this scene unless it be the jostling and churning of ice packs in davis's straits when the tide runs hard and a gale of wind is blowing and the flows have broken up suddenly and even that comparison fails because though the monsters grind and crash and labor and leap with agony they do not roar and vomit steam and swear at one another at the risk of his life for as yet he knew nothing of the laws that governed their movements a very imperfect code by the by Craddock made his way to the narrow staging where Morshead was taking a breathing time His fellow number taker of course described him coming for he had acquired the art of seeing all around as a spider is falsely supposed to do He knew in a moment by Craddock's dress what business he was meant for and he said to himself thank God in one breath for the sake of his wife and family and oh poor fellow in the next as he saw how green our craddock was then he held up his hands for craddock to stop and waved them for him to run and so piloted him to the narrow knife board where a man's life was his own almost the highest and noblest of physical courage is that which fully perceiving the danger looking into the black pit of death and seeing the night of horrors there undivested of horror by true religion encounters them all treads the narrow cord daily not for the sake of honor or fortune but because of the dash in it and the excitement to a brave soul not even to win the heart's maiden that pearl of romance and mystery but simply to supply the home to keep in flow the springs of love whence the geyser heat is gone to sustain and comfort without being comforted by them the wife whose beauty is passed away and who may have taken to scold and the children whose chief idea of daddy is that he has got a halfpenny this glorious inglorious courage grander than any that ever won medal or cross for destroying had a little home though he knew it not and never thought about it in the broad well-rounded bosom of simple stephen Morshead none but himself knew his narrow escapes an inch the wrong way and he was a dead man fifty times a day and worst of all in the night oh in the horrible night and yet more in the first gleam of morning when the body was worn out and dreams came over the eyes but were death if they passed to the brain and the trucks went by like nightmares that very morning he had felt after taking duty night and day for more than a week since they killed his partner he had felt that his sally must be a widow and his seven children orphans if another night went over him without some relief of sleep that every word of this is true many a poor man would avouch if he only had time and the money to read it and were not afraid but few rich men will care to swallow facts so indigestible stephen morshead was astonished at seeing that his mate was come none of the men in the goods station would have anything to do with it it was very well to be up in the trucks or upon the engines or even to act as switchman for you had a corner inviolable and could only do mischief to others but to run in and out and through and through in that perpetual motion to be bound to jot down every truck the cover and contents of it entering or departing from that crammed and crowded terminus to have nobody to help you therein and nobody to cry dead man if you died and the certainty that if you stood a hair's breadth out of the perpendicular or a single wheel had a bunion you with the notebook in your hand must flood the narrow tween ways and find your way out underneath to heaven all this and the risk of the fearful jumps from one sliding train to another sliding oppositely and jerking perhaps as you jumped and yet if you funk the jump you must be crushed like a frog beneath a turf beater these considerations after many pipes were smoked over them had induced all the porters and stokers to dwell on the virtues of many men killed and to yield to their wives entreaties acquiesce in their sixteen shillings nor aspire to the four shillings charon fare now said morshead shake hands with me 
as Craddock, breathless with running wonder, leaped upon the nine-inch gangway. I see you belongs to a different order of society. Obliged to keep my eyes open, mate, but as long as you and I works together, I ask it as a favour of you to shake hands night and morning. With the greatest pleasure, said Craddock, if you think there's room for our funny bones. Ha ha! laughed Morshead. You are the right sort for it. Not a bit of feared, I see. Now, I mustn't stop to talk. Just follow me and do as I do. I can put you up to it in six hours, and then if you can spare me for the other six, twill be the saving of the little ones. But tell the truth if you're tired. I should scorn myself if harm came to you. You are the bravest man I ever met, said Craddock with his heart rising you cannot expect me to be like you but you shall not find me a coward i can see it by your eyes lad no sparkle but a glowing like i can always tell by the eyes of a man how long he will last at his work now come along o me and i'll show you the nine worst crushing places craddock followed him through the threads threads of clotho and atropos feeling the way with his legs like a gnat who overs the posts of a spider's web in and out with a jump here and there when the two sideboards threatened to shear them they got to the gorge at the entrance where the main turmoil of all was the simple glades were a joke to it and all because the screwing company would not buy land enough to get elbow room there are several lines of railway which do a much larger business there is no other which attempts to do so much upon less than four times the acreage i've tuttled all them as are going out mr morshead informed craddock now you'll see how we enters them as they enters laughing at his own very miserable joke he leaped on the chains of the passing wagons and held up his hand for craddock not to attempt to do the same takes a deal of practice that he cried after he had crossed the train it ain't like a passenger train you know and you must learn when they are standing i need not to have done it now but sometimes i be forced bide where you are no danger unless they comes with the flaps down then he jotted down with surprising quickness all the necessary particulars of the train that was coming in it happened to be an easy one for there were no tarpaulins at all and it was not travelling faster than about four miles an hour some drivers there is said morshead as he rejoined craddock round the tail of the train who really seem to want to kill a fellow they come by at such a pace without having any call for it i believe they think the low fools that we are put as spies upon them and they would rather kill us than not hold your tongue to a man in a truck who was interrupting his lecture don't you know better than to offer me that stuff never touch what they offers you sir they means no harm but you had safer take poison when you be on duty there's not much real danger just here if a fellow is careful because the rails run parallel there is nothing round the curve now i see and only two coming out and both of they be scored it's a rare chance to show you the figures of eight and slide points where the chief danger is show you where poor charlie was killed last week and how he did it poor fellow did he leave any family twelve in all no man comes here unless he be tired of his life or be druv to it by the little ones and what did the company do for them oh behaved most handsome for them allowed em two bob a week for a twelve month to come two pence apiece all round but they only did it to encourage me for fear i should funk off i've seen out three mates now please god i shan't see you out too my lad if you do it shan't be from funk morshead i rather like the danger that's the worst thing of all replied stephen i beg of you not to say that sir a thoroughly brave man almost always has respect for order the bold man which means a coward with jumps in him generally has none it was strange to see how Stephen Morshead, in all that crush and crash and rattle, that swinging and creaking as of the Hellespontic boat bridge, mixed deference with his pity for Craddock. He saw from his face and air and manner that he was bred a gentleman. Shall we ever come, or rather the twentieth generation come, to the time when every man of England, 
but for his own fault shall be bred and trained a gentleman in the true and glorious sense of it Craddock saw the fatal places where the sleepers still were purple where danger ran in converging lines where a man must stand sideways like a duellist and with his arms in like a drill sergeant's and not shrink an inch from the driving wheels where his size was measured as for his coffin and if he stirred he would want nothing more then if a single truck flap were down if an engine rollicked upon the rail if a broad north country truck overreaching happened to be in either train when you were caught between the two your only chance was to cry good god and lie upon your side and straighten all your toes out and yet these were the very places where most of all the number taker was bound to have his stand where alone he could contrive to check two trains at once could they help starting two trains at once poor crad asked himself for he had found no time to ask it before when weary to the last fibre with the work of the day he fell upon his little bed and could hardly notice weena perhaps they could not it was more than he knew only he knew that if they could they were but wanton manslaughterers after a deep sleep all in his clothes he awoke the next morning quite up for his work and Morshead, who had been on duty all night and whose eyes seemed cut out of cardboard only stayed for an hour with him and then feeling that crad was quite up to the day work ran home and snored for ten hours as loud as phlegethon or enceladus the most fearful thing for a new hand was of course the night work and stephen Morshead, delighted to have such a mate at last had begged to leave craddock the day spell at least for the first three weeks for to stephen the moon was as good as the sun and sweet sleep fell like wool when plucked at and hushed the tramping steeds of the day god only for the sake of stephen's eyes on whose accuracy hung the life poise it was absolutely necessary not to dilate the pupils incessantly but craddock never took night work there and the change came about on this wise weena felt that she was wronged by his going away from her every day so early in the morning and not coming home to her again till ever so late at night and then too tired to say a word or perhaps he didn't care to do it like all females of any value unless they are really grand ones and if such there be please to keep them away weena grew jealous desperately she might as well be anybody else's dog and the baker's dog was with his master all day and the butcher's lady dog a nasty ill-bred thing the idea of calling her a lady why even she was allowed though the selfish thing didn't care for it unless there was suet on his apron to jump up at him and taste him all the time he was going for orders and then look even at the ducksacre dog a despicable creature his father might have been a bull terrier or he might have been a pomeranian or a quarter-bred sky or the lord knows who very likely a turnspit and his mother oh the less we say of her the better why that wretched lop-eared split-tailed thing without an eye fit to look out of had airs of his own and what did it mean she would like to know and she who had formed some nice acquaintances dogs that had been presented at court and got eau de cologne every morning and not a blessed runaway upon them why it meant simply this that spot filthy plague spot was allowed to go out with the baskets and made a deal of by his owners and might cock his tail with the best of them while she black weena who had been brought up so differently here her feelings were too much for her and she put down her soft flossy ear upon the drugget scrap and looked at the door despairingly and howled until mrs ducksacre was obliged to come up and comfort her even then she wouldn't eat the dripping from that day she made her mind up she would watch her opportunity what was the good of being endowed with such a nose as she had unless she could smell her master out even through the streets of london what did he wear such outlandish clothes for very likely on purpose to cheat her very likely he was even keeping some other dog at any rate she would know that if it cost her her life to do it 
what good was her life now to her or anybody else hey ho on the following saturday when cradock was gone to his fifth day's work what does weena do when mrs ducksacre came up on purpose to coax and make much of her but most ungratefully give her the slip with a skill worthy of a better purpose than scuttle down the stairs all four legs at once in that sort of a bone slide which domestic dogs acquire miss ducksacre ran out of the shop at the noise for this process is not a silent one but she could only cry oh lord as weena with the full impact of her weight multiplied into her velocity or if that is wrong with the cube of her impetus multiplied into the forty-two stairs bang she came anyhow back foremost against the young ladies nay you there i said lower limbs and deposited her in a bushel of carrots just come from covent garden stop her joe for god's sake stop her miss ducksacre cried to the shop boy as well as she could for the tail of a carrot which had gotten between her teeth blowed if i can miss the boy responded as weena nipped his fingers for him the next moment she was free as the wind and round the corner in no time oh dear oh dear cried polly ducksacre a buxom young lady with fine black eyes whatever will mr newman think of us it will seem so unkind and careless and he does love that dog so polly was beginning to entertain a tender regard for cradock especially since he had shown his proportions in them beautiful buff pantaloons what a greengrocer he would make to be sure so hopright and so lordly like and she'd like to see the man in the garden who would tell her she had eaten sparrow pie with mr newman to hold the basket for her by this time mrs ducksacre was come down the stairs screaming weena at the top of her voice the whole way and out they ran boy and all to search for her while three or four urchins came in without medium of exchange and filled cap mouth and pocket one brat was caught upon their return and tied up for the day in an empty potato sack and exposed behind the counter to universal execration in which position he took such note of manner and custom time and place that it was never safe for the ducksacre firm to dine together afterwards meanwhile that little black weena responsive and responsible to none except her master pursued the even tenor of her way nosing the ground and asking many a question of the lamp-posts as far as the cram-jam terminus at least three miles from mortimer street the sharp little gate clerk animated with railway love of privacy ran out and clapped his hands and shouted ho at weena but she only buttoned her tail down and cut across the compound as for the stone he threw at her she caught it up in her mouth as it rolled and carried it on to her master there was cradock in the thick of it standing on a narrow pile of pig iron one of his cheap fortalices his book was in his hand and he was entering as fast as he could all the needful particulars of a goods train sliding past him creak and squeak and puff and shriek oh what a scene thought weena and the rattle of the ghostly chain and the rushing about and the roaring she lost her presence of mind in a moment she always had been such a nervous dog she tightened her tail convulsively and dropped her ears while her eyes came forth and glancing at the horrors on every side she fled for dear life from the evil to come the faster she fled the more they closed round her she had not espied her master yet she could not find the way back again she was terrified out of all memory and a host of frightful genii more sooty than cocytus and riding hideous monsters were yelling at her on every side clapping black hands and hooting the dog on the derby course when the race rushes round the corner was in a position of glory and safety compared to poor weena's now already the tip of her tail was crushed already one pretty paw was broken for she had bolted in and out through the trains truck bottoms wheels and driving wheels oh you cowards to yell at her with black death grating and grinding upon her soft silky back at last she gave in altogether they had hunted her to her grave who may contend with destiny 
she lay down under a moving coal train and resigned herself to die but first she must ask for sympathy although so unlikely to get it she looked once more at her wounded foot and shivered and sobbed with the agony and then gave vent to one long low cry to ask if no one loved a poor dog there Craddock heard it and started so that it was nearly all up with him too Thoroughly he knew the cry wherein she had wailed for Clayton He flung down his book and dashed to the place and there he saw Weena and she saw him She began to try to limp to him, but he held up his hand to stop her Disabled as she was she was sure to be caught by the wheel Could she stay there and let the train pass her no? At its tail was an empty horse box almost scraping the ground perfectly certain to crush her Crying down down my poor darling he ran down the train which was traveling seven or eight miles an hour Seized the side of a truck and leaped at the risk of his life upon the fender in front of the horse box Then he got astride of the coupling chain and kept his right hand low to the ground to snatch her up ere the crusher came Knowing where she was he caught her by the neck the instant the truck disclosed her and with the strong swing heaved her up into it But he lost his balance in doing it and fell sideways with his head on the other coupling chain Stunned by the blow he lay there only clinging by his right calf to the chain he had sat astride upon The first jerk of either chain the first swing of either carriage and he must be ground to powder Luckily for him and for Amy Morshead was not gone home yet seeing more to do than usual Missing his mate from the proper place he had run up in terror to look for him when a man in a truck who had vainly been shouting to stop the coal trains engine Pointed and screamed to him where and what he was doing Morshead jumped on the heap of pig iron and sideways thence on the board of the truck just passing as dangerous a leap as well could be but luckily that truck was empty He jumped into the truck a shallow one where poor Weena lay quite paralyzed and Stooping over the back with both arms. He got hold of Craddock's collar Then with a mighty effort he jerked him upon the tailboard and lugged him in and bent over him Wounded Weena crawled up and begged to have her poor foot looked at Then obtaining no notice at all she felt that Craddock must be killed and dead just as Clayton had been Upon this conclusion she fetched such a howl though it shook her sore tail to do it that the engine driver actually looked round and the train was stopped Hereupon let me offer a suggestion Everybody now is allowed to do so though nobody ever takes it My suggestion is that no man should be allowed to drive an engine Without having served a 12 months apprenticeship as an omnibus conductor I don't mean to say it would improve his morals probably rather otherwise But it would teach him the habit of looking round it would let him know that there really is more than one quarter of the heavens At present all engine drivers seem afraid of being turned into pillars of salt so they fix themselves like pillars of stone and stare at Chinye's Oma through their square glass spectacles When one of the railway by who are on the whole very good sort of fellows and deserve their Christmas boxes Came home in the cab with Craddock and Weena at the expense of the company which was boasted of next board day When one of them came home with Crad for Morshead had double work again Polly Ducksacre went into strong hysterics and it required two married men and a boy to get her out of the potato bin it was all up with our crad that night the overwork of brain and muscle the presence of mind required all the time when his mind was especially absent the impossibility of thinking out any of his trains of ideas when a train of trucks was upon him the native indignation of a man at knowing that his blood was meant to ebb down a railway sewer and a new broom will sweep him clean all these worries and wraths together cogging into the mill wheel of cares already grinding had made such a mill clack in his head near the left temple where the thump was that he could only roll on his narrow bed at imminent risk of a floor bump 
then the cold long harbouring struck into his heart and reins and he knew not that dr tink came and was learned and diagnostic upon him nor even that polly ducksacre took his feet out of bed and rubbed them until her wrists gave way and then half ashamed of her womanhood sneaked away and cried over weena weena's foot was put into splinters weena's tail was stipticized but no skill could save her master from a furious brain fever End of chapter 10of Craddock Noel a tale of the new forest volume 2 by Richard Doddridge Blackmore this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Lynn Thompson chapter 11 leaving the Sun on his narrow hard pallet to toss and toss and turn and turn and probably get bed sores let us now see how the father was speeding Sir Craddock Noel sat all alone in his little breakfast room soon after the funeral of his brother and before Eoa came to him For the simple hot-hearted girl fell so ill after she heard of her loss and recovered from the narcotic that Biddy O'Gayan Who got on famously with the people at the crown would not hear of her being moved yet and drove dr Hutton all down the stairs with a word of since on the top of him when he claimed his right of attending upon the girl he had known in india that little breakfast room adjoined sir craddock's favorite study and was as pretty a little room as he could have wished to sit in he had made pretence of breakfasting but perhaps he looked forward to lunch time for not more than an ounce of food that he swallowed altogether there he sat nervously trying vainly to bring his mind to bear on the newspaper fine gush of irony serried antithesis placid assumption of the point at issue then logic as terse and tight as the turns of a three-inch screwjack withering indignation at those who won't think exactly as we do the sunrise glow of metaphor the moonlight gleam of simile the sparkling stars of wit and the playful aurora of humor alas all these are like water on a duck's back when the heart won't let the brain go if we cannot appreciate their beauty because our opinions are different how can we hope to do so when we don't care what any opinions are it is all very well very easy to talk about objectivity but a really objective man the creator has never shown us save once and even he rebuked the fig tree to show sympathy with our impatience and i doubt but it is lest we deify the grand incarnations of intellect the Platos and the Aristotles the Bacons and the Shakespeare's that it has pleased the maker of great and small to leave us small tales of the great ones mean anecdotes low traditions lest at any time we should be dazzled and forget that they were but sparkles from the dross which heaven hammers on O vast and soaring intellects was it that your minds flew higher because they had shaken the soul off or was it that your souls grew sullen at the mind's preponderance? Fashion we not ourselves about it, though we pay the consequences. If we have not those great minds in the lump, we have a deal more, taking the average, and we make it go a deal further, having learned the art of economy and the division of labour. Nevertheless, Sir Craddock Noel, being not at all an objective man, lay deep in the pot of despondency, and, even worse than that, hung jerked thereout every now and then by the flesh hook of terror and nervousness how could he go kindly with his writer when his breakfast was not so with him he was expecting bull garnet let alone all his other wearing troubles he never could be comfortable when he expected bull garnet at every step in the passage every bang of a door the proud old gentleman trembled and flushed and was wroth with himself for doing so then hogstaff came in and fussed about and sir craddock was fain to find fault with him how careless you are getting about the letters hogstaff later and later every morning what is the reason that you never now bring me the bag at the proper time it was very strange no doubt of job hogstaff 
for he could not bear to be found fault with and now he saw his way to a little triumph and resolved to make the most of it yes sir cradock to be sure sir cradock how my old head is failing me very neglectful of me never to have brought the bag to-day then he turned round suddenly at the door to which he had been hobbling perhaps you'd look at the date sir cradock of the paper in your hand sir yesterday's paper of course hogstaff what has that to do with it oh nothing sir nothing of course only i thought it might have come in the letter-bag perhaps it never does sir cradock you knows best as you takes it out here old job gave a quiet chuckle and added as if to himself no of course it couldn't have come in the letter-bag this morning or master would never have blowed me up for not bringing him the bag as nobody else got a key to it how stupid of me to be sure how excessively stupid exclaimed sir cradock with a sigh of course i had the bag a full hour ago and there was nothing in it but this paper job i beg your pardon and i hope it's good news you've got there sir cradock and no cases of starvation no one found dead in the streets i hopes or drownded in the serpentine anyhow there's a many births i see and a deal too many children be now such a plenty nobody care about them job you quite forget yourself said his master very grandly but there came a long sigh after it and job was not daunted easily and if i do sir cradock nowell i'd sooner forget myself than my children sir cradock was very angry or was trying to feel that he ought to be so when a heavy tread quite unmistakable and yet not so firm as it used to be shook the minton tiles of the passage that step used to cry to the echoes make way a man of vigour and force is coming now all it said was here i go and am not in the mood to be meddled with come in said sir cradock fidgeting and pretending to be up for an egg as mr garnet gave two thumps on the panel of the door small as the room was job hogstaff managed to be too late to let him in bull garnet first flung his great eyes on the butler he had no idea of fellows skulking their duty old hogstaff who looked upon garnet as no more than an upper servant gazed back with especial obtuseness and waved his napkin cleverly please put that mat straight again mr garnet you kicked it askew as you came in and our master can't abide things set crooked to job's disappointment and wonder bull garnet stepped back very quietly stooped down and replaced the sheepskin hogstaff leave the room this moment shouted sir cradock wrathfully and job hobbled away to brag how he had pulled muster garnet down a peg now garnet take my easy chair will you have a cup of coffee after your early walk no thank you i have breakfasted three hours and a half ago in our position of life we must be up early sir cradock nowell there was something in the tone of that last remark commonplace as it was without the key to it which the hearer disliked particularly i have requested the favour of your attendance here mr garnet that i might have the benefit of your opinion upon a subject which causes me the deepest anxiety at least i mean which interests me deeply ah exclaimed mr garnet he could say ah in such a manner that it held three volumes uncut yes i wish to ask your opinion about my poor son cradock bull garnet said not a word but conveyed to the ceiling his astonishment that the housemaid had left such cobwebs there i feel garnet you cannot sympathize with me you are so especially fortunate in your own domestic circumstances Oh said mr garnet still contemplating the cornice o exclamantis est beautifully observes the eton grammar yes your son is a perfect pattern so gentle and gentlemanly so amiable and poetical i had no idea he was so brave shall i ever see him to thank him for saving the life of my niece he is a fine fellow a noble fellow sir cradock the dearest and the best boy in the whole wide world the old man had long known that the flaw in bull garnet's armour was the thought of his dear boy bob and you cannot fancy garnet that my son whatever he is may also be dear to me i should have said so i must have thought so but for the way you have treated him 
bull garnet knew well enough that he was a hot and hasty man but he seldom had felt that truth more sharply than now when he saw the result of his words nevertheless he faltered not he had made up his mind to deliver its thoughts and he was not the man to care for faces sir cradock nowell i am a violent hot and passionate man i have done many things in my fury which i would give my life to undo but i would rather have them all on my soul than such cold-blooded calm unnatural cruelty as you have shown to your only i mean to your own son i suppose you never cared for him suppose i mean of course you did not he looked at sir cradock nowell with thunder and hail in his eyes the old man could not glance it back neither did he seem to be greatly indignant at it then then i suppose you don't think you don't believe i mean garnet that he did it on purpose mr garnet turned pale as a winding sheet and could not speak for a moment then he looked away from sir cradock's eyes and asked is it possible that you have ever thought so i have tried not answered sir cradock with his wasted bosom heaving god knows that i have struggled against it garnet have pity upon me if you have any of our blood in you tell me the truth what you think i not only think but know that the devil only could have suggested such an idea to you man for the sake of the god that made you and made me as well as your brother and every one of us brethren rather put a pistol to your heart than that damned idea in cold blood in cold blood for the sake of gain a brother to do away with a brother so oh what things have come upon me where is my god and where is yours i am sure i don't know replied the old man gazing round in wonderment as if he expected to see him and the scene had quite unnerved him i suppose he is is somewhere in the usual place mr garnet then that's not in this neighbourhood replied bull garnet heavily he is gone from me from all of us and his curse is on my children poor innocents poor helpless lambs the curse of god is on them he went away to the window and through his tears and among the trees tried to find his cottage roof sir cradock nowell was lost to thought and heard nothing of those woeful words although from the depth of that labouring chest they came like the distant sea roar bull garnet turned with his fierce eyes softened to a woman's fondness and saw with pity as well as joy that his last words had not been heeded ever hot and ever hasty until it comes to my own death he muttered still in recklessness perhaps then i shall be tardy for my son's sake for my bob and pearl i must not make such a child of myself nevertheless i cannot stay here garnet said sir cradock nowell slowly recovering from his stupor a slight cerebral paralysis say nothing of what has passed between us nothing i entreat you and not another word to me now i only understand that you assert emphatically my son cradock's innocence with every fibre of my heart with every tissue of my brain then i love you very much for it although you have done it so rudely don't say that never say it again i can't bear it now sir cradock very well then i won't garnet though i think you might be proud of my gratitude for i never bestow it rashly i am very thankful to you gratitude is an admirable and exceedingly scarce thing i have come to give you notice as well as to answer your summons notice of my intention to quit your service shortly nonsense replied sir cradock gasping nonsense garnet you never mean that that even you would desert me Bull Garnet was touched by the old man's tone the helplessness the misery well he answered i'll try to bear with it for a little longer in spite of the daily agony i owe you everything all i can do i'll get things into the first-rate order and then i hope most truly your son will be back again sir it isn't only the stewardship garnet it isn't only that you are now as one of the family 
and there are so few of us left your daughter pearl i begin to love her as of my own flesh and blood who knows but what if my cradock comes back he may take a liking to her amy rosedew has not behaved well lately any more than her father has do you mean to say that you sir cradock with all your prejudices of birth legitimacy and station would ever sanction supposing it possible any affection of a child of yours for a child of mine to be sure if it were a true one a short time ago i thought very differently but oh what does it matter i am not what i was garnet neither am i thought mr garnet but i might have been if only i could ever have dreamed this god has left me for ever left me why don't you answer me garnet why do you shut your pearl up so let her come to me soon she would do me good and i as you know have a young lady coming who knows little of english society pearl would do her a great deal of good pearl is a thorough specimen of a well-bred english maiden i think i like her better than amy since Amy has been so cold to me to Sir Cradock's intense astonishment Bull Garnet instead of replying rushed straight away out of the room and Not content with that he rushed out of the house as well and strode fiercely away to the nearest trees and was lost to sight among them Well said the old man he always was the oddest fellow I ever did know and I suppose he always will be and yet what a man for business that same forenoon mrs brown's boy and donkey came with a very long message from a lady who had tucked him on the head because he could not make out her meaning he believed her name was mrs jogging and he was to say that miss o r was fit to come home to-day please if they pleased to send the shay for her and they must please to get ready satan's room where the daffodil curtains was because the young woman loved to look at the yeast and to have a good fire burning and please they must send the eel-skin coat and the foot-tub in the shay because the young woman was silly chilly you stupid replied mrs toaster she shall have the foot-warmer and the seal-skin cloak but what satan's room with the daffodil curtains is only the lord in heaven knows and how is she to see any yeast there are you certain that was the message certain ma'am I said it to myself ever so many times more often than I stuck the neddy Sir Cradock Noel upon appeal speedily decided that the satin room was meant the room with the rose-colored curtains and the windows facing the east But the boy stuck out for the daffodil leastways. He was certain it was some flower It was nearly dark when the carriage returned and Sir Cradock came down to the great entrance hall to meet his brother's child he was trembling with anxiety for his nerves were rapidly failing him and from dr hutton's account he feared to see his probable heiress for now he had no heir something very outlandish and savage therefore he was surprised and delighted when a graceful and beautiful girl with high birth and elegance in every movement flung off her cloak and skipped up to him with the lightness of a gazelle and threw her arms round his neck and kissed him oh uncle i shall love you so you are so like my darling you have got his nose exactly and just the same shaped legs oh to think he should ever have left me and she burst into tears then and there before half a dozen servants oh uncle cradock you have got a fine house but i never shall get over it hush my dear come with me my child sir cradock was always wide awake upon the subject of proprieties i am not your child and i won't be your child if you try to stop me like that i must cry when i want to cry and it is so stupid to stop me what a pretty dear you are said sir cradock scarcely knowing what to say but having trust in feminine vanity am i indeed i don't think so at all i was very pretty i know until i began to cry so but now my cheeks are come out and my eyes gone in but oh dear what does it matter and my father never never to take me on his lap again higher 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 face then me darling cried mrs ogain stroking her down in a shampoo manner it's meself as knows how to deal with you leave her to me sir cradock 
She's pure and perfect every bit in her. I knows how to bring her out and she'll come to your room like a lamb now just Get out of the way the lot of you to several officious maidens me honey put your hand on my neck you blissed little love you blissed little dove of a hand and feel how my heart goes pat for you so credit me duty to you but you might have knowed how to get out of the way and leave the ladies to the ladies sir craddock knoll marched away thinking what a blessing it was that he had not had much to do with women then he reproached himself for the thought as he remembered his darling violet the mother of his children but before he had brooded very long in the only room he liked to use now his study just off from the library a gentle knock came to the door as biddy always expressed it and eoa dressed in deepest mourning made at lymington from her own frock while she lay ill at the crown came up to him steadily and kissed him and sat on a stool at his feet oh uncle i am so sorry she said with her glorious hair falling over his knees and her deep eyes looking up at him i am so sorry uncle craddock that i vexed you so just now you did not vex me my pretty i was only vexed for you now remember one thing my darling for i shall love you as my own daughter i have been very harsh and stern where perhaps i had no right to be if i am ever unkind to you my dear if i ever say anything hard only say clayton knoll to me and i will forgive you directly you mean i must forgive you uncle i suppose that's what you mean if you are unkind to me what will you want to forgive me for but i couldn't do it i couldn't say it even if i had done any harm please to remember that i either love or i hate people i know that i shall love you but you must not contradict me i never could endure it and i never will well said sir craddock laughing i will try to remember that my dear though in that respect you differ but little from our english young ladies if you please uncle craddock i must go to-night to see where you have put my father there i won't cry any more because he told me never to vex you and i see that my crying vexes you did you cry yourself uncle craddock when you heard of it first she looked at him as she asked this question with such wild intensity as if her entire opinion of him would hang upon his reply that the old man felt himself almost compelled to tell a corker well my dear i am not ashamed to confess ashamed to confess indeed i should rather hope not but you ought to be ashamed i know if you hadn't cried uncle crad but now i shall love you very much now i know you did cry and how much you have got a year and how much have you got a year uncle crad how much what my dear what beautiful eyes you have eoa finer than any of the knolls yes i know but that won't do uncle crad you don't want to answer my question what i want to know is a very simple thing how much money have you got a year you must have a good deal i know because everybody said so and because this is such a great place as big as the palaces in calcutta really eo it is not usual for young people especially young ladies to ask such very point-blank questions oh i did not know that and i can't see any harm in it i know the english girls at calcutta used to think of nothing else but i am not a bit like them it isn't that i care for the money a quarter so much as tamarinds but i have a particular reason and i'll find out in spite of you just you see if i don't now a very particular reason eo for inquiring into my income why what reason can you have is it usual for old people especially old gentlemen to ask such very point-blank questions sir craddock would have been very angry with any other person in the world for such a piece of impertinence but eoa gave such a smile of triumph at having caught him in his own net as she thought and looked so exquisite in her beauty as she rose and the firelight flashed on her then she tossed her black hair over her shoulders and gave him such a kiss with all the spices of india in it that the old man was at her mercy quite and she could do exactly what she liked with him oh mrs noel corklemore so proud of having obtained at last an invitation to nowelhurst so confident that once let in you can wedge out all before you like alexander's phalanx call a halt 
and shape your wiles and look to belt and buckler have every lance fresh set and burnished every sword like a razor for verily the fight is hard when art does battle with nature End of chapter 11to 12 of Craddock Knoll a tale of the new forest volume 2 by Richard Doddridge Blackmore this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Lynn Thompson chapter 12 previous to the matters chronicled in the preceding chapter mr. Garnet had received a note of which the following is a copy sir my friend major Blazeater late of the honorable east india company's fifty ninth regiment of native infantry has kindly consented to see you on my behalf to request a reference to any gentleman whom you may be pleased to name for the purpose of concerting measures for affording me that satisfaction which as a man and a gentleman i am entitled to expect for your cowardly and most ruffianly violence on the twenty eighth ultimo I beg you to accept my sincere apologies for the delay which has occurred and my assurance that it has been the result of circumstances entirely beyond my own control I have the honor to be sir your most obedient servant Rufus Hutton Geopharmacy Lodge November 1st 1859 The circumstances beyond the fiery little doctor's control were that he could not find anyone who would undertake to carry his message when bull garnet read the letter handed to him with three great bows of the chinese pattern by the pompous major blazeater his face flushed to a deep amethyst tinge which subsided to the color of cork then he rolled his great eyes and placed one strong finger across the deep channels of his forehead and said let me think sir Hooray said the major to himself now we shall have something to redeem the honor of the age It is a disgrace for a fellow to live in a country where he can never get satisfaction Although he gets plenty of insult Major Blazeater, you will make allowances for me resumed mr. Garnet But I have never had much opportunity of becoming acquainted with the laws the code perhaps I should say which govern the honorable practice of dueling at the present day no matter my dear sir no matter at all i assure you your second when i have the honor of meeting him will settle all those little points which are beside the general issue we shall settle them together sir with the strictest regard to punctilio and to your entire satisfaction capital fellow pursued the major in his own reflection room knew he couldn't be a coward just look at his forehead no doubt he was perfectly justified in kicking out rue hutton rue is such an impudent beggar ha ah, referring to his pocket-book to find his military friend's address now we shall do it in style glorious fellow this garnet shall have the very best powder wish i was on his side and the major rubbed his long brown hands upon his lanky knees will it be according to rule asked mr garnet looking steadily what an eye for a pistol said the major to himself quite according to rule and order if i write down for you major blazeater the name of the friend to whom i refer also the time and place at which he will be ready to discuss this little matter with you to be sure to be sure my dear sir nothing could be better your conduct mr garnet does you the very highest honor nothing you think can be objected to my course in this nothing against the high chivalric code of modern duelling no my dear sir nothing at all please to hand me the assignation ha ha it is so pleasant i mean the rendezvous mr garnet handed to him a card whereon was written town hall lymington wednesday november second before admirable real colonel fail and c durant esquire application will be made at twelve o'clock for a warrant against rufus hutton and major blazeater christian name unknown for conspiring together to procure one bull garnet to fight a duel against the peace of her majesty and the spirit of the age major blazeater fell back in his chair 
and all his blood ran to his head as he told his daughter afterwards he had never had such a turn in his life the fairest prospect blasted the sunrise of murder quenched what good was it to live in a world where people won't shoot one another bull garnet bent his large eyes upon him and the major could not answer them now major blazeater said mr garnet i shall bind you over to keep the peace and your principal as well and expose you to the ridicule of every sensible man in england unless i receive by tomorrow morning's post at ten fifteen a m an apology for this piece of infantile bravado what a man does in hot passion god knows and god will forgive him for if he truly strive to amend it at least at least i hope so here mr garnet turned away and looked out of the window and perhaps it was the view of bob that made his eyes so glistening but sir he resumed while the major was wondering where on earth he should find any sureties for keeping her majesty's peace which he could not keep with his wife sir i look at things of this sort from a point of view diametrically opposite to yours perhaps you have the breadth to admit that my view may be right and yours may be wrong nothing nothing at all sir will i admit to a man who actually appoints the magistrates the custodians of his honour honour sir as we now regard it is nothing more than fool's varnish justice sir and truth are things we can feel and decide about honour is the feminine of them and therefore apt to confuse a man major blazeater the only honour i have is to wish you good morning hang it all said the major to himself as he was shown out honourably i have put my foot in it this time and won't mrs blazeater give it to me that woman finds out everything this is now the third time i've tried to get up a snug little meeting and the fates are all against me dash it now if i've got to pay costs old bodicea blazeater you won't mend my gloves for a fortnight major blazeater wore very tight doeskin gloves and was always wearing them out hence his appeal to the female penates took this constricted form the household god of the phoenicians and the one whose image they affixed to the bows of their galleys hoping to steer homewards was as we know from many sources nothing but a lamb a very rude figure certainly square thick-set inelegant but i doubt not that some grand home truth clung to their agna dea major blazeater was a lamb whose wits only went to the shearing the moment you got him upon his own hearth and bodicea bleated at him he would crumple his neck up and draw back his head and look pleadingly at any one as a house lamb does on good friday and feel that his father had done it before him and he too must suffer for sheepishness meditating sadly thus he heard a great voice coming after him down the gravel walk and turning round was once more under mr garnet's eyes one more word with you if you please sir it will be necessary that you two warlike gentlemen should appoint a legal second mine will be mr brockwood who will be prepared to show that your principal was grossly inquisitive and impertinent before i removed him from my premises oh cried the major delightful to find any loophole for escape that puts a new aspect upon the matter if he gave you provocation sir he gave me as strong provocation as one man can well give another by prying into my domestic affairs in the presence of my son and daughter and even tampering with my servants he left me no other course except to remove him from my house which you did rather summarily my dear sir i should have done the same had i been aware of the facts i would have declined to bear his cartel you shall receive my apology by tomorrow morning's post i trust this unwise proceeding may may not proceed any further your behaviour sir does you credit and requires no vindication at law thus spoke major blazeater bowing and smiling elaborately under a combination of terrors the law public ridicule expenses worst of all mrs blazeater the next morning mr garnet received from him a letter not only apologetic but highly eulogistic 
at which bull garnet smiled grimly as he tossed it into the fire by the same post came a letter from rufus to the following effect sir i regret to find that your courage consists of mere brute force and power i regard you as no longer worthy of the notice of a gentleman the cowardly advantage you took of your superior animal strength and your still more cowardly refusal to redress the brutal outrage as is the manner of gentlemen stamp you as no more than a navvy of low mechanical brutishness do not think that because i cannot meet you physically and you will not meet me fairly you are beyond my reach i will have you yet bull garnet and i know how to do it your last ferocious outrage has set me thinking and i see things which i must have been blind not to see before i shall see you some day in the felon's dock an object of scorn to the lowest of the low so sure as my name is rufus hutton p s i shall be at lymington to-morrow ready to meet you if you dare initiate the inquiry mr garnet did not burn this letter but twice read it through very carefully and then stowed it away securely who could tell but it might be useful as a proof of animus during these several operations his eyes had not much of triumph in them rufus hutton rode to lymington carrying a life preserver he appeared in the town hall at the petty sessions but there was no charge made against him being a pugnacious little fellow and no lover of a peaceful issue he had a great mind then to apply for a warrant against garnet for assaulting him but he felt that he had given some provocation and could not at present justify it and he had in the background larger measures which might be foiled by precipitancy so that lively broil being unfought out and unforgiven at least on one side passed into as rank a feud as ever the sun went down upon not that mr garnet felt much bitterness about it only he knew that he must guard against a powerful enemy amy had told her father long ago what craddock had said to her in the churchyard and how she had replied to him in fact she could not keep it to herself until she went to bed that night but mingled her bright flowing hair with his gray locks while her heart was still pitter-patting and leaned on his shoulder for comfort and didn't cry much before she got it my own dearest life of my life cried john forgetting both greek and latin but remembering how he loved her mother my own and only child now you do look so like your mother darling may the god who has made you my blessing bless your dear heart in this the very next day john rose you fell into a pit of meditation he forgot all about pelethronian lapiths the trimming of gruta's lamp which had long engaged him for he knew the flame of learning there unsnuffed by any smell fungus even the sabellian elements were but as a sabellicus sus to him it was one of his peculiarities that he never became so deeply abstracted as when he had to take in hand any practical question he could take in hand any glorious thesis such as the traces still existing of a middle voice in latin or the indications of very early civilization in euboa and the question whether the ionians came not mainly westward any of these things he could think of dwell upon and eat his dinner without knowing salt from mustard but he could not make a treatise of amy nor could he get at her etymology he began to think that his education had been neglected in some points and then he thought about socrates and his symposiastic drolleries and most philosophic reply when impeached of xanthippic weakness nevertheless he could not make up his mind upon one point whether or not it was his duty to go and inform sir cradock nowell of his son's attachment if the ancient friend had been as of old or had only changed towards john rosedew continuing true all the while to his son the parson would have felt no doubt as to how his duty lay and the more straightforward and honest course was ever the first to open upon him but when he remembered how sadly bitter the father already was to the son how he had even dared in his wrath to charge him with wilful fratricide how he had wandered far and wide from the sanity of affection 
and was indeed no longer worthy to be called a father john rosedew felt himself absolved from all parental communication then how was it as to expediency why just at present this knowledge would be the very thing to set sir cradock yet more against the outcast for in the days of old confidence and friendly interfusion he had often expressed to john this hope that clayton might love amy and now he would at once conclude that cradock had been throughout the rival of his darling and perhaps an unsuccessful one till the other was got rid of therefore john rosedew resolved at last to hold his peace in the matter to which conclusion aunt doxy's advice and amy's entreaties contributed but these two ladies although unanimous in their rapid conclusion based it upon premises as different as could be inform him indeed cried miss eudoxia swelling grandly and twitching her shawl upon the slope of her shoulders of which by the by she was very proud she had heard it showed high breeding inform him brother john as if his son had disgraced him by meditating an alliance with the great granddaughter of the earl of driddledrum and dromore upon such occasions as i have always understood though perhaps i know nothing about it and you understand it better john it is the gentleman's place to secure the acquiescence of his family acquiescence indeed what has our family ever thought of a baronetcy there is better blood in amy rosedew brian o'lynn and codwaller than any cradock noel ever had or ever will have unless it is her son inform him indeed as if our amy was nobody pa don't speak of it said amy until dear cradock wishes it we have no right to add to his dreadfully bad luck and he is the proper judge he is sure to do what is right and after all that he has been through oh don't treat him like a baby father end of chapter 12of cradock noel a tale of the new forest volume two by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter thirteen mrs noel corklemore by this time was well established at the hall and did not mean in her kind rich heart to quit the place prematurely Almost every day, however, she made some feint of departure, which rendered every one more alive to the value of her presence. How could her dear Noel exist without her? She felt quite sure he would come that day, yes, that very day, to fetch her, in their little simple carriage, that did shake her poor back so dreadfully. Back thrown into prominence here, being an uncommonly pretty one but oh how thankful she ought to be for having a carriage at all and so many poor things quite as good quite as refined and delicate could scarcely afford a perambulator but she hoped for dear sir cradock's sake and that sweet simple-minded eoa who really did require some little cultivation that now she understood them both and could do her little of ministering mr corklemore would let her stay if it were only two days longer and then her floor her sweet little floor an angel of light among them georgie had been married twice and she was just the sort of woman who would have been married a dozen times if a dozen save one of husbands were so unfortunate as to leave her her first lord or rather vassal had been the count de vance a beggarly upstart frenchman in the language of his successor who by the by had never seen but heard of him too often but according to better authority a man one could truly look up to so warm-hearted so agreeable and never for a moment tired dear of his poor little simple wife perhaps it is needless to state that mr corklemore long had been so scientifically henpecked that he loved the operation only he was half afraid to say haw when his wife was there to say pshaw sir cradock nowell of course had seen a good deal of what is called the world but his knowledge of women was only enough to teach him the extent of that subject he never was surprised much at anything they did but he could not pretend to tell the reason of their doing it 
even when they had any of which he did not often suspect them he believed that they would have had their way whenever they could wherever and by whatever means that very few of them meant what they said and none of them knew what they meant that the primal elements in the entire body feminine were jealousy impulsiveness vanity and contrariety georgie corklemore soon found out that he had adopted this the popular male opinion and she did not once attempt to remove it knowing as she did that nothing could be more favourable to her purposes so she took up the part which suited her as well as any and enabled her to say many things which else would have given offence the part of the soft impulsive warm-hearted foolish woman who is apt among men to become a great pet if she happens to be good-looking eoa would gladly have yielded her prerogatives to georgie but mrs corklemore was too wide awake to accept any one of them no darling she replied for your own sake i will not it is true that uncle cradock wishes it and so no doubt do you but you are bound to acquire all this social knowledge of which you have now so little and how can you do so except by instruction and practice oh cried eo firing up if uncle cradock wishes it i am sure i'll leave it to you and not be laughed at any longer i'll go to him at once and tell him so and as for being bound i won't be bound to learn any nonsense i don't like my papa was as wise as any of you and a great deal better and he never made such a fuss about rubbish as you do here stop sweet child stop a moment i am not a sweet child and i won't stop and another thing i'll tell you i had made up my mind to do it before this mind before you tried to turn me out of my place and it's this you may call me what you like but i don't mean to call you cousin georgie any longer in the first place i don't like you and never shall as long as i live for i never half believe you and in the next place you are no cousin of mine and social usage or whatever it is you are always bothering me about may require me to tell some stories but not that one i should fancy or at any rate i won't do it very well replied mrs corklemore looking up from the softest of fancy work with the very sweetest of smiles then i shall be obliged in self-defence to address you as miss nowell to be sure why shouldn't you well it can be shown perhaps that you are entitled to the name only at first it will seem absurd when applied to a baby like you a baby like me indeed this was eoa's sore point and georgie who delighted in making her outrageous was always harping upon it mrs corklemore how dare you call me at my age a baby eoa looked down at georgie with great eyes flashing fire and her clear bright forehead wrinkling and her light form poised like an antelope's on the edge of a cliff mrs corklemore not thinking it worth while to look up at her carelessly threw back a curl and went on with her rug work because you are a baby and nothing more eoa in a moment she was tossed through the air and sitting on eoa's head low satin chair and all she had not time to shriek so rapid was her elation little floor running in at the moment clapped her hands and shouted oh ma have a yide a nice yide same as me yesterday me next me next oh ah eoa with the greatest ease her figure as straight as a poplar tree bore the curule chair and its occupant to the end of the room and there deposited them carefully on a semi-grand piano that's how we nurse the babies in india she cried with a smile of sweet temper but it takes a big baby to do it and some practice i can tell you now i'll not let you down mrs corklemore and if visitors come in what will they think of our social usages down you don't come till you have promised solemnly never to call me a baby again my dear began georgie trying hard not to look ridiculous though the position was so unfavourable my dear child no not my dear child even miss nowell if you please and nothing else miss nowell if you will only lift me down 
oh it is polished so nastily i am slipping off already i will promise solemnly to call you only what you like all the rest of my life eoa lifted her off in an instant but mind i will be even with you cried georgie through her terror when safe on the floor once more i don't care that for you answered eoa snapping her fingers like a copper cap only i will have proper respect shown to me by people i particularly dislike people i love may call me what or do with me what they please my father was just the same and i don't want to be any better than he was and i don't believe god wants it he must be easily contented then georgie with all her deliciousness could never pass a chance of sarcasm now i'll go and have it out with uncle cradock about having you for my ayah mrs corklemore trembled far more at those words than at finding herself on the piano this strange girl whom she had so despised was baffling all her tactics and with no other sword and shield but those of truth and candour i've been a fool said georgie to herself for about the first time in her life i have strangely underrated this girl and shall have to work hard now to get round her but it must be done come though i have been so rash i have two to one in my favour now i see the way to handle it but she must not tell the old noodle that will never do i thought miss nowell she continued aloud that it would not be considered honourable even among east indians to repeat to a third person what was said familiarly and in confidence of course not what makes you speak of it do you mean to say i would do such a thing no i am sure you would not knowingly but if you think for a moment you will see that what i said just now especially as to sir craddock's opinions was told to you in pure confidence and meant to go no further oh answered eoa then please not to tell me anything in pure confidence again because i cannot keep secrets and you have no right to load me with them without ever asking my leave even but i'll try not to let it out unless you provoke me before him with this half promise georgie was obliged to be content she knew well enough that if eoa brought the question before her uncle the truth would come out that sir craddock had never dreamed for a moment of substituting georgie the daughter of his cousin for eoa the only daughter of his only brother clayton he knew of course that the eastern maiden had no artificial polish but he saw that she had an inborn truth a delicacy of feeling and a native sympathy which wanted only experience to be better than any polish from that day forth mrs corklemore aided perhaps by physical terror formed a higher estimate of eoa's powers so she changed her tactics altogether and employed her daughter that sharp little flaw to cover the next advance flaw was a little beauty so far as anything artificial can be really beautiful dressed as she was in the height of french fashion and herself nine-tenths of a frenchwoman for there was no such thing as a french girl as we englishmen understand girlhood she always looked like a butterfly just born in and about to pop out of a bower for little flor was divinely beautiful this angel was now nearly four years old and would look at you with the loveliest eyes that ever appealed from the cradle to heaven and throw her exaggerated little figure back and tell you the biggest lie that an angel ever wiped her mouth with oh you lovely child i would rather have lou jupp who knows a number of bad words which you would faint to hear of but lou won't tell a lie her father beat her out of it the very first time she tried End of chapter 13of Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume 2, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 14 Dear Uncle Craddock, said Georgie next day, for she had obtained permission long ago to address her father's cousin so, what a very sweet girl Arioa is. 
I'm very glad that you think so Georgie. She reminds me very often of what my brother was at her age. Oh I do love her so she has so much variety and she does seem so straightforward Not only seems but is so Georgie at times indeed a little too much of it Well, I doubt if there can be too much of it cried Georgie in the rapture of her own heart's truth and simplicity Especially among relations uncle just see now how all the misunderstandings which arose between ourselves for instance might have been saved by a little straightforward explanation in my opinion our eoa would be absolutely perfect if we could only put a little polish a little finish upon her i suppose that was what her poor father intended in bringing her to england ah perhaps it was i never thought of that but i have thought often enough my dear georgie of my own duty towards her and i wish to consult you about it you are so discreet and sensible yes replied mrs corklemore with a facetious curtsey to be sure i am a perfect queen of sheba as this implied by the manner of it that sir cradock was a perfect solomon he accepted the chaff very graciously and said to himself what magnificent eyes my niece georgie has and what a sweet complexion and a most exquisite figure i wonder what corklemore is about in leaving her here so long but then he has such confidence in her women of sense and liveliness who have an answer for everybody are so much more trustworthy than the sly things who drop their eyes and think all sorts of evil meanwhile georgie saw all this passing through his mind more clearly perhaps than she would have seen it if it had been passing through her own to be sure how thoughtful of you you mean your duty uncle cradock as to making her your heiress now mrs corklemore knew well enough that he meant nothing of the sort but the opportunity for the suggestion was too fine to be lost oh said sir cradock with a grim smile you consider that my duty do you no it was not on that subject i was anxious for your opinion but as to sending the child to school or taking some other means to finish her education she won't go replied mrs corklemore seeing some chance of a quarrel here of course it would be the best thing for her but i am quite certain the sweet creature never will go the sweet creature must if i make her to be sure uncle cradock but i don't believe you can has she not favoured you with her intentions as to settling in life rather well perhaps rather prematurely yes replied the old man laughing she has informed me with all due ceremony of her intention to marry bob garnet the moment she is out of mourning for her dearest father master garnet has not asked her yet and i have reason to believe here georgie softly hesitated what asked sir cradock anxiously for he was very fond of eoa she was such a novelty to him that master bob garnet just come from school loves amy rosedew above eoa toffee rock or peppermint amy rosedew is a minx answered the old man hotly I offered to shake hands with her when I met her on Wednesday and was even going to kiss her because she is my goddaughter and and an uncommonly pretty girl you know and what do you think she said oh don't tell me uncle Craddock if it was anything impudent you know I could not stand it thinking what I do of those rose dews she threw herself back with her great eyes flashing and the colour in her cheeks dark crimson and she said no thank you no contact for me with unnatural injustice and she drew her frock around her and swept away as if the road was not wide enough for both of us nice behaviour was it not and i fear her father endorses it i know he does answered georgie whose face during that description had been a perfect study of horror contending with humour i know that mr rosedew one of the best men in the world if indeed he is sincere which others may doubt but not i 
he poor man having little perception except of his own interest has taken a most unfavorable view of everything we do here oh i am so sorry it almost makes me feel as if we must be in the wrong beautiful georgie sighed heavily like a fair woman at a confessional his own interest georgie ourselves in the wrong i don't quite understand you as if we were harsh you know uncle cradock when heaven be thanked we have not concluded as to too many but not to talk of that absurdity and not to pain you darling uncle you must know what i meant about mr rosedew's interest no indeed i don't georgie i don't see how john i mean mr rosedew's interest is at all involved in the matter he had a daughter passing fair said mrs corklemore without thinking oh uncle i forgot i am so light-headed and foolish i forget everything now it is noel's fault for worrying me as he does every week about income she passed her hand across her forehead and swept the soft dark hair back as if worldly matters were too many for her poor childish brain who could look at her without wishing that she really cared for herself just a little i insist upon knowing what you mean georgie said sir cradock frowning heavily for he was not at all sentimental john rosedew's daughter is amy and amy i know is perfectly honest though as obstinate as the devs <coughs> i beg your pardon i mean that amy is very obstinate as well as exceedingly bigoted and i might almost say insolent oh no i can never believe that uncle cradock even upon your authority in the heat of truth mrs corklemore stood up and faced sir cradock but i tell you she is georgie don't try to defend her no young woman of eighteen ought to have spoken as she did to me when i met her last wednesday outrageous is the mildest word i can use to describe her manner very likely you thought so dearest uncle cradock and so very likely i might have thought or any of the old school people but we must make allowances you know we are bound to do so for young people brought up to look at things from a different point of view no by george i won't i have heard that stuff too often spirit of the age and all that balderdash because a set of young jackanapes are blessed with impudence enough to throw to the dogs all the teachings of ages just when it doesn't suit them is it likely that we who are old enough to see the beauty of what they despise are to venerate and bow down to infantile inspiration which itself bows down to nothing georgie you are too soft too mild your forbearance quite provokes me leave me if you please to form my own opinions especially about people whom i know so much better than you do i am sure uncle cradock answered georgie pouting i never presume in any way to interfere with your opinions your judgment is proverbial whereas i have none whatever only it was natural that i should wish you to think well of one who is likely to be so nearly related to you what why do you look surprised uncle ah you must think me wrong in alluding to it what a simple silly i am to be sure but please not to be angry uncle i never dreamed that you wished it kept secret dear when all the parish is talking of it georgie corklemore have the goodness to tell me what you mean oh don't look at me so uncle i never could bear a cross look i mean no mystery whatever only amy rosedew's engagement to your unlucky i mean your unhappy son of course it has your sanction amy engaged to my to that crafty cradock i cannot believe it i will not believe it and at a time like this well i thought the time ill-chosen but i am no judge of propriety and they say that the poor poor darling who is gone was himself attached let us hope that it was not so however i cannot believe uncle cradock that you have not even been told of it but i tell you georgie that it is so perhaps you disbelieve me in your anxiety to screen them you know better than that dear uncle i believe you before all the world and i will screen them no longer for i think it bad and ungrateful of them 
and after all you have done for them why surely you gave them the living it makes me feel quite ill ingratitude always does georgie pressed her hand to her heart and was obliged to get up and walk about presently she came back again with great tears in her eyes and her face full of anger and pity oh dear uncle i cannot tell you how grieved i am for your sake it does seem so hard-hearted of them how i feel my own helplessness that i cannot comfort you what a passion my noel will be in when i tell him this his nature is so warm and generous so upright and confiding and he looks up to you with such devotion and such deep respect i must not tell him at night poor fellow or he would not sleep a wink and the most contumelious thing of all that pompous old maid miss eudoxia rosedew is going about and boasting of it the title and the property before any one had the manners even to inform so kind a friend and so affectionate a father the title and the property how i hate such worldliness i never could understand how people could scheme and plot for such things and to make so little of you uncle because they relied upon the entail this was quite a shot in the dark for she knew not whether any entail subsisted and as it was a most essential point to discover this georgie fixed her swimming eyes swimming with love and sympathy full upon sir cradock's he started a little but she scarcely knew what to augur thence she must have another shot at it but not on the present occasion it is scarcely needful perhaps to say knowing mrs corklemore and miss rosedew as we do that there was not a syllable of truth in what the former said of the latter sir cradock himself would have doubted it if he had been any judge of women for miss eudoxia rosedew thought very little of baronets how could she help it she of the illustrious grandmother oh her indignation if she could only have dreamed of being charged with making vaunt over such a title neither was it like her even if she had thought of great things of any pledged alliance to go about and share her sentiments with the common people the truth of the matter was this georgie with her natural craft no no skill i mean how a clumsy pen will stumble and ten more years of life to drill it had elicited amy's sentiments as one who having stopped a razor carves his lady's pincushion or one who blowing on bright gimlet tempts the spigot of bonded wine or a varlet who with a knowing worm giveth taste of stilton or even as when a man a sluice captain adown from a backwater headspring all through his plants and garden the water flow is pioneering holding a shovel in hand from the carrier casting the sods out then as it goes flowing forward the pebbles below in a bevy swirl about and it rapidly wimpling down paterunath in a spot where a jump of the ground is and overgets even the guide man so sweet amy being underdrawn of her native crystal by many a sly innuendo and many an artesian auger gushed out like liquid diamonds upon the skilful georgie and piled upon her a flood of truth a scamander upon achilles o oh, water upon a duck's back because georgie always swam in truth please not to say that castalia rore puro wets not the kerchief of a lady thrice dipped in sticks and so it came to pass that young amy let out everything having a natural love of candour and a natural hatred of georgie and expecting to overwhelm her with the rolling seventh billow of truth mrs corklemore softly smiling reared her honest head out of the waters sleeked her soft luxuriant locks and the only thing likely to overwhelm her was sympathy unfathomable amy did not wish for that and begged her very dryly by no means to exhaust herself for amy had moral scent of a liar even as her father had now that father the finest fellow take him for all in all whom one need wish to look upon was according to a good man's luck in fearful tribulation fearful at least to any man except john rosedew himself but john though fully alive to the stigma type of his position allowed his epidermis to quill toward the operator and abstracted 
all his too sensitive parts into a sophistic apery john sitting in his book-room had got an apron tucked well under his rosy chin an apron with two pockets in it and the strings in a bow at the back of his neck and he trembled for his earlobes whenever he forgot his subject around him with perpetual clatter snip and snap and stir about hovered like a jewish maiden fingering the millstone who but his eudoxia in her strong right hand was a pair of shears keen as those of atropos padded at the handles lest to hurt the thumb but the blades the trenchant edges oh what should keep their bright love asunder no human ear for a moment nay nor the nose of a mortal neither was this risk and tug and frequent fuller's teasling the whole or even the half of the agony john was undergoing for though he sat with a pile of books heaped in fair disorder round him though three were pushing about on his lap dusting themselves in his well-worn kersey like sparrows on a genial highway though one was even perched on his right hand and another on his left yet he had no more fruition of them save in the cud of memory than had prometheus of his fire-glow in the frost of strobilus or than the son of jove and pluto whom ulysses saw had of his desert nay then i looked at tantalus having a rough tribulation standing fast in a lake and it came quite home to his chin beard nevertheless he stood thirsting and had not to seize and to quaff it for every time when the old man would stoop in his longing to quaff it then every time the water died swallowed back and at his ankles earth shone black in a moment because a divinity parched it trees as well leafing loftily over his head poured fruitage pear trees and pomegranates and apple trees glittering fruited fig trees of the luscious and olive trees of the luxuriant whereat whenever the old man shot out his hands to grasp them away the wind would toss them into the shadowy cloudland odyssey now john you are worse than ever i do declare you are why you won't even hold your neck straight i try to make you look decent i try so very hard john and you haven't even the gratitude to keep your chin up from the apron you had much better go to a barber and get half your hair pulled out by the roots and the other half poisoned with the leaden comb and then you'll appreciate me perhaps we read said john rosedew complacently gazing at his white locks as they tumbled and took little jumps on the apron that when the argive lost thyrea they pledged themselves to the law and a solemn imprecation that none of the men should encourage his hair and none of the ladies wear gold and pray what gold do i wear brother john you are so personal you never can let me alone i do believe you have never forgiven me my poor dear grandmother's ring and watch and aunt diana's brooch and locket no nor even my own dear mother's diamond ring with the sapphires round it and perhaps you don't hate even my bracelet a mere twist of gold with cat's eyes oh john john how can you be my brother and show such a little mind john whence we may infer continued john quite unruffled for he knew that it would be worse than useless to assure miss doxy that he was not even aware of the existence of the things he was impeached with or at least we have some grounds for supposing that the greeks a very sensitive and highly perceptive race did not like to have their hair cut compare with this another statement no indeed i won't john i would rather hope i would not you can't hold your tongue for a moment however solemn the occasion is there that's the third cut you've got and i won't take another snip at you but you have quoted less greek than usual that's one comfort at any rate and i will put you on some gold beater's skin for being so very good john only don't tell amy she does make such a fuss about it but there i need not tell you for you won't know how you got them in half an hour's time now don't make a fuss john one would think you were killed poor john had dared to put his hand up as if you cared indeed even if you had three great stripes of red all down your collar or even upon your white neckerchief you wouldn't be at all ashamed of yourself have you the face to say that you would now 
well dear doxy i am not convinced that you are reasonable in expecting me to be ashamed of bleeding when you have been cutting me oh of course not i never am reasonable according to your ideas but one thing you may be convinced of and that is that i never will toil and degrade myself by cutting your hair again john after this outrageous conduct john had been visited so often with this tremendous menace that he received it with no satisfaction well he knew that on that day four weeks he must don the blue apron again unless something happened worse even than aunt doxy's tensorial flourishes now you are not done yet john you are in a great hurry are you not to get the apron off and scatter the hair all about what's the good of my taking the trouble to spread jemima's shawl down can you imagine you are done when i haven't rubbed you up with the rosemary even coronari marino rore no wonder good flaccus puts it after multa quide bitentium oh doxy you are inexorable oh adverse penates by the way that stanza is to my mind the most obscure with one exception in all the odes either horace had too much of the lene tormentum applied just then ingenio non saepe duro or else please miss all the girls called her miss dr hatton miss bang went miss doxy quicker than thought left an exclamation semi-profane far behind in the light air slammed the door on the poor girl's chilblains bolted and locked it and put out the key and put the scutcheon over the keyhole well why unde terrarum women are not allowed to say meherkle neither men mecaster idepole is common to both but only in citia antiquitatis for the most ancient men abstained from that even and i dare say were none the worse for it i have no patience with you john cried miss doxy snatching up brush comb scissors extract of the sea dew the blue apron jemima's shawl of gray hair and we know not how many other things and huddling all into a cupboard and longing to lock herself in with them great truths come out answered john quite placidly at periods of mental commotion but why o oh doxy and whence this inopine hurry scurry there is no classic expression except perhaps in aristophanes of prosody quick enough and doubtless for very good reason because the people were too wise to hurry so rumpe moras for instance is rather suggestive of oh john oh john even at such a moment john i believe you'll die in latin or greek and i don't know which our men is only i don't believe it's english there i am as bad as you are to discuss such a question now and i am quite sure jenny can't tell a good story soundly and he has got such ferret eyes thank heaven the key was inside john poor miss doxy was panting so that her brother was quite frightened for her and the more so because he had no idea what there was to be frightened of why doxy he said my darling he need never see that you have cut me as if i care for that oh john my dearest brother he'll see that i've cut your hair the idea struck john rosedew as so gloriously novel that man who knew the world so to him it appeared such a mountain of wonder that a sister should want to sink through the floor for having saved her brother from barbarism that he laughed as hard as any man of real humour ever laughs miss doxy stole on the opportunity when he sat down to have his laugh out to dust all the white hair with her handkerchief from his coat collar suddenly john rosedew got up and his laugh went away in gravity he walked to the door more heavily than was natural to him lest he should seem to go falsely unlocked and unbolted it and in his most stately manner marched into the hall jenny was telling a jolly lie jollity down below i suppose to mr rufus hutton she was doing it very clumsily not oculo irritato please sir yes my master is gone round the parish sir and the rest they be at the school sir how sorry they will be to be sure to hear that you have called sir and all of them out of the way so no they won't said mr rosedew looking over her head the only thing i am sorry for jenny is that you can tell a falsehood so 
but the fault is not yours today i will talk to you by and by dr hutton come in if you please i was having my hair cut by my sister miss rosedew you have met her before eudoxia dr hutton is kind enough to come and see us i have told him how good and how sisterly you have been to me and i am sure that he must wish to have a sister so capable that is to say if he has not added john who was very particular about his modal and temporal prefix miss rosedew came forward with a few white hairs still on her dark rep spell sleeve and being put upon her metal was worthy of her brother oh dear that such a grand expression should be needful even over the shell of the roasted egg of snobbery rufus hutton of course not being quite a fool respected and trusted and he knew quite well that there was on his own part something akin to intrusion for he had called in the forenoon when visits from none but an intimate friend are expected and he had pushed his advance rather vigorously not towards the drawing-room but to john's favourite book-room where the lady lysinus plied her calling but for this he had good reason as he wished to see mr rosedew alone and the cause of his visit was urgent it was not long before the lady feeling rather unhappy because she was not arrayed much better than the lilies of the field are withdrew in a very noble manner an ingratitude of rutus when the doctor drew his chair close home to the parsons looked all around the room and coughed to try how big the echo was finding no response returned by that prolific goddess who loves not calf or sheepskin and seeing that no other lady was dangerously acoustic rufus inclined his little red head towards john's great and black and slightly liparous waistcoat and spake these winged words ever see a thing like that sir no i don't think i ever did dear me how odd it smells why how grave you are dr hutton so will you be when i have told you what i have to tell you my discovery is for your ears only i have been to london about it and there found out its meaning now i will act upon your advice nothing in all my experience though i have seen a great deal of the world nothing has ever surprised me more than what i have told you but you forget dr hutton cried john imbibing excitement that as yet you have told me nothing at all only shown me something which i cannot in the least make out a cylinder a hollow and blocked at one end of a substance resembling bookbinding and of a most unsavoury odour ha replied rue hutton ha my dear sir you little guess the importance of that thing no bigger than a good cigar ah indeed ah yes do you mean to tell me or not dr hutton your behaviour is most unusual i am greatly surprised by your manner ah no doubt no doubt of that very odd if you were not i also am astonished at your apparent indifference hereupon rufus looked so intensely knowing so loaded with marvel and mystery too big to be discharged even that john rosedew himself so calm and large and worthy to be called a philosopher very nearly grew wroth with longing to know what all the matter was then dr hutton having bound him by a solemn promise that he would not for the present even hint of the matter to any one poured out the hissing contents of his mind under the white curls which still overhung the elder man's porch of memory and what he told him was indeed a thing not to be forgotten the spectator is said to see more of the game than any of the players see and the reader of a story knows a great deal more than the actors do or the writer either for that matter marry therefore i will not insult any candid intelligence neither betray rue hutton's faith for he is an awkward enemy the very next day there came a letter with coal enough on it to make some gas and directed in a wandering manner to reverend mr rosedew Knowle house somewhere in england much as we abuse the post office people they generally manage to find us out more cleverly than we do them and so this letter had not been to more than six wrong places as our good journalists love to say it was couched in the following terms honoured and reverend sir takes the liberty of stating price of inland coals as per margin 
delivered free within six miles of charing cross n b weighed as the act direct whether required or otherwise which mostly is not and the dust come back if required excuse me the liberty of adding that a nice young gent and uncommon respectable only not a good business address no blame to him being an oxford gent lie here very ill and not much expect to get over tomorrow night our junior mr clinkers with full commission to take all orders and sign receipts for the firm have been up with him all night and hear him talk quite agreeable about some place or business called amory supposed in the hardware line by mistake for emory this young gent were called mr newman by the name of charles newman but mrs ducksacre half believed clandestical and temporal only and no doubt good reason for it because he always pay his lodging reverend sir found your directions as per endorsement very simply in the inside pocket of young gent's coat and he only have one to look in but for fear to be misunderstood this firm think none the less of him by the same reason having been both of us in trouble when we was married also as per left hand cover a foreign looking playbook something queer and then opera which the undersigned understand at once having been to that same theatre when our gracious queen was married and not yet gone into the coal trade request to excuse the liberty but if endorsed correctly and agreeable to see the young gent's funeral performed most reasonably at sole expense of this firm and no claim made on any survivors because robert clinkers like him must come by express day after tomorrow at latest signed for the firm of poker and clinkers west london depot hammersmith weighed as the act directs per robert clinkers junior at mrs and miss ducksacre's greengrocer and general fruiterer mortimer street cavendish square end of chapter fourteen of Craddock Noel, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume Two, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Fifteen. Craddock Noel had written from London to the parsonage once and once only. He had told them how he had changed his name because his father had cast him off and as he bitterly added according to filial promise he felt himself bound to be noel no longer but he did not say what name he had taken neither did he give any address only he would write again when he had found some good situation of course he longed to hear from amy his own loving amy who begged that poor letter and bore it in her own pure bosom long after the queen's head came off but his young pride still lay hot upon him and for amy's sake he nursed it a young man is never so proud of his honour so prompt to deny himself anything so strong in another's life hold and careless about his own living as when he has won a true love's worth and sees it abiding for ever few are the good who have such luck for the success is not of merit any more than it is in other things more often indeed some fish-tailed coxcomb is a woman's dagon doubly worshipped for crushing her but when that luck does fall to the lot of a simple and honest young fellow he piles his triple mountains up to the everlasting heaven but makes no babel of them a man who chatters about his love soon exhausts himself or his subject john rosedew after receiving that letter shut every book on his table chairs and desk and chimney-piece he must think what to do and how and he never could think hard on the flints of daily life while the green pastures of the dead were tempting his wayward steps away of course he would go to london at once by the very next train but whether or no he should tell his people the reason of his going he felt so strongly inclined to tell even at risk of domestic hysterics and parochial convulsions that he resolved at last not to tell for he thought of the great philosopher's maxim not perhaps irrefragable 
that when the right hangs dubious we may safely conclude that it rides in the scale swinging opposite to our own wishes to most of us not having a quarter of john rose usability and therefore likely to be a hundred times less hesitant it seems that the maxim holds good with ourselves or any other common mortal but makes truth actually cut her own throat when applied to a mind like his a mind already too timorously and humorously self-conscious let ninety-nine thousand angels get on the top of john rosedew's pen which generally had a great hair in it and dance a faux pas over that question if it was laid the wrong way for we whose consciences must work in corduroys and high lows roughly conclude that right and wrong are but as a button and buttonhole when it comes to a question of hair splitting blessed are they whose conscience edge like the sword of thor can carve every wisp of wool afloat the brook of life after breakfast john mounted coribus leaving a short farewell and set off hastily with the old-fashioned valise behind the saddle wherein he was wont to bear wine and confections upon his parochial tours the high metal steed was again amazed at the pace that could be pumped out of him neither did he long continue in gloriously mute but woke the echoes of iteen with many a noble roar and shriek so that consternation shook the heart of deer and pig and cow but the parson did not exult as usual in these proofs of velocity because his soul within him was sad nevertheless he preserved cohesion or at least coincidence in an admirable manner with his feet thrust strenuously into the stirrups his bridle hand thrown in great emergencies upon the peak of the saddle and whip hand reposing on the leathern outwork which guarded and burnished his rear anchored thus by both strong arms for the sake of his mission and family he felt capable of jumping a gate if coribus had equal confidence that evening he entered the ducksacre shop and found no one there but the mistress pray excuse me but i have been told ma'am said john rosedew lifting his hat as he always did to a matron and bowing his silvery head that you have a lodger here who is very ill yes sir replied mrs ducksacre fetching her breath very quickly and dead too for all i know oh lord i am so put upon the soft-hearted parson was shocked at this apparent apathy and thought her no true woman who is not wrong sometimes it was a very rare thing for john rosedew to judge man or woman harshly but only half an hour ago that poor woman had been upstairs neglecting till present and future estranging some excellent customers leaving a wanton shop-boy to play marbles with spanish chestnuts while she did her most misguided best to administer to sick Craddock soup wildly beyond her own economy and furiously beyond his power of deglutition john rosedew with his stout legs shaking and his stockings expressing excitement went up three pairs ill assorted of stairs into Craddock's sick-room then he started back from the aristophanic climax even the rags of telephus though after all polly ducksacre had done her best to make the room comely why there were three potato sacks on the bed with the names of fulham growers done in red letters upon them and giving the room quite a bright appearance as if newly marked sheep were in it nay and i could almost swear there were two bast mats from covent garden gloriously fixed as bed curtains mats from that noble market where a rat prays heaven vainly to grant him the coat of a water rat there by craddock knoll's bed sat the faithful untiring nurse the woman who had absorbed such a quantity of strap and had so kindly assimilated it meek spirited rachel jupp waited and watched by the bed of him through whom she had been enfranchised since issachar jupp became a christian she had not tasted the buckle end once and scarcely twice the tongue end she had been employed some years ago as a nurse in the middlesex hospital so she knew her duties thoroughly but here she had exceeding small chance of practising that knowledge because scarcely anything which she wanted and would have rung for if there had been any bell was ever to be found in the house 
even hot water which the doctor had ordered was cold again ere it came to her and had taken an hour before it started for there was no fireplace in the little room nor even on the floor below it uncle john could scarcely keep from crying as he looked at poor craddy propped up in the bed there with his lips so pale and bloodless cheeks sunken in and shining like dry oyster shells but with a round red spot in the centre large eyes glaringly bright and starting and red-hot temples and shorn head swathed with dripping bandages while now and then he raised his weak hands towards the surging tumult and dropped them helplessly on the sun-blind tucked round him as part of his counterpane ah that's the way sir said rachel after she had risen and curtsied that's the way he go on now all the day and all the night and he have left off talking now altogether only to moan and to wamble he used to jump up in the bed at first and shut his left eye and put his arms like this as if he was shooting at something and it pleased him so when i give him the hair broom he would put the flat of it to his shoulder and smile as if he sees some game and shoot at the door fifty times a day and then scream and fall back and cover his eyes up but he haven't done that these three days now too weak i'm afeard too weak for it john rosedew sighed heavily for the bright young mind so tried above what it was able to bear then as he kissed the flaming forehead sometimes flaming and sometimes icy he thought that it might be the father's mercy to obliterate sense of the evil for the mind of the insane or at least its precious part is with him who showers afar both pain and pleasure but keeps at home the happiness can you send for the doctor at once ma'am or tell me where to find him the parson still kept to the ancient fashion and addressed every woman past thirty as ma'am whatever her rank or condition as he spoke a heavy man entered on tiptoe and quietly moved them aside a raw-boned hulking fellow he was with a slouch and a squint made more impressive by a black eye in the third and most picturesque stage when mauve and lilac and orange in tone and softened sweetly off from the purple nucleus outward as a boy's tour is or used to be shaded with the keen artistic feeling in many a ring concentric from the equator to the poles mr jupp's face was a villainous one as even the softest philanthropist would have been forced to acknowledge the enormous jaws the narrow forehead the grisly porkish eyebrows the high cheekbones and the cunning scants gleam from the black deep ambushed squinters all these were enough to warn any man who wished to get good out of zaki jupp that he must try to put it there first and give it time to go to the devil and back as we say that parsley seed does mr jupp was a man of remarkable strength not active elastic archelean vigour nor even stalwart adjacian bulk but the sort of strength which sometimes vanquishes both of those by outlasting a slouching slow to come long to go heft that had scarcely found its proper wind when better built men were exhausted men of this stamp are usually long-armed big in the lungs and shoulders small in the loins not kneed and splay-footed in a word shaped like a john dory or a miller's thumb or a banjo they are not very strong on their pins nor active they generally get thrown in the first bout of wrestling before ever their muscles get warm they cannot even run fast and in jumping they spring from the heel nevertheless unless they are stricken quite senseless at the outset and their heads for the most part are too deal a quick for that the chances are that they make an example of the antagonist ere he is done with and so in mr jupp's recent duello with an irish bully who scoffed at craddock and said something low of his illness the englishman got the worst of it in the first round the second the third and the fourth but just as dan sullivan's pals and backers were wild with delight and screeching the brave bargee settled down on his marrow and the real business began after twenty-five rounds the tipperary slasher had three men to carry him home and look fit for an inquest to sit upon without making him any flatter now issachar being a very slow man 
there was no chance that he would hurry over his present inspection of Craddock. For a very long time he looked at him from various points of view. Then, at last, he shook his head and poked his long black chin out. "'Now this here wanna do, you know. I'll fetch the doctor to you, master, as you seem to care for the poor young chap.' And Zaki Jupp, requiring no answer, went slowly down the stairs, with a great hand on either wall to save noise. Then, at a long trot, rolling over all who came in his way, and rounding the corners like a ship whose rudder bands are broken, he followed the doctor from street to street, keeping up the same pace till he found him. Dr. Tink was coming out of a court not far from Marylebone Lane, where the smallpox always lay festering. "'You'll just come street long with me, to the poor chap as saved our Louis,' said Mr. Jupp, coolly getting into the brougham and sitting in the place of honour, while he dragged Dr. Tink in by the collar and set him upon the front seat. "'Far away now, for Mortimer Street,' he yelled at the wandering coachman, "'and if ye done a lather the nag, mind, I'll lather ye when ye get there." The nag was leathered to Mr. Jupp's satisfaction, and far beyond his own, and arrived at the coal and cabbage shop before John Rosedew had finished reading a paper, which Mrs. Jupp had shown him, thinking that it was a prescription. He wrote it in his sleep, sir, without knowing a thing about it, in his sleep or in his brain wandering. I came in and found him at it, in the middle of the night, and my, how cold his fingers was, and his head so hot. We took it to three great chemist shops, but they could not make it up. They hadn't got all the drugs, they said, and they couldn't make out the quantities. Neither can I, said John, but it rings well, considering that the poor boy wrote it when his brain was weak with fever. The dialects are somewhat muddled, moreover, but we cannot be hypocritical. No, sir, to be sure not. I am sure I meant no hypocrisy. Only, you see, it ain't Christian writing, and Mr. Clinker shake his head at it, and say it comes straight from the devil, and his hoof in every line of it. Mrs. Jupp, the Greek characters are beautiful, though some of the lines are not up to the mark. But, for my part, I wonder how any man can write mixed Greek in London. Nevertheless, I shall have great pleasure in talking it over with him. Please God that he ever gets well. To think that his poor weary brain should still be hankering after his classics. It was the dirge in Cymbeline put into Greek choral metre, and John Rosedew's tears flowed over the words, as Polydor's had done, and Cadwall's. Unhappy Craddock, his misty brain had vapoured off in that sweet wild dirge, which hovers above, as if the freed soul lingered for the clogged one to shake its wings to it. The parson was pondering and closing his wet eyes to recover his faith in God, whom best we see with the eyes shut, except when his stars are shining, while Issachar Jupp came up the stairs, poking Dr. Tink before him, because he still thought it likely that the son of medicine would evaporate. The doctor, who knew his tricks and put up with them, lest anything worse might come of it, solaced his sense of dignity when he got to the top by a grand bow to Mr. Rosedew. John gave him the change in a kind one, then offered his hand, as he always did, being a man of the ancient fashion. While they were both looking sadly at Craddock, he sat up suddenly in the bed, and stretching forth his naked arms, wherein was little nourishment, laughed as an aged man does, and then nodded at them solemnly. His glazed eyes were so prominent that their whites reflected the tint of the rings around them. "'Ladies and gentlemen, stop him, if you please, and give him a pen and ink, and my best hat to write on. Oh, don't let him go by.' "'Stop whom, my dear sir?' asked the doctor, putting his arms as if to do it. "'Now, I've stopped him. What's his name?' "'The golden lad. Oh, don't you know? You can't have got him, if you don't.' The golden lad that came from heaven to tell me I did not do it, that I didn't do it. Do it, sir. All a mistake altogether. It makes me laugh. I declare it does. It makes me laugh for an hour every time he comes, because they were all so wise. All but my Amy. My Amy. She was such a foolish little thing. She never would hear a word of it. And now I call you all to witness. 
of tester and tester one two three four five let me put it down on a sheet of foolscap with room enough for the names below it all the ladies and gentlemen put their names in double column and get mr clinkers if you can and jenny to go at the bottom only be particular about the double column ladies on one side gentlemen the other like a country dance you know or the carmen Cyculare. and at the bottom right across miss amy rosedew's name the contemplation of that last beatitude was too much for the poor fellow he fell back faint on the pillow and the shop blind untucked by his blissful emotions rattled its rings on the floor blow me if i can't stand it cried issachar jupp going down three stairs at a step and when he came back his face looked clearer and he said something about a noggin mrs ducksacre bolted after him for business must be attended to will he ever be right again poor fellow dr tink i implore you to tell me your opinion sincerely then i cannot say that i think he will still i have some hopes of it much will depend upon the original strength of, of the cerebellum and the regularity of his previous habits if he has led a wild loose life he has no chance whatever of sanity no he has led a most healthy life temperate gentle and equable his brain has always been clear and vigorous without being too creative he was one of the soundest scholars for his age i have ever met with but he had some terrible blow eh oh yes a most terrible blow john thought what a terrible blow it would be to his own life's life if the issue went against him and for tears he could ask no more End of chapter 15Sixteen of Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume Two, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Sixteen. The good people assembled in Knowlehurst Church were agreeably surprised on the following Sunday by the announcement from Mister Pell in that loud, sonorous voice of his which had frightened spinsters out of their wits lest he were forbidding instead of asking their bands of matrimony that there would be no sermon that morning inasmuch as he the reverend octavius was forced to hurry away at full speed to assuage the rampant desire of rushford for the performance of divine service mrs noel corklemore who had the great curtained pew of the hall entirely to herself and child for eoa never would go to church because they defy the devil there georgie who appeased her active mind by counting the brass-headed nails and then multiplying them into each other and subtracting the ones that were broken lifted her indescribable eyes and said thank god almost audibly octavius pell hurrying out of the porch ascended coribus as had been arranged but he did it so rapidly and with such an air of decision that amy standing at the churchyard gate full of beautiful misgivings could not help exclaiming oh please mr pell whatever you do leave your stick here till monday we will take such care of it indeed i fear i must not miss rosedew octavius answered gravely looking first at his stick and then at the flanks of raby who was full of interesting tricks i have so far to go you know and i must try to keep time with them whoa you little villain oh dear i am so sorry and at any rate please do not strike him only stroke him with it he is so very high-spirited and he has never had a wheel upon him at least since he came to papa and i could not bear to see it and i know you won't mr pell octavius looked at the soft-hearted girl blushing so in her new drawn bonnet mauve with black for the sake of poor clayton he looked at her out of his knowing dry eyes in that sort of response to the litany style which a curate adopts to his rector's daughter can you suppose miss rosedew that i would have the heart to beat him now ah if you will will you then rebus thought better of it 
no i hope you would not said amy in pure good faith with a glance however at the thick bamboo because it would be so cruel it is hollow i hope but it has such knots and it looks so very hard hollow and thin as a piece of pie crust and you know how this wood splits oh i am so glad because you can't hurt him so very much please not to go if you can hold him more than three miles and a half an hour papa says that is the pace that always suits his health best and please to take the saddle off and keep it at your house that the rushford boy may not ride him back and please to choose a steady boy from the head class in your sunday school and if possible a communicant but i'm sadly afraid there's no trusting the boys indeed i fear not said octavius gravely and adding to himself at any rate when you are concerned you darling what a love you are but there's no chance for me i know and it's a good job for me that i knew it oh you little angel i wonder who the lucky fellow is aunt eudoxia had dropped him a hint quite in a casual way when she saw that the stout young bachelor was going on over head and ears sweet amy watched mr pell or rather his steed with fond interest until they turned the corner and certainly the pace so far was very sedate indeed octavius was an upright man you could see that by his seat in the saddle as well as a kind and good-natured one and on no account would he have vexed that gentle and beautiful girl nevertheless he grew impatient as coribus pricked his ears pretentiously and snorted so as to defy the winds and was fain to travel sidewise as if the distance was not enough for him and all the time he was swallowing the earth at the rate of no more than four miles an hour then the young parson pulled out his watch and saw that it wanted but half an hour to the time himself had fixed for the morning service at rushford and he could not bear the thought of keeping the poor folk waiting about the cross as they always did and would wait till the parson appeared among them as mr wise has well observed the peasant of the new forest is too full of veneration and here let me acknowledge as behoveth a man to do not in a scrambling preface which nobody ever would read but in the body of my work great and loving obligation to the labors of mr john r wise his book is perfectly beautiful written in admirable english full of observation taste and gentle learning and the descriptions of scenery are such that they make the heart yearn to verify them i know the new forest pretty well from my own perambulations and periquitations one barbarism is no worse than the other but i never should have loved it as i do but for his loving guidance the reverend mr pell as some people put when they write to a parson hoping still to keep faith with amy because her eyes were so lovely pulled the snaffle and turned coribus into a short cut through beeches and hazels then compromise came soon to an end and the big bamboo was compelled to fall upon the fat flank of coribus because he would not go without it he showed sense of that first attention only by a little buck jump and a sprightly wag of his tail then hoping that the situation need not be looked in the face shambled along at five miles an hour with a mild responsibility five miles more said octave pell and only twenty minutes to do it in it's an unlucky thing for you coribus that your mistress is engaged whack came the yellow bamboo again and this time in solid earnest rebus went off as if he meant to go mad he had never known such a blow since the age wherein he belonged to the innkeeper oh could a horse with four feeds a day be expected to put up with tyranny but to the naggy's great amazement octave pell did not tumble off more than that he seemed to stick closer with a most unpleasant embrace and a pressure that told upon the wind not of heaven but of horse till the following symptoms appeared first a wheeze and creak internal a slow creak like leather chafing or a pair of bellows out of order then a louder remonstrance like the ironwork of a roller or the gudgeons of a wheelbarrow then 
faster and faster a sucking noise like the bucket of an old pump when the gardener works by the job finally puff and roar and shriek with notes of passing sadness like the neap tide wailing up a cavern or a lament of the berkshire blowing stone in forest glades where hollow hoofs fell on the sod quite mutely that roar was enough to try masculine courage though never unnerved by a heart shock how then could poor pearl garnet sitting all alone in a lonely spot wherein she had pledged herself to her dead love sitting there to indulge her tears the only luxury left her how could she help being frightened to death as the unearthly sound approached her the terror was mutual coribus turning the corner sharply stopped short in a mode that must have sent his true master over his withers to explore the nature of the evil then he shook all through and would have bolted if the bamboo had not fallen heavily in the niche of a hollow oak was crouching falling backward with terror and clutching at the brave old bark yet trying to hide behind it only the snowy arms would come outwards a beautiful girl clad in summer white on that foggy day of december the brown cloak which had protected her from sylvan curiosity lay on the ground a few yards away on the spot so sad and sacred pearl garnet's grief if we knew the whole of it or perhaps because we cannot was greater than any girl could bear a lovely young and loving maid with stores of imagination yet a practical power of stowing it of building castles yet keeping them all within compass of the kitchen range quite different from our amy yet a better wife for some men according to what the trumps are and amy must have hearts or she dies that very nice girl we have let her go weep and never once cared to follow her there is never any justice in this world therefore who cares to apologize it would take up all our business time if we did it properly now as she stretched her white arms forth and her delicate form shrunk back into the black embrace of the oak tree while her rich hair was streaming all down her breast and her dark eyes still full of teardrops the rider no less than the horse was amazed and seemed to behold a vision then as she shrunk away into the tree bowl with a shriek of deadly terror for what love casteth out fear and she saw not through the ivy screen and coribus groaned sepulchrally pell came down with a dash on one foot and went quick jump to help her in a fainting fit for the heart so firm and defiant in days of happiness was flux now and frail with misery she was cowering away in the dark tree nook like the pearls of mistletoe fallen with her head thrown back such an elegant head a woman's greatest beauty and the round arms hanging helpless hereupon mr pell was abroad he had never experienced any sisters nor much mother consciously being the eighth son as of course we know of a jolly yorkshire baronet at any rate he had lost his mother at the birth of nona's pell and i am sorry there are not ninety of them if of equal merit so octavius stood like a fish out of water with both hands in his pocket as it is so generally the habit of fishes to stand then meaning no especial harm nor perhaps great good for that matter he said to himself confound it all what the deuce am i to do his sermon upon the third commandment about to be preached at rushford where the fishermen swore like st peter that sermon went cracked in his pocket at such a shocking ejaculation never heeding that he went on to do what a stout fellow and a gentleman must have done in this emergency he lifted the drooping figure forth into the open air touching it only with his hands timidly and reverently as if every fair curve were sacred then he fetched water in his best sunday hat the only chimney pot he possessed from the stream trickling through the spire bed and he sprinkled it on the broad white forehead as if he were christening a baby the moment he saw that her life was returning and her deep gray eyes quiet havens of sorrow 
opened and asked where their owner was and her breast like a billow in a place where two tides meet that moment octave laid her back against the rugged trunk in the thick brown cloak which he had fetched when he went for the water and wrapped it around her delicately as if she were taking a nap there o oh, man of short pipes and hard bachelor fare for this thou deservest as good a wife as ever basted a leg of mutton at last the young lady looked up at him with a deep drawn sigh and said i am afraid i have been very silly no indeed you have not but i am very sorry for you because i am dreadfully clumsy she glanced at his snowy choker which he never wore but on sundays and being a very quick-witted young woman she guessed at once who he was oh please to tell me i hope the service is not over at nowelhurst church the service has been over for a quarter of an hour because there was no sermon oh what shall i do then what can i do i had better never go home again this was said to herself in anguish and pell saw that he was not meant to hear it can i go please to the rectory mr rosedew is from home but i am sure they will give me shelter until my until i am sent for i have lost my way in the wood here this statement was none of the truest to be sure said the hasty parson forgetting about the rushford bells the rheumatic clerk the quid chewing pilots let them turn their quids a bit longer to be sure i will take you there at once allow me to introduce myself how very stupid of me octavius pell mr rosedew's curate at rushford hereupon pello pepuli pulsum as his friends loved to call him from his driving powers at cricket and to show that they knew some latin executed a noble salaam quite of the modern school however and without the old reduplication like the load on the back of christian till the duckweed came out of his hat in a body and fell into the flounce tucket of the beautiful pearl's white skirt she never looked though she knew it was there that girl understood her business but curtsied to him prettily having recovered strength by this time and there was something in his dry manly tone curt modesty and breeding without any flourish about it which led the young maid to trust him as if she had known him since tops and bottoms i am pearl garnet said she imitating his style unconsciously the daughter i mean i live at nowelhurst dell cottage coribus had cut off the stable long ago with three long wheels from bamboo upon him which he vowed he would show to amy please to take my arm miss garnet you are not very strong yet i know your brother well and a braver or more straightforward young gentleman never thought small things of himself after doing great ones pearl was delighted to hear bob's praises and mr pell treated that subject so cleverly from every possible point of view that she was quite astonished when she saw the rectory side gate and octavius in the most light-hearted manner made a sudden and warm farewell and darted away for rushford how good it is for a sad heavy heart to exchange with a gay and light one hang it after that let me have a burster was his clerical ejaculation or else it is all up with me i hope we haven't spilt the sermon though or got any duckweed down it duckweed indeed what a duck she is and oh what splendid eyes he ran all the way to rushford at a pace unknown to coribus and his governor coat flew away behind him with the sermon banging about and the text peeping out under the pocket lap swear not at all were the words i believe and a rare good sermon it must have been if it stuck to the text under the circumstances the jolly old tars after waiting an hour orally refreshing their grandmother's epitaphs and close hauling on many a tight yarn were just setting up stunsails to take grog on board the lugger's locker hard by as the banyan time was over let them ship their grog and their old women might keep gravy hot and be blessed to them they had come there for service and shiver their timbers if they'd make sail till the chaplain came good faith and they got their service at last 
but an uncommonly short-winded one a sermon moreover which each man felt coming admirably home to his shipmate meanwhile mr pell had left behind no small excitement at nowelhurst for a rumour took wing after morning service when the wings of fame are briskets in all country parishes that parson john was gone to london to complain to the queen that sir cradock nowell never came to church now nor even sent his agent thither to manage matters for him for mr garnet still retained his stewardship among them though longing to be quit of it and discharging his duties silently and not with his old pronouncement because his health was weaker the vivid power of vital force seemed to be failing the man who had stamped his character upon all people around him because he never said a thing which he did not think and scarcely ever thought a thing with any fear of saying it hitherto we have had of bull garnet by far the worst side uppermost i will offer no excuses now for his too ready indulgence of his far too savage temper in sooth we meet with scarce any case in which excuses are undiscoverable god and the angels find them always our best earthly friends can see them when properly pointed out our enemies when they want to make accusation of them all i will say for bull garnet is to invert the historian's sentence hec tanta viri vitia ingentes virtutes exaequabant these blemishes however dark had grand qualities to redress them strong affection great scorn of falsehood tenderness almost too womanly liberality both of mind and heart a real depth of sympathy would all these coexist with or be lost in one great vice it appears to me that we are so toothed in spliced and mortised dovetailed double-budded and inarched both of good and evil that the wrong instead of poisoning the right often serves as guano to it nevertheless we had better be perfect when we have found the way out End of chapter 16chapter 17 of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume 2 by richard doddridge blackmore this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 17 it must not be forgotten that rufus hutton all this time was very hard at work and so was mrs corklemore between that lady and eoa pleasant little passes gave a zest to daily intercourse George's boundless sympathies being circumscribed only by terror Nevertheless although sir Craddock laughed when his spirits were good and his mind was clear at their fundamental difference Georgie began to gain upon him and Eoa to lose ground How could it be otherwise even if their skill had been equal and Eoa not only had no skill but scorned sweet Georgie for having any how could mrs. Corklemore fail of doing her blessed duty when she was in the house all day and eoa out jumping the river or looking about for bob garnet whatever the weather was out went eoa peering around for the tracks of bob which like those of a mole were self-evident and then hiding behind a great tree when she found him and hoping with flutter of heart about it that bob had not happened to see her yet if he happened not to see her she would go up and be cross with him and ask whether amy rosedew had turned to the right or left there or had stopped in a hollow tree and did bob think that she looked well that morning then he had no right to think so and perhaps her own new hat with black ostrich was a hideously ugly thing oh she only wished there were tigers leave the little dear to do exactly as she liked for nothing else she will do and now in looking through the forest gray and white with winter scorn we not the grand old trunk in our gay love of the mistletoe there is a very ancient tree an oak well known and good of fame even at the first perambulation of our legislator king it stands upon the bend and brow under which two valleys meet where a horseshoe of the wood has chanced and water takes advantage 
in the scoop below the tree two covered brooks fetch round high places into one another prattle satisfaction and steal away for their honeymoon without a breeze upon them this mark oak last of seven stout brothers dwells upon a surge of upland and commands three valleys two of which unite below it and the other leads them off welcoming their waters the grand tree lifts its proven column channeled ramped and crocketed flaked with brown on lines of gray and bulked with cloud-like ganglions then from the main top where is room for fifty archers to draw the bow limbs of rugged might arise spread flat or straggle downwards but the two great limbs of all the power and main glory the arms that reared their pride to heaven are stricken riven and blasted gaping with great holes and rotten heavily twisted in and out and ending in four long scraggy horns ghastly white in the winter sun where the squirrel durst not build nor the honey buzzard watch for prey this shattered hope of a noble life records the wrath of heaven the legend is that a turf cutter having murdered a way lost peddler for the sake of his pack buried the corpse in this hollow tree and sat down on the grave to count his booty here while he was bending over the gewgaws and the trinkets which he had taken for gold upon the poor huckster's word and which gleamed and flashed in the august twilight the vengeance of god fell upon him in bodily form god's lightning crashed through the dome of oak above him leaped on the murderous head and drove him through the cloven earth breast to breast on his victim's corpse you may be sure that the sons of Itin, a timid and superstitious race find small attractions in that tree when the shades of night are around it john rosedew did not return on the monday nor yet on the tuesday etc not even until the last down train roared through the forest on saturday then as it rushed through the dark night of winter throwing its white breath more strong than our own and very little more fleeting in bracelets on the brown armed trees and in chains on the shoulders of heather the parson leaned back on the filthy panels of a second-class carriage and thought of the scene he had left he had written from london to miss rosedew insisting so far as he ever cared to insist on a little matter that none at home should stay up for him that no one should come to the station to meet him and that pell should be begged to hold himself ready for the sunday's duty because mr rosedew would not go home if any change should that day befall unlucky cradock nowell lucky cradock one ought to say inasmuch as for a fortnight now he had lost all sense of trouble finding from dr tink that no rapid change was impending john rosedew determined to see his home and allay his child's anxiety moreover he felt that his cure of souls must need their sunday salting now walking away from the wooded station that cloudy christmas eve for christmas that year fell on sunday how grand he found the difference from the dirty coop of london the new moon was set but the clouds began to lift above the treetops and a faint aurora flushed and flickered in the far northwest then out came several stars rejoicing singing in twinkles their makers praise and some of the sounds that breathe through a forest even in the hush of a winter's night began to whisper peace and death john who feared not his master's works and was happiest often in solitude trudged along with the leathern valise and three paper parcels strapped comfortably upon his ample back presently he began to think of home and his parish cares and the breadth of god spread around him and then from thinking rose unawares into higher communion for surely it is a grander thing to feel than to think of greatness and in this humour quietly he plodded his proper course for the first four miles or so until he had passed the dame slough near the blackwater stream and was over against vinney ridge but here he must needs try a short cut through the government woods to nolhurst though even in the broad daylight he could scarcely have found his way there he thought that in spite of his orders amy would be sure to stay up for him 
and so he must hurry homeward at a fine brisk pace for a man of his years he plunged into the deep wood and in five minutes time he had very little hope of getting out before daylight have you ever been lost in a great wood at night alone and laden and weary where the frithings had not been cut for ten years and there is no moon or wind to guide a man and the stars glimpse so deceitfully how the stubs even if you are so quick-footed as not to be doubled back by them or thrown down with nostrils patulous how they catch you at the knee with three prongs apiece and make you think of white swelling then the slip where the wet has dribbled from some officious branch or sow or cow summer pasturing has kept her volutabre down you plump and your heels alone have chance of going to heaven because unless you are a wonder you employ such powerful language rising with some difficulty after doubting if it be worth the while and rubbing spitefully ever so long at the case of the part affected you have nothing for it but to start again and fall into worse disasters going very carefully then you jump from the goading repulse of a holly into the hark of a hazel bush one which has numberless clefts and tongs and is hospitable to a bramble tumbling out of it full of thorns recalling your farnaby epigram and wishing they had pelted the hazel harder away you go quite desperate now knowing well that the wood is full of swamps some of which will petrify you under sundew and blue campanula when the summer comes again through all these pleasing incidents and animating encounters john rosedew went ahead and too often a header until he was desperately tired and sat down to think about it then he heard two tawny owls hooting to one another across at least a mile of trees and every forest sound grew clearer in the stillness of the night the sharp sad cry of the martin cat the bark of the fox so impatient the rustle of the dry leaves as a weasel or rat scurred over them the wing flap of some sliding bird roused from his roost by danger the scratching of claws upon trunks now and then and the rubbing of horns against underwood these and other stranger noises stirring the down of darkness moving the sense of lonesome mystery and of fear indefinite were abroad on the air in spite of shakespeare on that christmas eve john rosedew laid his burden by and began to think or wonder what was best to do long as he had lived amid the woods he knew much more of classic sylvulae and poetical arundines than of the natural greenwood and the tasseling of morasses bob garnet would have found his way there or in any other english forest with little hesitation from his knowledge of all the epiphytes and their different aspects the bent of the winter grasses the sense which even a bramble has of sun and wind and rain he would soon have established his compass with allowance for slope and exposure the parson sat upon an ant's nest which had done its work and feeling discharged collapsed with him a big nest of the largest british ant which is mostly found near fir trees that nest alone would have told poor bob something of his whereabouts for there are not many firs in that part of the forest and only one clump high up on a hill in the wood where john rosedew had lost himself but the man of great learning was none the wiser only he felt that his small clothes were done for and mr channing's fashionable cut gone almost as prematurely as the critic who had condemned it now let me consider said mr rosedew to himself for about the fiftieth time it strikes me at the first sight though i declare i can't see anything would that i could not feel for i confess that these legs are grievous but putting aside that view or purview of the question it strikes me that having no antigone to lead me from this which certainly is the grove of the eumenides there is another ant gone up my leg in gentes for my collaboris i wish he wouldn't work so hard though and i always have had the impression that they stayed indoors in the winter 
memorandum to consult theophrastus and compare him as usual with pliny also look at the geoponica full of valuable hints why there he is again biting very hard or stinging what says aristophanes about the music of the gnats indelicate i fear as he too often is nay nay good ant if indeed thou art an ant why what is that over yonder it was a dim light in the great hollow oak the murderer's tree as they called it not a hundred yards from john rosedew the parson approached it cautiously for he knew that desperate men and criminals under a ban still harboured sometimes in the forest as he drew nearer the feeble light glimmering through the entrance showed him at once what tree it was because the rays glanced through two dark holes under the bulging and beetling brow which peasants call the eyes of god john rosedew was as brave a man as ever wept for another's grief or with the word of god assuaged it no man could have less superstition unless as some would have us believe all religion is that upon this point we will not be persuaded until we have seen them live the better and die the more calmly for holding it yet john rosedew so firmly set so full of faith in his maker so far above childish fears which spring from the absence of our father he who having injured none had no dread of any yet drew back and trembled greatly at the sight before him a small reflector lamp with the wick overhung with fungus stood upon a knotted niche in the hollow of the tree by it and with his face and eyes set towards the earth a tall and powerful man stripped to the waist was leaning with one great arm beneath his forehead and bloody stripes across his back the drooping of his figure the woe in every vein of it the deep and everlasting despair in every bone it was an extremity of our human nature which neither chisel nor pen may approach nor even the mind of man conceive until it has been through it presently the man appraised his massive head and scorned himself for being so effeminate he had nearly fainted with the pain what right had he to feel it why should his paltry body quail at a flea bite lash or so when body and soul were damned for ever but if his form had told of sorrow great god what did his face tell he never sighed nor groaned nor moaned his woe was beyond such trumpery he simply took the heavy scourge from the murderer's grave upon which it had dropped when the swoon came over him and standing well forth in the black hollow center to gain full swing for his scorpion thongs he lashed himself over back and round breast with the utmost strength of his mighty arms with every corded muscle leaping but not a sign of pain on his face nor a nerve of his body flinching then at last he fell away and allowed himself to moan a little john rosedew would have leaped forward at once in his horror at such self-cruelty but that he saw who it was and knew how his meddling would be taken he knew that bull garnet's religious views were very strange and peculiar and never must be meddled with except at his own request and at seasonable moments yet he had never dreamed that self-chastisement was part of them garnet a wild flagellant said the parson to himself well i knew that he was an enthusiast but never dreamed that he was a fanatic and how shockingly hard he hits himself strong as dr mastix at sherborne but the doctor took good care never to hit himself upon my word i must run away it is too sad to laugh at what resolution that man must have he scarcely feels the blows in the agony of his mind i must reason with him about it if ever i can find occasion with such violation of his image god cannot be well pleased meditating deeply upon this strange affair the parson plodded homewards for now he knew his way with the murderer's oak for his landmark at last he saw his quiet home and gave a very gentle knock because it was so late the door was opened by amy herself pale excited and jumping oh daddy daddy 
Chock, 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 such a lot of kisses, and both arms round his neck. Corculum voluptus glycomelon anima mea. Oh, papa, say Amy, dear, and then I shall know it is you. Then she laughed, and then she cried, and presently fell to at kissing again. I am afraid she proved herself a fool, but allowance must be made for her, because she had never learned before how to get on without her father. Oh, you beautiful love of a daddy, I was quite sure you would come, you know, that you would not leave me any longer, so I would not listen to a single word any one of them said, and I kept the kitchen fire up and a good fire in your pet room, dear, and I have got such a supper for you. Now, off with your coat in a minute, darling. Oh, how poorly you look, my own father, but we will soon put you to rights again. Aunt Doxy is gone to bed, hurrah, and so are Jemima and Jenny and she won't have the impudence to come down with all her hair in the jelly-bags, so I shall have you all to myself, Dada, and if any one can deserve you, I do. My own pet child, my warm-hearted dear, said John, with the tears in his eyes, I had not the least idea that your mind was so ill-regulated. We must have a course of coriambics together, or the heavy trimmer crime diameter as i have ventured to name it about which not another short syllable till you have had a light tri mackerel supper and not a quasi caesura left even why amy you are getting quite witty and john with one arm still in his overcoat looked at her bright eyes wonderingly of course i am dad when you come home my learning sparkles at sight of you come quick now for fear of my eating you before you begin your supper You'll have it in the kitchen, you know, dear, because it will be so much nicer, and then a pipe by the book-room fire, and a chat with your good little daughter. Oh, father, father, mind you never go away from me for such a long, long time again. John thought to himself that, ere many years, he must go away from his Amy for much more than a fortnight. But, of course, he would not damp her young joy with any such troubles now. If you please, my meritorious father, you will come to the door and just smell them, and then you will have five minutes allowed you to put on your dear old dressing gown and the slippers worked by the Vestal Virgins, five minutes by the kitchen clock, and not a book to be touched, mind. Now, don't they smell lovely? I put them on when I knew your knock, the first mackerel of the season, only caught this afternoon. I sent word to Mr. Pell for them. He can do what he likes with the fishermen. And you know as well as I do, papa, you can never resist a mackerel. When John came down, half the table was covered with some of his favourite authors. Not that she meant to let him read, but only because he would miss his books a great deal more than the salt cellar, and the other half she was bleaching, and smoothing, and stoking with a snowy cloth, soft and sleek as her own bare arms, setting all things in lovely order, and looking at her father every moment with the skirt of her frock pinned up, and her glossy hair dancing jigs on the velvet slope of her shoulders, and she made him hungrier every moment by savoury word and choice innuendo. Worcester sauce, pa, darling, and a little of the very best butter, not mixed up with flour, you know, but melting on them, like their native element. Just see how they are browning, and not a bit of the skin come off. What is it about the rhombus, pa, and when I am to read juvenal? Never, my child. Very well, pa, dear, you know best, of course, but I thought it was very nice about weighing Hannibal in the excerptor. Father, put that book down. I can't allow any reading, and after supper I shall expect you to spin me such a yarn, dear, to wind up the thread of your adventures. Tully Peffine, said John calmly, although he was so hungry. The very word poor Craddock used in his rendering of that dirge. Plod uneca de consecutively ma ectolipisas oikaide saleriferon inisas. Oh, I forgot. Ah, yes, to be sure. A word, I mean, which expresses in a figurative and yet homely manner. Craddock, papa, oh father, have you been with him in London? Oh, how Aunt Doxy has cheated me! You know very well, my own father, that you cannot tell me a story. 
did you go to london because poor cradock was very very ill yes said her father those soft bright eyes beamed into his so appealingly my own child your cradock is very ill indeed not dead father oh not dead no my child nor in any great danger i sincerely believe just at present then eat your supper pa while it is hot i am so glad you have seen him i am quite content with that she believed or she would have not said it and yet how far from the truth it was you shall tell me all after supper my father thank god for his mercies to me i am never in a hurry dear yet amy in dishing up the mackerel had the greatest difficulty for her breath came short and her breasts heaved fast in holding back the tide of hysterics which would have spoiled her father's supper my amulet i cannot eat a morsel while i see your hand shake darling i must tell you all i cannot bear your anxiety the second mackerel a fish of no manners instead of curling his tail at the frying had glued it to the pan until a tear of amy's fried and then he let go in a moment john rosedew caught his darling child and drew her to his knees with the frying pan in her hand and then he made her look at him and she tried to have her eyes dry do what she might she could not speak only to let her neck rise and her drooping eyelids tremble my own life's love i have told you the worst god is very good to us cradock has been at the point of death but now he is better a little only his mind is in danger and it must come home very slowly if it comes at all now darling you know everything she took his magnificent silvery head between her little white hands and kissed him twice on either brow but not a word she said my own sweet child cried her father slowly passing one arm around her and swindling his heart of a smile i am apt to make the worst of things let us try to be braver or at least to have more faith she leaped up at that very last word with the dawn of a glorious smile in her eyes and she took the frying pan once again and eased out with a white-handled knife mackerel number three but upon second thoughts she let him slide into the frizzle again to keep him warm and comfortable her heart was down very deep just now but for all that her father must have and must enjoy his supper father i am all right now only eat your supper dear what a selfish thing i am have a bit my darling heart yes i will have a bit of tail pa just to test my cookery that's what i call frying look at the blue upon him and the crisp brown shooting over it come daddy no nonsense if you please i could have eaten all three of them if i had only been out on the warren and you to come starving from london now number three papa if you please but she kept her face away from him and bent her neck peculiarly how beautifully fresh this ale is and the stuff they sell in london I am almost inclined to consider the result of taking another half glass her quick feet went pat on the cellar steps while her father was yet perpending and she came back not a whit out of breath but sweetly fresh and excited such a race pa because i know of one family of cockroaches and half suspect another they are so very imprudent robert garnet says that they stay at home and keep their christmas domestically and i need not run for fear of them at least till the end of april and perhaps he is right because he knows and studies everything nasty only i can't believe what he says about ants because it contradicts solomon who was so very much older now you paternal darling let me froth it up for you thank the lord for as good a meal as ever one of his children was blessed with the parson stood up as he said these words and put his thick but not large hands together among the crumbs on the tablecloth now if you please the leastest double superlative pa you know like foremost and something else oh they will pluck me at oxford the very leastest little drop of the old french cognac we bought for parochial rheumatism with one thin slice of lemon 
an abulation of water and half a knob of sugar before john could remonstrate there it was all winking at him and begging to be sniffed before sipping my pet you are so premature how can i trust your future you never give me time to consider a subject even in the first of its bearings to be sure not father you know quite well you would take at least eight different views of the matter and multiply them into eight others of people i never heard of now the pipe dear you shall have it here because it is so much warmer you know you can't fill it properly so the parson happy in having a child who could fill a pipe better than he could leaned back in his favorite chair which amy had wheeled in for him and held his long clay in his left hand while his right played with her hair as she sat at his feet and coaxed him sermon already dear well you know best about that amy i always trust you to arrange them never fear papa leave it to me what would you do without me i have put you out such a beauty because it is christmas day one that always makes me cry because i have heard it so often but you must have confidence in me implicit confidence my pet still i like to run my eyes over them for i cannot see as i did my eyes are getting so old i'll kiss them till you can't see one bit if you dare to say that again papa old indeed they are better than mine and i can see the pattern of a ladybird all across the room there was a ladybird on the window today at this time of year only think that was good luck wasn't it and a dear little robin flew in and perched upon the hat pegs and then i knew that you must come home oh you superstitious pet i must reason with you tomorrow end of chapter 17 end of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume 2 by richard dodridge blackmore